Meditation actually is in two parts. One is concentration, the other is contemplation. And uh, in the Sanskrit word, Sanskrit meaning, for those who don't know what Sanskrit is, because you come for the first time, it's a classical ancient uh, Indian language. At the time of the Buddha in India, there were so many dialects and a few languages spoken in the country. Uh, the two most common ones were Sanskrit and Pali. Um, now this is in Sanskrit. Um, concentration in the Sanskrit language is Samatha. Contemplation in the Sanskrit language is Vipassana. And as far as concentration is concerned, there's so many ways to train one's concentration. The ways that we use is anapanasati, the in and out breath, in and out thinking of the breath. So anapana, in and out, breath. That's the object of concentration that we use. Uh, training one's concentration, you can use so many objects. A candle flame, uh, a bowl of, a big bowl of um, crystal clear water, so many ways in doing it. But the Buddha suggested to us that uh, we use the breath as the object of concentration. Why do we use the breath? We investigate into it. Why? Why do we use the breath? What's the meaning of the breath? So concentration. So meditation is not just um, sitting there, uh, you know, feeling relaxed, peacefully and try to get into the peacefulness of mind. It is broken into two parts. One cannot contemplate without concentrating. And our mind has been so tricky. Um, it's always, it, it's, it's like a, a desultory rooming of thoughts in our mind. And, and we, sometimes we don't know how we think, why we think, the thoughts just come up maintaining its status and then, and then uh, lingering on, changing, and then disintegrating. Our mind is like a monkey. It, it jumps from one branch to another. And sometimes what is even worse, um, our thoughts lead us into erroneous actions and speeches. It get into, we get into sufferings and problems and troubles, all sorts of... Um, mental afflictions. For the preliminary uh, practitioner, concentration is the initial step that we must go through before jumping to the contemplation. So concentration, samatha. We, the object of concentration we use is anapanasati. We use breath as the object to train our concentration. You need an object to train concentration. You can't just sit there peacefully, quietly, you think you're not thinking of something, but actually our minds is rooming all over the places. So that's what we try to do, concentration. And the object of concentration we use is anapanasati. Uh, for those who know this, um, it's a review, so that it, it's, it's a meditation in a nutshell. I'm trying to, to summarize everything in here for, for about 45 minutes or half an hour so that we know how and why we meditate. Uh, and then contemplation, the, the, another part of it, uh, the Sanskrit word is vipassana. We practice satipatthana. What is satipatthana? The four foundations um, of contemplations. We'll go through it step by step. You've got to be patient with me. You have to go in, in discussing and trying to find out more about meditation, you have to patiently go from one aspect to another. You don't just jump into just sitting there, relaxing and getting good health and quietly meditating. That's just the appearance of meditation, not the essence. Try, we have to know the essence. I try to understand why, how, where, and, and when. Now, the object of concentration is the breath. 
we focus on the in and out breathing. And usually the problem with people who come, uh, who are beginners, when they come for meditation, uh, they just do what they want. When I say you use breath as the concentration and we start to meditate, they don't follow. They just sit there quietly and peacefully and that's it. They don't faithfully follow the method as we practice because people tend to be egoistic habitually. Why should I follow? Why should I follow your method of concentration? Now what you need to do to come to the Buddhist temple is empty your cup of, of um, self-egoistic understanding, empty all that and try to put in something new. You have to accept before you can practice. Don't just maintain your own view and don't care about, I don't care what you're talking about. I just sit there peacefully. Then you're wasting your time. Try something new. This is what the Buddha told us. So you have to faithfully follow. You use your breath. Don't just sit there and, because I can't read your mind, I don't know how you think. But some people just sit there and they're not following the method. You're wasting your time. If you just sit there peacefully, quietly, you may, as, you, you may as well do that at home. You don't need to come here. Right? So you have to uh, empty your cup of bigotry, put in something new, and think about it, and practice it. Uh, okay, that's concentration. Contemplation, we practice satipatthana. What is satipatthana? Satipatthana, there's a sutra called Maha Satipatthana. It contains all the details of what Satipatthana is all about. It's, it's a long sutra. So you can always research into it later. Maha Satipatthana. Now, the four foundations of mindfulness. Contemplation of the body, contemplation of feelings, contemplation of mind, and contemplation of mind impressions. We have to explain every aspect of the four. We're just doing a summary. Concentration and contemplation, they're like the, the two wings of a bird. In doing meditation, you can't just concentrate without contemplation. You cannot just contemplate. You cannot actually contemplate without concentration. Um, and meditation is not just sitting meditation. Meditation is in every moment of your life. Meditation involves not it's just not just in sitting, in walking, in lying down, in any actions. Every second you are in meditation, you are in control of your own mind. Are we in control of our own mind? Mostly we're not. Most of the time, we're not in control of our own thoughts. If you're in control, you won't be angry. If you're in control, you won't be jealous. If you're in control, you won't, be, you won't have anxiety, depression, guilt, fear, worry. You don't want those. But, it come, but they all come up because you can't control them. You, th you may think that you can control your mind, but actually, we are not. We just let our mind going astray. We just let our mind going desultorily, like a monkey, jumping from one branch to another, a branch of greediness at one time, a branch of anxiety at another time, a branch of depression, a, a branch of anger, a branch of greediness. We jump from one branch to another, nonstop. So, this is a general picture of what meditation should consist of. How to meditate. So focus on the breath, as we said. Concentration is focusing on the breath. Remember, that's the object of concentration, not on anything else. Why do we use breath? We're going to, we'll continue to talk about it. And then we say, let go of the sultry thoughts, the contemplation part. Our thoughts have been wandering, roaming, desultory thinking, and uh, sometimes you don't know why. 
15 minutes ago, we'll concentrate on something, and 15 minutes later, we get angry, we get jealous. We may have daydreams. We may have sometimes even sexual fantasy. We don't know. It, it, our mind roams all over the place, not under control. Sometimes you may think you control it. You can control it for a few minutes and then it's gone. Focus on breath. We call it present moment awareness. How present? What's the most present in you? The breath is the most present moment. It's not yesterday's breath. It's not breath of the last minute. It's the breath now. If you cannot maintain your present breath, for a short time you're dead. Why the breath? Why do we use the breath? Your breath is the most present moment. It follows you wherever you go and as long as you live, non-conceptually. Because every thought is more or less conceptual. But the breath, you do not, you do not have to conceptually think about your breath before breathing. It just comes naturally. It's non-conceptual. Anything that's conceptual is bias. You put your concept into it. You put your ideas into it. You put, put your personal judgment into it. Your internal commentator in you always put judgment on everything. But your breath is non-conceptual. You don't have to think about it to bring your breath along. But your breath reminds you to be aware of your body, aware of your present situation. Are we aware? What, what's the pur purpose of meditation? Is to let ourselves be aware of our own thinking so that we put our thinking in the most meritorious way, the most beneficial way, the most meaningful way. And the breath is easy to remember and control. Can you control your breath? Yes, unless you're suffering from a cold, unless you have sickness that you can't control your breath. You don't have to remember to breathe. It's natural to you. It is the most akin to you as a focused object. It's the closest to you. What is more close than your own breath? It's even closer than your skin, your hair. It is inside. So if you don't use the breath, what do you use? You use a candle flame? What happens if the wind blows out a candle flame? So what is the most closest to you? It's the breath. So intelligently, the Buddha suggested to us that in getting an object of concentration, get the breath as the object of concentration. And also it seems to be systematic because it leads you to come back. Your breath is gone, then it comes back again, it's gone, it's come back again. It's like a monkey. Our monkey mind is going all over the place, and then we put our, our monkey onto a leash. And then when it wanders away, you leash it back. You, you, you pull your monkey back when it wanders away. Your monkey is nonstop. Sometimes greediness, sometimes jealousy, hatred, anger, depression, anxiety, guilt, you name them. Many, many mental afflictions. The monkey of mental, mental affliction. Sometimes the monkey may feel happy. Sometimes the monkey is compassionate, kind. But to most people, most of the time, the monkey is going astray in the wrong way. So, that's the breath. That's why we use the breath. So when you sit here, Faithfully follow that. Don't just sit there doing nothing and, and just dozing away in your sleep. You're wasting your time. You have to faithfully follow your breath. It's not easy. You try it out later. 
Now, after, after this talking session, we're going to practice it, and you know how difficult it is to follow your breath. You may, you may be able to do it for three minutes, or sometimes even five, and then it goes away. You can't even concentrate on your own breath for five minutes. You try it out, you know later. And sometimes we think, and, and most, many, many medical doctors would think that way. Meditation is good for people who suffer from ADHD. Because you can't control yourself in ADHD. You have to be act, always active. And now, you are residing in, 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 internally and try to calm down. Okay, that's focus on the breath in simple English, simple words. Next, let go of the sultry thoughts. What does that mean? That is more on the vipassana side, the contemplation side. And some people call it insightful meditation. That meditation, it, sometimes you come in English, people would like to use focus and insightful concentration. Con insightful meditation. Not just focusing. Focus, you don't need insight. But in contemplation, you need insight, you, not, you need wisdom. So focus is not, is, it's more or less not, not involved with wisdom, but contemplation is involved with wisdom. The more contem the higher the contemplation, the higher the wisdom. In the Buddhist term, it's called prajna. It's the Sanskrit language, it's prajna. Um, a very high understanding of life, of reality. Prajna is, is a Sanskrit word. Um, it's a very high level of understanding. So break the habitual perpetuation of attachment. How do we attach? We're attached to many things. We're attached to fame, wealth, many, many things we're attached to. Sometimes we're attached to anger, to jealousy, to greediness, to hatred, or even something we like. We're attached to love. We're attached to a, a marriage that was broken 20 years ago. We're still attached to, attached to the agony of it or attached to the happiness of it. We always attach. Some people are attached to drugs, alcohol. So how do we break the per habitual perpetuation of attachment? Why do we have to let go? The breath deals with the present. And how about the past? Yesterday's agony, yesterday's love, yesterday's happiness. We always bring, bring yesterday's agony onto the present table and, and think about it and get depressed with it. Something passed away many, many years ago. Occasionally, we bring it back on our present table, ponder on it and cry about it, and a lot of behavior is created out of it. So the breath deals with the present, the past and the future, and we worry about the future. We always worry about the future. It hasn't come yet, but we think as if it's already here. Worries, anxieties. But the future hasn't come yet. You're worrying you are sick. But by worrying about it, will the sickness improve? It won't. But we habitually get worried about the future. That's a trap. We got get stuck in it. Nobody else can get you out of it because you are habitually doing that all the time for many, many years. Some old and broken habit that is very difficult to eliminate. Halt the habitual egoistic self-thinking pattern that is causing sufferings. The ego in us, we call it the manas. We have eight consciousnesses, what we've been talking about. Our consciousness is not just one. It has eight consciousnesses. That would just to review the I consciousness, 
the ear consciousness, the taste consciousness, the touch consciousness, the auditory consciousness, and then we have the six, which is the mano consciousness. That is what the thinking consciousness is all involved in. And finally, the what? The manas consciousness, which is the ego consciousness. We always attach the ego to our thinking. How does it benefit me? How do I differentiate myself from you? And finally, there's of course the eighth consciousness, which is the alaya consciousness. That is the banking storage consciousness that store all the energy, that store all the karma from previous life and store all the karma of the present life too. That is the alaya consciousness. That's just like the, the uh, unlimited memory of the computer. Everything you key in, everything you key in, it won't go away. It's right in the memory. You think you can get away from doing something bad? No, you can't get away. So the alaya consciousness store everything. So we have to be responsible for every thought. Don't let bad thoughts come up in you. You think a thought, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't um, bring my thought into action, into speech, so I'm okay. No, every thought has energy. The Buddha said, when you practice meditation, you start with the thought, not with how you sit. How do you cross? People, people usually in meditation, they always ask, how do I cross my leg? How, where do I put my hands to? How do I, how the body should behave? That's not important. The most important is your thought. We usually say, if you maintain the same thought, always thinking that way, and if you habitually maintain that thought and carry it into action, that becomes your personality. And the personality would de determine your destiny. So how do you change your destiny to be better, to improve? Change not just the action, not just the speech. Start with a thought. Change your thought. So that's how, that's how to meditate. You focus on your breath. That's what the Buddha said in Anapanasati. Uh, let go of the sultry thoughts. That's what the Buddha said in Mahasatipatthana. So these are the two uh, most important aspects of meditation. By the way, some people call meditation not meditation, not samatha, not vipassana. They call it consciousness therapy. Consciousness therapy. When we get sick, we get medicine, right? We get therapy. When the mind gets sick, you can't just med use medication to stop it. You have to heal your mind. Healing the mind is just as medication. Medication is just to cut it, to stop it, without healing the roots, not looking at the roots of the problem. Strictly speaking, many... Um, Many Bodhisattva said, we are all sick. We are all sick in the mind. That's why we are reincarnating. Do you recognize that we are all sick? Why do we get angry? Anger is a sickness. Why do we get jealous? Jealousy is sickness. Why do we get depression? Depression is surely a sickness. How do we heal it? Not just by medication. Get into the roots. Understand our own mind. That's the basis of medication, of, of, of meditation. Meditation is to research and investigate into our own mind. Not just getting blessings from an external source. If, only, if you can get healed 
just by blessings from an external source, and if that external source is all compassionate, he would have healed you already without asking. If there is an all compassionate God, nobody will be suffering, because he would have healed you without even you asking. You have to work and cultivate yourself on enlightenment. Even the Buddha said. I cannot enlighten it for you. You have to walk the walk, just not just talking about it. The Buddha can only give us guidance. Can the teacher write an examination for you? Can the teacher say, "I can write an examination for you, and you get an A"? You have to write your own exam. You have to study it. The teacher can study it for you. The teacher can only give you the guidance, and the instructions, and how to do it. He can't do it for you. So if you just say, "I want blessings from God," if God is all compassionate and all promising, you don't even have to ask because you know what you need. You can be as God as He is, but you have to work it out yourself. Don't wait. Don't wait for the next reincarnation. You know we are all in samsara. You know. We're all in life and death. After this body is gone, after we died, everybody has to die. Who don't have to die? You raise your hands. Raise your hands. I don't have to die. You don't have to die. Your body has to die. Your eternal life may not have to die, but your, this body is just an apartment. As we always mention, this body is just an apartment, a rented apartment, on a on a, on a lease. It's a net net lease. You have to furnish it. You have to look after it. It it has a period. It has a term, a term of at the most a hundred years. And then you have to get out. You have to check out. You check in and you check out. Sometimes you think our body is just like a hotel. You check in in your mother's womb, you get born, and one day you got to check out. There's no exception. You can't say I don't want to check out. No, you have to check out. And during this period of a hundred years, when you're living in your apartment, what do you do? Are you creating more bad karma for yourself? Why are we coming? Why are we coming into this samsara? We call it samsara. It's, it's a Sanskrit word, samsara. S a m s a r a. Samsara is life and death. Life is not just one-time deal. When 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 the Buddha look at the time horizon, is three time is in three aspects: the present, the past, and the future. Just like everybody will look at the time, time they look at these three time dimensions: the present moment, the past moment, and the future moment. But as an individual, as a sentient being, our time horizon is very limited. The Buddha's time horizon is much more wider. When we when, when we talk about time, we only talk about yesterday. Two years ago, three years ago, twenty years ago, thirty years ago, or the time when we were baby in the mother's womb. That's the most. We never thought about previous life. People say, "Who cares?" I don't know. But the Buddha said, "Every sentient being has previous lives." And then the time dimension of the, of, of the future is not just tomorrow. One day, one. One day, two days, one year, two years—it's the next life. If you have been creating a lot of karma, you'll reincarnate into the next life. If you're not enlightened, after this body is due—I mean, after this lease is terminated—you're going to go into another lease. You're going to go into another hotel. 
Fortunately, because of your karma that you created in your previous life, you have been creating good karma in your previous life most of the time. For example, you, have, you had been in your previous life a philanthropist. You have been very compassionate. You, you're very responsible. You are a hero. You only work for the benefit of the country. You are the best person. Then you reincarnate into this life and you are, you are enjoying life because you, you created good karma in your previous life. You're rich, you're healthy, not without reason. You cultivate your own plans. It matures. So you're responsible. You enjoy the good karma that you, you've done in your previous life. On the other hand, you could suffer from the bad karma you created in your previous life. What if some people get richer than you? Why are some people more handsome than you? More beautiful than you? Why are people, some people stronger? And why, why do they have a good family? Why do they have a, you have a broken family? Or you have a good family and they have a broken family? Why, why are the destinies of everybody a different? Not dictated by God. You, you what? You perform your own karma in your previous life. And you, bat, you, you, brought, you brought your karma, good or bad or neutral, into this life. And everybody's karma is different. And usually the sutra says, if in this life you are, you are very beautiful, for example, some sutra says, you have been practicing endurance in your previous life. You always smile. You can always endure with difficulties. You're always respectful of people. You always talk in a very skillful way. And when you react with people, you always make people happy. And in this life, your, your facial features, as a result, will be more prettier. Everything has causality. There's a reason for it. And why are some people so rich in this life? Billionaires? They have been a philanthropist in a previous life. They donated their whole estates to help out the poor. And this is what they enjoy, and the riches. Imagine if you, if, if, if you loan some money out, there's interest. And after so many lives, the interest in, in, incur into it, you are enjoying your own riches. So actually, what you give out, you get in return. You don't think that I give out, I don't have it, I, I forsake it, I got, I got no money left. No, it comes back to you multifold. You give out a dollar, it may come back to you in ten dollars. It meant so many ways. When, but when we give out a dollar, we don't think, I want it to come back in, ten, in, in, in a million. No, you don't think about that way. Otherwise, you're attaching to it. So everything has causality. An effect comes out, there must be a cause for it. Why are you coming for meditation today? Do you come for no reason? Are there causes that lead you to come to meditation today? Don't tell me that I don't have a cause. There must be causes. So, we're talking about the time horizon. Uh, I'm, I'm diverting to another way. I'm, I'm talking about samsara and about reincarnation, about life and death. Um, if we don't do something about it in this life, if we, don't pref if we don't go through what the Buddha suggested to us, to go through the spiritual transformation that Buddha suggested, we'll roll into the next life with our present karma. The Buddha, 2,600 years ago, he ended his habitual body and get into this nirvana. No more reincarnation, no more samsara, no more life and death. He's, he's, he's gone beyond life and death. And he introduces ways to get beyond life and death. Don't get into reincarnation anymore. We don't even know. We don't know what would be the, our next life. We don't know. And according to some sutras, it says, Usually, the next life is going to be worse than this because of what you have done in this life. What you have done in this life, you know. 
killing, lying, slandering, sexual misconduct, stealing, greediness, hatred, anxiety. And sometimes we're compassionate, we're helpful, we're beneficial. But how much of it is good and how much of it is bad? You probably know more than I do because that's what you did. So, getting back to, I have more to say about reincarnation and samsara, but let's get on to the topic, otherwise I'll be roaming like a monkey all over the place. So, let's get into how to meditate. Meditation. Focus on breath and let go. Follow it faithfully. Don't just sit there and not following it. As I said, we use the breath as our object of concentration. When you're sitting there, not, not using that, you're wasting your time. You may as well be relaxing at home. Why do you have to come here? If you're not following the instructions as practiced by the Buddha, which I introduced to you. Now, our senses, let's go faster. This is our external sales lady. In our body, it's like a company with external staff. Our eyes, our ears, our nose, our tongue, our body are the external staff of this body company. They are interacting with externalities. And in the process of, of interacting with externalities, we attach, we interact, we perform. Imagine if you don't have these senses, how can you, how can you interact with externalities? When you, when you interact with externalities, you carry out speeches and actions which brought you karma. So in order to, to, to meditate, you have to, you have to stop your externalities for a time because when your externalities are interacting with, when your senses are interacting with externalities, you are attached. So eyes attached to matter. When we say matter, anything that is made up of molecules, protons, electrons, all this is matters. I see objects. So eyes interacting with all objects, all matter, all things that they can see. Ears with sound, nose with smell, tongue with taste and body with touch, tactility, bodies with touch. And this touch also means the interaction of the body inside, the organs, everything. So the, the, your, your internal organ is also interacting, not just the external eyes, ears, nose, tongue. So everything, everything about your body, you are, are interacting with all these matter, sound, smell, taste, and touch. No exception. Your eyes cannot listen, only your ears can. Your ears cannot see, only the eyes can. Your eyes cannot taste, only the tongue can. And then you also have the mind, which is the thinking mind, interact with all the thoughts that's created in the mind. That's the internal reaction. And then there's the manas, which is the self. You always have this self in you that grabs onto habitual thinking. In meditation, what do we do? Because when, when we're not interacting, when, when we're not meditating, our senses are interacting, like you're interacting with me, you're looking at me, you're listening to me. But in meditation, you're trying to purify that. You're trying to stop those externalities for a while and go into the internal peacefulness and tranquility of the mind. So in other words, you cannot have factory production sound all vibrating in your ears and meditating. No, you cannot do that. Or you cannot have a show going on and you look at the show, entertaining show, and then you have a meditation. You can't do that. When you're eating, you cannot meditate, right? So you have to shut off all these externalities that disturb your mind, that not disturb, that interact with your mind. So how do you do it? You have to let go of matter. When you close your eyes, you let go of matter. So when you are meditating, you don't open your eyes and try to look at who is in here and who is not. So you have to close your eyes so that your eyes are not interacting. Because when your eyes are interacting, how can you meditate when you are watching television? You cannot. So you have to let go of, I, I'm letting go of attachment to, to colors, to TVs, 
you know, everything. I want to meditate. I want to go internally within. So you have to let go, close your eyes, let go of matter. So that's the reason why when you're meditating, you're closing your eyes, right? You can't open your eyes and meditate. How about the ears? You have to let go of the sound. You cannot listen to radio. But we have yet more to say about letting go of sound. Because when you're meditating, sometimes you cannot... You cannot let go of the snoring of the guy who's meditating next to you because you're sleeping. So you still can listen to the sound. So you have to let go, you have to let it flow out from the other ears. In other words, you cannot attach to the sound produced surrounding you. You have to let go of that. You need training to do that. Nose, smell, you have to let go of the smell. That guy who is meditating next to you is sweaty. He just jogged for one, one hour and he, he stinks. So you have to let go of the, of the smell. You can't attach to the smell. And now about the taste. You have to let go of that. You're not eating a hamburger when, you're, when you are meditating. Can you, can you bite into a hamburger when you're meditating? You're not, not, you're let, you, you're not letting go of the, of, of, of the pickles, of, of, of the hamburgers of the letters in the hamburger. So you have to let go of your taste. And body, you cannot let go. Because your body, the touch is the breath. The breath, the in and out breath still touches your nose. So you only have the breath, which is the object of, of, of concentration, left. No more matter, sound, smell, taste, but there's still a tactility the touching of the breath in and out. That's the only object of attention that you should, you should still have. And how about thought? We have to go deeper into that. Attention on present breath, live your present moment here and now, no internal commentator, because everybody has an internal commentator. You always put comments, egoistic self comments on everything. We stereotype, we label things. This is good, this is bad. This, this, this guy looks ugly. This guy looks handsome. You always attach your internal commentary on everything you see, everything you listen to. No exception. You have to break that habitual continuation of the sultry thinking of the present, past, and future. That's very difficult. Well, I'm only giving you a summary of what we should do. Self, let go, only in and out breath exist. So meditation is to let go of many things. Can you let go of these? If you can't let go, you may as well leave. You don't need to. I can't let go of sound. I can't let go of yesterday. I can't let go you know, of many things. Why are you sitting here? You're wasting your time. I want to open my eyes when I'm meditating to see this is color. This is a good color. This is a hall. I want to listen to snoring. I mean, how can you meditate? So, so, so many things you have to train yourself to let go. The only focus of attention, the breath, is still there. And the, the magic of using the breath is, by, concentration, by concentrating on the breath, you automatically let go of matters that you see, of sound that you listen to, of the smell that you taste, uh, uh, that you, your, your nose breathe, and of the taste that your tongue is tasting. So in other words, when all your concentration is on the breath, I'm breathing in. The air is coming in cool. It touches my nostril. Now it gets into my body. And then it, it lingers onto the body and it comes out. When it comes out, it's warmer than it comes in. I feel it, I feel it. Then all your concentration is on the breath. And when that concentration on the breath lingers on, magic comes. The power comes. Because you have a, a span of concentration which you don't have, you may not realize it. You don't have the concentration. The higher the concentration that you have, the higher the power of tranquility. The higher in the cultivation of wisdom. That's the reason why what determines a bad student and a good student? 
A good student has to have a long span of concentration. He can concentrate on reading a few pages. A bad student can even can concentrate in a paragraph. A successful student is always a student with a higher concentration. A good employer is always employee is always a worker who can concentrate on his work. So concentration gives power. It's just like when you put a lens, a magnifier under the sun. You focus that light onto the lens. It burns whatever is underneath it. You can you cannot move. You don't have you don't you don't move your lens. You just stay put, stand still, focus, and then it burns whatever is underneath. It gives you power. Concentration gives you the power. There goes the saying. Whatever the mind can concentrate on, the mind can do. That's the attitude of many positive thinkers. Dale Carnegie, Carnegie, oh, I forgot that name. Um, positive thinkers. Whatever you concentrate on, and you concentrate long, wholeheartedly, you carry it out. Good or bad, you concentrating. If you're concentrating on bad behavior, you're going to be a criminal. If you're concentrating on compassion, you're going to be a bodhisattva. If you're concentrating on spiritual transformation, you're going to you carry it with perseverance. You're going to be a Buddha. You're going to transcend life and death. Transcend samsara. So concentration is the first step in meditation. If you can't even concentrate, don't talk about meditation. And concentration is not only helpful for you to be a saint, for you to go through the spiritual transformation. Concentration would make you successful in whatever you are doing. But watch out! Don't concentrate on bad behavior. Concentration gives power, and if that power, that concentration, is combined with contemplation, with the right wisdom, you will be a saint. So concentration has to be put in the parameters of righteousness. So if you are a bad guy and you have a high power concentration, then you are Hitler. You know Hitler. Bad enough. All those followers of Hitler, Nazi, they are concentrating in doing one thing, but in a bad way, non-human way. So it's very important that your concentration is put in the parameters of compassion and righteousness. That we have to study. You think you learn all Buddhism just in this course, just for the morning? There's a lot more to know about. I'm going to only give you a brief summary in a nutshell. Contemplation, vipassana. What does vipassana is a Sanskrit word? What does it mean? Pasana. What does pasana mean? Vid, vid is only a prefix of the word. Pazana. Pazana means perceiving, insightful perceiving. Pazana is insightful perceiving. Vid is what? Vid is in a special way, cutting through it, going through it thoroughly, going through the perceiving thoroughly with wisdom. That's vipassana. In the Vimala Kriti Sutra. There's a sutra called Vimala Kriti, Vimala Kriti Sutra. Manjushri Sri Bodhisattva asked Vimala Kriti Upasaka a question: How does one practice in order to get rid of mental afflictions? We all have mental afflictions, no exceptions. We all have mental afflictions. Vimala Kriti answer: One must meditate with the right contemplation. What is this right contemplation? What are the parameters involved? What's the standard for 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 being right? We don't know what is right and what is wrong. That's why we get into trouble. 
John, a teenager, he does not know what is right and what is wrong. He needs to be guided by the right teacher, by the right parents, right? Even though he knows how to concentrate, he's a genius. He knows how to concentrate. But without guidance, the right guidance, he could be a genius in the wrong way. We've got to guide that geniality gen into the right path. That's what Buddhism is all about, to guide concentration in the right path, in the right way. And there's a lot to study in it. Open that treasure house. Because of this mass communication, we can always get information from a lot of sources, try to get into what this treasure house of Buddhism is all about. Don't just look at the entertaining aspect of your computer. Got talents, <laughs> entertaining. Everybody spent hours into, into entertainment. But would you spend half an hour to understand Buddhism, to know what this treasure house is all about? Open that door and venture into it. It's, it's exciting. It's just like when you're meditating, some people say meditating is boring, you know, it's quiet. But meditating is like looking into your inner world of your mind. And when you open that inner world, you will find a lot of mystery in it. You don't even, you can't even imagine. The more you get into it, the more you find. And some people, when they get into the, 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 the deep part of it, they could even find their previous life information. But that's not the purpose of meditation. So in other words, everybody has that supernatural power in your consciousness. You just haven't found it. And it's interesting to find it. It's more interesting to go to the pub to get a drink because What's the purpose of getting a drink? Get yourself intoxicated. But in here, when you're looking in internally, meditating, you actually get into the inner world of you. Do you want to understand more about yourself? It's very interesting. You have never attempted to open that door of you. Open it. Get into it. You'll find more and more about yourself. inscrutable. It's a lot of treasure inside. On the other hand, you could find a lot of trash inside. When you open that, that big box, that big box of mental afflictions that you have stored in there, your jealousy, your hatred, your greediness, your depression, all stored in there waiting for you to clean it up. What is meditation? Part of the meditation is to clean up your garbage. Don't you have to clean up your garbage, this, the garbage in yourself? You don't think you have a lot of garbage? I know I have a lot of garbage in myself. I have been building up greediness since many, many lifetimes ago. My greediness, my hatred, my depression, my guilt feeling, my anxiety. Meditation, part of it is to swab it out. Clean up your garbage. They stink. The more you clean it up, the cleaner you are. Nobody can clean it for you. Nobody can, nobody can clean up your garbage for you, not even the Buddha. If the Buddha can help you and clean up all your garbage, he would have done so if he's all compassionate. What's the definition of all compassionate? Without you even you asking, he already have done it for you. An uh, all-compassionate Buddha would not, be, would not be thinking this way. I am the Buddha. You come for me to help. You come to me for help. Then I help you. No. He would have given you what you, don't, you haven't even perceived. This is my last slide for the session. I, miss, I, I skip a lot because I don't have time. I said, we're meditating. We're concentrating. We have contemplation. And we need the right parameters to put our meditation in. So in other words, 
if you are a meditator, if at the same time you're not guided by the right, the right approach, you could be directing your meditation into the wrong way. So the Buddha said, everybody's meditation has to be guided by the right parameters. And these are general framework of all the parameters that we should know. So in other words, if you're always involved in sexual misconduct, and you meditate every day, you think you'll be successful in becoming enlightened? You're doing the wrong behavior on the one hand, and you're meditating on the other hand. You are drinking poison on the one hand, and you are getting, you are getting nutrition on the other hand. Poison and nutrition, they contradict each other. So if you're getting nutrition, like what a, what, a, what a meditation is all about, on the other hand, you're not taking poisons. If you have bad behavior, you're taking poison. So these are the parameters. So the three components of the Buddhist practice, moral virtue, in the Sanskrit word is sila, in the Pali word is also sila, meditation, in the Sanskrit, uh, it's, in Pali, it's, it's samatha or, sama, or samati. Insight, wisdom, in the Sanskrit language is prajna, in Pali is bhana. Now these are the three uh, division, threefold division of the Buddhist practice. So if you practice meditation, at the same time you must have moral virtue. So in other words, you're always meditating, but you are always involved in sexual misconduct. You can never be successful in meditation. You're involved with killing, you're involved with lying, you're involved with the wrong behavior. It does not matter how you meditate. You could be a master in, in concentration, but if your moral virtue is bad, you will never get enlightened. As a matter of fact, you will get into more and more mental afflictions. So you have to be guided. The, the first step in meditation is you gotta have sila. You gotta have a high moral conduct. You, have, you all have to learn what is the, what is the definition, what is, what is contained in what the Buddha was talking about, immoral, immorality, immoral virtue. So we always say, some people want to say, I want to become a monk. For the first five years that you are in, in a monastery, you learn nothing. You learn only sila, how to be virtuous morally virtuous. So in other words, you have to stop all your bad behavior, your bad speeches to start with. So that's the first requirement. Moral standard. Second requirement is concentration. The third requirement is wisdom level. And all these have to be in the parameters of the, eight, the noble eightfold path. Right speech, right action, right livelihood, right efforts, right mindfulness, right concentration, right understanding and right thought. All these are in the Buddhist sutras. They all have to be studied to understand it. So I'm only giving you a nutshell, Buddhism in a nutshell. You really have to go deep into the, the Eightfold Path to know, other than meditation, these are the parameters I use to guide my meditation to guide my mindfulness, to guide my wisdom. It's just like John is a genius, but you need to guide him in the right way. Otherwise, he could use his ingenuity into misbehavior. You have to guide him in the right way. So these are the guidance. Some philosophers or some people who study Buddhism um, define vipassana, contemplation, as something else. They call it mindfulness. Most people call meditation mindfulness. Translating contemplation and concentration into mindfulness is not exactly right. Because the word mindful, that means you're only paying attention to. Your mind is filled with attention, your mind is 
mindful, full, full mind, a mind that is full, mindful. So a mind that is full of impressions, full of attention, full of thinking and all that. Actually, it's very difficult sometimes to translate a Sanskrit word. Uh, mindfulness is not the best translation, but that's the most commonly recognized. It should, it should really be uh, mental introspection. So in other words, when you are doing meditation, you're not trying to fill your mind with mindful, full, filling, filling your mind with thoughts. You're trying to empty your mind. How can you, how can you fill your mind with thoughts? You, you empty your mind because our, our minds have, have been, have been um, confused with, uh, with uh, mental afflictions, defilements, like greediness, jealousy, hatred, anxiety, all kinds of mental defilements. So, so what is the most important is to empty them, not to fill them with all these. So, I still think that introspection is, is, is a better approach because you are internally trying to empty your mind using, using introspection, internal reflection. So, maybe from, from now on we should use introspection, mental introspection and not mindfulness. I already explained Concentration, uh, samatha, and I like to briefly, only have half an hour left, I only briefly explain what is satipatthana. Because in, in contemplation we said we use satipatthana. In very simple English, what is satipatthana? Satipatthana is the cultivation of mental introspection leading to detachment and liberation of mental afflictions. So this kind of introspection leads you to detach, leads you to empty. It doesn't lead you to add on, add on more impressions, add on more um, egoistic impressions, how to be successful, how to get wealth, how to be famous, how to make a lot of money, how to invest in real estate, how to be better than all the others. <laughs> The, uh, not that, leading to detachment. We want to detach and liberation of mental afflictions. Uh, these mental afflictions, of course, contain uh, karmic fermentation. When we say karmic, we have every, everybody has that karmic energy in, inside of them. And this energy is, is, you know, it's going through process of fermentation adding in more, making it more, making it grow into actions and speech and actual thoughts, etc., etc. So when you're doing Satipatthana contemplation, I'm giving an example. A thought arises, for example, an anxiety of fear, a depression, or greediness, or jealousy. I don't know what kind of thought arises in you all the time. Thought of compassion, thought of helpfulness, thought of always trying to, to empty your, your, your mind of defilements. What kind of thought you have? You know what kind of thought arises in you all the time. You may not even realize what kind of thought arises in you until you have brought your thought into action. Some people don't even realize a thought is fermented in the mind. A thought of selfishness, a thought of, um, I don't know, so many thoughts. So for example, I'm giving an example, a thought arises. Uh, the example is depression or, or anxiety or fear or worry. Uh, and then what next? You are being aware of the arising of such thought. Oh, I'm feeling depressed now. I have anxiety, and how come I get jealous of John, uh, who make a lot of money? Um, how come I get jealous of Jeanette, who is prettier than me? Uh, how come I'm jealous of, of Mr. Johnson, who has a good family, and I have a broken family? All kinds of, you, are, you become aware 
when you are doing meditation, you will become aware of this thought arises. How come this lady talked to me like that an hour ago? He, um, she, she's not being courteous. She is attacking into my um, self-confidence. Oh, why, why did she yell at me? All kinds of thoughts. Why did my brother talk to me like that? Um, so, but when a thought, when such a thought arises, you, you know, okay, I'm aware of such a thought. A thought of fear in me. I, I become fearful, I have anxiety. You are aware of it, right? You become aware of it. Some people are not even aware. When they become anxious, they just get anxious. When they become, they have fear, they just feel fear. They don't realize that you have to detach yourself away from it and look at it. A serpent comes up. You look at the serpent. The serpent comes up, the serpent of anxiety, the snake of anxiety, the snake of fear comes up. It's going to bite you. So you're going to get a stick and say, hold down his head. You watched it. It's not easy to know, to watch, to stand away as a third person looking at your thought. You're always the singular I. I am fearful. I have anxiety. I have jealousy. But you should stand away from it and say, he has that. Such a thought comes up now. I got to watch it. A thought comes up. A thought of greediness comes up. A thought of jealous, jealousy comes up. So you become, become aware of it. You introspect. You, you do an introspection of such a thought. And then you say, watch the thought with the four contemplations. What are the four contemplations? The body. You remember the four contemplation? The body, the feeling, the mind, and the mental impressions. Let's take an example of the body. When such a thought of anxiety comes up in me, how does the body react? I guess my hormone is coming. I feel fear. I'm sweating. I don't feel comfortable. I have muscle pain. I have a headache. What kind of bodily impressions you have at that time? Oh, I have a headache because of this anxiety. Oh, I want to hurt myself. I don't want to exist in this world. I'm more down. You feel that your body react to it. You should feel that. And you should say, that body is not me. It's just a thought. How can I identify myself with such a thought? It's just a thought, but I'm mixed up with a thought. I attach to the thought. I, th I thought I am that thought, but that thought is not me. It's only a thought, right? It's only a thought coming up, but you want to identify yourself with that thought, and you want to feel in such a way that thought wants you to feel. You're a slave of that thought. But that thought is you, you think. It's difficult. It's difficult to distance yourself from that thought that is generated in your mind. It takes training. You think just by me telling you to, de to detach yourself from that thought, you can do it successfully? Absolutely not. You have to go through Satipatthana think training. The meditators train and train and train. Nothing comes easy. You think happiness comes easy? Nothing comes easy. You have to work at it. Instead of watching your YouTube, your entertaining program, a lot of people are putting time to train themselves in this. And you are putting time to train yourself in what? Watching entertaining programs. You know, trying to be pleasure, senses, fulfillment of pleasure. You're not working at it. You're not a studious student working at it, whereas the other guys are working really hard at it. They should get an A. And if you're not working at it, you should fail. Right? 
You are the master of yourself. How come you don't master it and become a slave to it? You should make that decision. From today on, you know, you got to be a master of yourself. You have to do introspection. You have to go through that, that training. You have to train yourself to do it. Some people say meditation is just a yoga exercise. You get good health. More than that, meditation is to go for enlightenment, not just for health. Some people even go to the thinking, "I do meditation so that I, I look beautiful, so that I have, I can, I, I can be in good health." And some people, some people even go to the the gambit of meditation can, can make my sex life better. Some people think that way. They're going, they're going to the wrong direction. They're enhancing their greediness, their jealousy, their seek for sensual pleasures in them. They've gone the wrong way. They're not looking for enlightenment, for the awakening. Okay, watch the thought with the four contemplations, and then how, the, how does my body react to it? And how do I feel? I feel anxious. I feel feared. I shouldn't have that feeling. I'm not that thought. How did my mind think? My mind persistently want to be involved with that thought. Everything is about yourself. Nobody can help you. You think the Buddha can help you just by say Buddha, Buddha, Buddha. The name of Buddha. Buddha can help you. No, you are your own Buddha. You have to do it yourself. If Buddha can help you to get out from anxiety, there will be no one suffering from anxiety because the Buddha is supposed to be all compassionate. Any request will be fulfilled. But the Buddha said, I can only tell you how to do it, but I cannot do it for you because you are that body, you are that thought in you. It's just like the professor can never write examination for you. You have to write examination. You have to study. You have to train yourself to get an A. To get an A. Is it logical? And then finally, if 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 your training is good, you let go of it. You let go of the depression. You let go of that. For example, that thought of laziness. Actually, you should have come up from your sleep to work at something. You should study. You should do something, but you're too lazy. You just want to lazily lie in your bed. Nobody can convince you. Remember when you're, when you're a child, when your dad wants to wake you up, your mom wants to wake you up to go to school. You always want to linger on for another minute because you you're just being overwhelmed by the thought of laziness. You got to push yourself to come up. Now this is a very simple example. In doing meditation, that's why you have to let go. Not just training your concentration, but you have to have concentration first before you can let go. Because if your your mind is all confused, perfused with desultory thoughts, how can you let go? So first of all, you have to get control of your own mind. Then, once you know your own mind. You can gradually, gradually let go, and you have to go through training. How long is the training? It it differs from individual to individual. Some people take one or two months, one or two years, and some people take eight years, nine years, ten years. Lifetime reincarnations, life cycle. It takes a long time. For some people, it takes a short time. Depends on how how hard you work at it. Meditation. Meditation. We start from the lower bottom. We want to meditate, and we know that meditation contains two major aspects: the concentration and the contemplation. And then we also know that if our concentration is good. We get to samadhi. 
which is the mental equanimity and, con and control. If your concentration works well, after training yourself, the samatha, then concentration is just a method. Concentration is a method of doing it. And, and when, if the method is right, if you have done it right, if you are diligently always carrying it out, then you get into what? Samadhi. Mental equanimity. That's the result. There's cost. The cost is concentration. The result is samadhi. It's mental equanimity and control. So there's cost and effect. We call it causality. Everything is cost and effect. Whatever you sow, you reap. You only reap what you sow. You, you, you never can reap something that you haven't sown. Right? You have to do it yourself. So concentration leads to mental equanimity and control. And contemplation would lead to, we call it prajna, which is temporal and spiritual wisdom. Not just temporal. Temporal is worldly wisdom. And spiritual is metaphysical, beyond the world. It, 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 it's beyond, beyond logic, beyond the world. And then when you get on the samadhi, you get on the Buddhahood, or we call it enlightenment. And some people call it awakening, liberation from samsara, from life and death, no more life and death, which is the Buddhahood, enlightenment, or awakening. At this stage, maybe we should, especially for beginners, we should say something very direct, very concrete very down to earth. In order to understand what is awakening, what is enlightening, we have to know a little bit of history. What led 2,600 years ago a prince in northern India, in, in, in the kingdom of Kapilavastu? What led the prince Siddhartha Gautama, what led him to seek enlightenment in the first place before he became the Buddha? What led him? This, it's a very simple question. What led Siddhartha Gautama to his awakening? Why did he, why did he uh, try to get awakening? Why did he get enlightenment? According to his own account, his search for enlightenment began many lifetimes ago not just that lifetime when he was a prince. His, he was in search of enlightenment many, many samsara, many, many lifetimes ago. But in that lifetime, it was sparkled by the realization of the inevitability, inevitable, inevitability of aging, sickness, death, mental defilements, greediness, hatred, sorrow, all this, it was, all of a sudden, it was sparkled by what he saw, what he experienced. And I like to quote what he said in, in, in Sutra. He said, I live in the utmost luxuries, he said. I had three palaces, one for the cold season, one for the hot season, and one for the rainy season. Imagine the prince, he was a prince. You know, in the future, he would succeed his father to be the king. And he lived in three palaces. And during the one for rainy season, rainy, rainy season palace, and during the four months of rainy season in, in India, there, was four, there were four months of rainy season, I was entertained in the rainy season palace by minstrels, minstrel musicians, entertainers, and ladies in court, courtesans, and all the kind of ladies in the, in the palace, royal ladies. And he had the most, he said, he said I had the most luxuries in food and lodging. Whereas the servants and workers of ordinary families were fed with just lentil soup and, 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 and cooked rice. My servants and my workers were fed with wheat, rice, and the best meat. You see how, how luxuries 
the prince enjoy in, in the three palaces with a lot of people. But he wasn't happy. He was endowed with such fortune, but he wasn't happy. Why wasn't he happy? He said, before my self-awakening, when I was still just an unawakened bodhisattva of the Buddha to be, being subject myself to birth, aging, illness, death, sorrow, and defilements, I sought happiness in what was subject to birth, aging, illness, death, sorrow, and defilement. You know what that means? I was looking for, for awakening that, it, that was detached from aging, sickness, death, sorrow, changeability. But now I was, look, I was enjoying luxuries which were all subject to aging, all subject to death, all subject to changeability, all subject to flexibility. I should be, I should be in search of something that is beyond all these. Why am I being subject myself to death, birth, defilement, seeking what is subject to death, defilement? What if I were to seek the unborn, unaging, unerring, undying, sorrowless, undefiled, unexcelled security from bondage of life? He was seeking from something more advanced. But imagine what we're doing in here, essentially being you and I. What were we seeking? Sensual pleasures. You watch television, you enjoy food, you enjoy luxuries, clothes, fame, reputation, wealth. That's what ordinary people were looking for. They were not satisfied with their present status. They were living, were living in an apartment, a bachelor apartment with only one room. We're looking for a two-room apartment. And then we have a, a big apartment. We're looking for a house in Sonnesi. And when we have a Sonnesi house, we're looking for something bigger and bigger and better and better. We're, we're only looking for, joy, for, for luxuries. Well, these luxuries were subject to decay, aging, flexibility, changeability, and finally the death. Why are we doing that? Have we ever paused and think about why we are doing that? And also in the process of looking for all those things, we perform a lot of bad karma. In order to make money, some people what? They were involved in businesses and trades of illegal, illegal trades, or in, in, in a livelihood that were hurtful to, in, to individuals, like killing, hunting, slaughtering, you know, uh, fur coat, killing a lot of fur, for, with seal, you know, um, intoxications, um, you know, many, many um, businesses that incur, incur a lot of bad karma. So the Buddha, the Buddha-to-be, Prince Tanata, at a later time when he was still young, and dealt with the blessings of youth in the first stage of life, he shaved out his head and, and beard. Though my, he, he said, though my parents wished otherwise and were grieving with tears on their faces, when Prince Siddhartha wanted to be a monk, the king and the queen were grieved with tears and didn't want him to leave. But finally, he left the palace and went into a, a home life, in, went from home life into, into what? Homelessness, as an ascetic, in search of the philosophy of going beyond all these. And after eight years of hardship, eight years of difficult times in the practice, mind you, he already practiced in previous lives. He practiced for many, many, many lifetimes. It was just in this lifetime, he was, it was sparkled by what he experienced, that he wanted, in, wanted to be an ascetic, and in search of the awakening that he was hoping for. So, what did we learn from this? What did we learn from history? What did we learn from that Buddha? He gave up his luxuries for something much better, for something away from life and death. 
What are we doing? We're seeking luxuries, and we're not satisfied. We're not satisfied. We always want to increase the level of luxuries. Are we not fooling ourselves? This is what enlightenment is all about. Why did we do all these things? In order just to be healthy, in order just to be happy in this life, this life will soon end. You know, this life, life is short. This life will soon come to an end. You think you are 25 years old and you still have 80 years ahead of you, given that you live up to 125? No, death is awaiting for everybody. Old and young, don't waste your time. Just as what Prince Siddhartha did, spend your time in spiritual pursuit, something much higher. Don't just be satisfied with what you got now, in terms of spirituality, not in terms of materiality. Materiality would not make us happy. It will. It would only increase our greediness, sorrow, lamentation. This is what the Buddha told us. He gave us an example. So today, we continue with how to meditate. How to meditate is a very broad topic. Uh, you can discuss it in roughly, generally, with a summary. You can also go very deep into it. And I have been trying to give a broad summary, but more and more I think that maybe we should get a little deeper now. Uh, into the core of the meditation. Uh, last time, we said that meditation is basically in two major parts, two major portions, or two major parts, or, or you can say, I don't want to use the word traditions, maybe in, in two major uh, aspects of it. So, meditation, it's just as a brief review, is in concentration and contemplation. The Sanskrit word is samatha and, and vipassana. And we said that, just to give you an example, we've been using anapanasati, uh, anposho yi, anapanasati, in and out breath, and in the concentration part. And in the contemplation part, we practice satipatthana. Uh, Satipatthana, it's um, introspection, internal introspection, reflection into the, in your own mind internally. It's not going out, attaching all objects that you, you are interacting with. It's intro, introspection, which is within, within the mind. And we said, as a review, we said that uh, we use a summary, the object of concentration is the breath, and we focus on the in and out breath. And Satipatthana, we have the four introspections of the mind. Some people use mindfulness. And mindfulness, many uh, philosophers, uh, many um, enlightened, uh, more or less enlightened, monks, you know, they don't use, like to use the word mindfulness, they like to use the word introspection, because mindfulness, the English word mindfulness seems to be that the mind has to be filled with something, the mind has to have thoughts of something, but introspection is to empty your mind, how can your mind be, be full, mindful, is the mind full, no, it's not, it's not the mind filling up the mind, no. Clearing your mind, emptying your mind of all this, uh, using that word garbage. Clearing your mind of all this garbage. And so, we use the word introspections. Uh, 
And contemplation is again, is again a word that is close, close to introspection. So it's introspection of the body, introspection of feeling, introspection of mind, and just introspection of mind impressions. Mind impressions is inside. Huh? So all this we have to deal with. But we have been talking about the object of concentration, which we briefly know about it. But now we should jump a little bit to introspection now. But according to many sutras, before you actually get into satipatthana, which is introspection of the mind, you need, you need certain prerequisites, prerequisite conditions, before you get into introspection of the mind. And we call it skillful means, skill, skill, skillful means that stabilize the mind before you even get into introspection. Sometimes we just jump into introspection. Actually, that's not the right way. Um, according to sutras, you really have to have some prerequisites, some preparation before you get into meditation. And um, one of the prerequisites is you have to have a morality standard. You have to you have to know the parameters of what is wrong and what is right before you meditate. Um, all these uh, we need to talk about. So now that you know concentration and contemplation, before concentration and contemplation, you have to have a, a prerequisite preparing, the five prerequisites before you get into Satipatthana. We haven't talked about that before, but we really need to know about it. Otherwise, you're just wandering, you know, at the door without entering into meditation. So let's get to know a little bit more details about the five methods of calming the mind first before you even get into introspection. How do we do it? As prerequisites for the four introspections of the mind, one should practice the five methods of calming the mind, which are preliminary, basic, skillful means that help us to detach from wandering thoughts, bringing the mind to a single-pointed state, one-pointed state. Having achieved samadhi, or concentration, we can contemplate the four introspections and thus generate prajna, which is wisdom. The five methods of calming or stealing the mind. The first one is contemplating the breath. Second one is contemplating the impurity of the body. Three, contemplating loving kindness. Four, contemplating causes and conditions. And fifth, contemplating the limits of phenomena or contemplating the name of a Buddha, depending on the tradition. So what is actually the five methods of calming the mind? Let's talk about the first one. Remember, you need a decision tree to learn all these things. Because when you get into one subject, you forget about where does it come from. The decision tree is meditation requires Samatha and Vipassana. Samatha is focus, concentration, right? Just the focus, concentration. Vipassana is contemplating introspection. It goes deeper. And sometimes you need a combination of both. So concentration and contemplation is two sides of the same coin. A coin cannot go without one, cannot go with just one side. Sometimes you need contemplation in concentrate, concentration. Sometimes you need contemplation in concentration. It's like the wings of two birds. You can just talk about one without talking the other. But why do we separate it? Just to emphasize the topic first. Just to emphasize concentration first, but then we stop introspection for a while and talk about concentration. But actually, you can separate the two. We separate them for the purpose of discussion, 
for the purpose of talking about it. But you cannot say, okay, I concentrate first, I focus first, and then I go introspection. You cannot really focus without understanding, without wisdom, without contemplation. So both goes hand in hand. So let's talk about the breath. So we said concentration and contemplation. The Buddha repeatedly say we should use the breath as the object. Meditation is in and out breath. And concentration involves three topics in it, and contemplation involves another three. Concentration training is counting, following, and stabilization. And contemplation requires introspection, returning, and purification. So remember these six. We call it the six superior doors to meditation. These are the doors to meditation. All right. Let's venture into the first one, counting. Just this one, counting. So you remember the decision, decision tree. Meditation, you have concentration, contemplation, and now we talk about counting. I've been, I've been saying, okay, count, but you don't, you know, what, well, why do I have to count? And some people simply don't follow counting because I can't read your mind. My experience is 50% of the 100, you tell them to count, they just sit there chanting their, their own Mali Bami home, or they sit there peacefully. You don't know what is in their mind. They just don't want to follow you. They're not faithful enough to follow you. They, they think that, well, why do I have to count? Counting is a method spoken by the Buddha, not me. Spoken by the Buddha. Counting. The Buddha already screened all the procedures and say, use the breath and counting is the preliminary. If you can't even count, you can't go following. If you cannot follow, you, you cannot go stabilization. If you cannot go stabilization, you cannot go introspection. If you cannot use introspection, you cannot go returning. If you cannot go returning, you can't even get to purification. Now this is procedural. Within procedural, sometimes you can jump from counting to purification. Or you can jump counting to returning. But these are more or less the procedures that you have to go through. Okay, let us venture into, I use the word, I like to use the word venture because it's interesting. I like to get to venture into counting. What is in counting? And we're still, we're still using the breath. You should know why we, are still, we want to use the breath as the, as, as the object. There are a lot of reasons for it. Okay. In and out breath. Counting. Counting the in breath or the out breath, but not both. Count from one to 10, and then resume from one to 10 again. In other words, habitually I'm used to counting the in breath. So I say in breath. I'm, I'm, I'm breathing in, then I count one. Breathing out, I don't count. I'm breathing in again, I count two. Breathing out, I don't count. So I only count in breath. Why? There are reasons for it. You won't get confused. You won't get too abrupt. So in, you count the in breath. Or you can count the out breath. In other words, I'm not counting the in breath. I'm in, breathing in, I don't count. Out, one. I'm breathing in again, I don't count. Out, I count two. I'm breathing in again, I don't count. Out, I count three. You understand what I'm talking about? If you don't understand what I'm talking about, raise your hands. You don't understand. You understand. Okay, good, 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 okay. Okay. So you count either the in-breath or the out-breath. Now, why don't we do it like this? Why don't we just stop for one minute and you close your eyes 
and you count your in breath. In other words, in you count one, out you don't count. In count two, out you don't count until you come to ten, and then we continue. Okay, all right. Now let's let's meditate. Be very faithful. Count your breath. Don't just do sit there doing nothing. Don't waste your time. Count your you breathe in. You count one. Breathe out. You don't count. Up to ten. Okay. I finished counting ten breaths, but some people are actually you may have finished long time ago, because why? Every breath is different. Some breath is longer, some breath is shorter, some breath is deeper, some breath is shallow, some breath is noisy, some breath is quiet, some breath is subtle, some breath is coarse. Because every breath is a little different. And there are criteria for a good breath. We go down there. We know that there's criteria for an enlightened, more or less enlightened breath. Okay, let's go down. Count from one to ten, and then resume from one to ten. If you lose your count due to interruption from wandering thoughts, resume the count again from one to ten. Sometimes when you're counting, 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 you lose your count. You think about yesterday. You worry about tomorrow. You think about what am I going to have for lunch? You're going to be where am I going after this meditation sitting? So you could be disturbed, interrupted by wandering thoughts. You lose your count. What do you do then? You come back to the count again. You lose it. You come back to it. It requires training. Meditation is not just one Saturday afternoon and then I go there and relax myself and. What do you mean by training? I, I, I don't like training. is it, It's dogmatic. Training is control. I don't like that on a Saturday morning. No, you require. We require training. Meditation is training of the mind. You need to put your efforts into it. If you don't put your efforts into it, you can't do meditation. Okay, breathe. Next, breathe spontaneously as you are breathing from time to time. Do not make your breath longer or shorter. Be natural. Do not count beyond ten. Don't count beyond ten, because you're confused by the number from one to ten only. Don't count 102, 104, 116. Oh, did I count 116 or 115? Don't do that. Only from one to ten. The breath is continuously living with the mind. You have the breath. You have the mind. They're brothers. They can't leave each other. The mind is the breath. The breath is the mind. If the breath is deep, smooth, quiet, subtle, and long, that could indicate that the mind is more stabilizing than living with a breath that is short, interrupted, noisy, and what rough. So, if your breath. Has changed from noisy to being quiet, from shallow to deep, from short to long, etc., etc. That means you're on your way in tranquility. And according to many classical uh, Chinese med- Chinese medicine sutras,、um, beings. Human beings, or even beings, whose breath is long, subtle, quiet, uninterrupted, they usually live longer than than animals, than beings with short, interrupted, noisy breath. A dog only lived for 15 years, right? How did a dog breathe? <laughs> That's how they breathe, right? A horse. Animals that that their breath is short, interrupted, noisy, not subtle, they live they live a shorter life. So, in other words, 
if your breath is subtle, insubstantial, quiet, deep, long, you will enjoy a longer life. So the breath is absolutely important. Okay, let's go on to the next one. Okay, now, counting. According to the Buddha, if counting is successfully achieved, the following effects will manifest. Through relying on counting the breaths, the petitioner gains the ability to manifest the four dhyanas, the four immeasurable minds, and the four formless absorptions. For those who despise or underestimate breath meditation, you should see this. This practice is, all, is enough to lead you to the four dhyanas, to the four immeasurable minds, and the four formless absorptions. Now, what, what does this mean? I'm not going to go into full explanation because it takes time. Suffice it to say, this training is enough to, to lead you to samadhi. Just this training is enough to lead you there. This is what we, the Buddha said about what you, we can achieve just by counting. So be faithful to the practice. Counting first. Don't just do anything else. I can't read your mind because I know that, according to my experiences, when you tell them to count, oh, <laughs> Some of them sleep through, you know, some of them think about something else. Some of, some of them even say, Om Mani Bami Hong, Om Mani Bami Hong, Om Mani Bami Hong, quietly in their mind. They just chant Om Mani Bami Hong. Or they just do what they want. Counting. Okay, next. When we say counting, the sutra breaks it down into two parts. Count, cultivation. Cultivating, cultivating count. Cultivation is the cause, and realization is the effect. So, cause will not lead to the effect. First, we go into the cultivation of it. How do you do it? The practitioner regulates and harmonizes the breath so that it is neither too rough nor too subtle, counting unhurriedly and slowly from one to ten. One focuses the mind on the counting and does not allow it to wander off or become scattered. So your job actually is quite simple. Count from one to ten. When you wander off into all directions, come back again. Training, training, training. Until your breath is what? Until your breath is very silent. Until your breath is long and deep until your breath is insubstantial, until your breath is subtle, until your breath is so fine that you don't even notice it. You're breathing, but you don't even notice it. You know when you notice your breath? Clearly notice your breath? When you have a flu. You can breathe. How do you realize? What is the realization coming out of the cultivation? After the mind stabilized in accounting, the practitioner feels that the breath becomes insubstantial, subtle. Mm. Insubstantial is subtle. It's not substance anymore. It's not a breath anymore. You can feel it. It's so fine, so fine, so subtle. It becomes so subtle and fine. Then he becomes concerned that counting has become a coarse activity, not subtle enough. He feels that his mind is more at peace for a finer activity in his breath than counting. Then he should switch to following. So in other words, some people say, I've been meditating for five years, and where would I go from here? I don't know, how do I go from here? You know yourself. When you count, when your counting has become so insubstantial, so subtle, so successfully completed, you will find that even the counting is something that disturbs you. Before counting is the thoughts that come to your mind, all the wandering thoughts, thoughts of depression, thoughts of anxiety, fear, hatred, greediness, jealousy, all kinds of thoughts come up to disturb your counting. But now all those thoughts will detach from you. You don't have those passion, you know, mental afflictions thought anymore. You don't have depression anymore. You don't have greediness anymore. You don't have nothing of that. You only have the counting. 
the counting is subtle. And then, when you, when you go a little gradually, you'll find that even the counting is, it's, it's, it's a thought that I don't like. Even the counting is not fine enough. The counting is not subtle enough. I don't want to be disturbed by the counting. Then you do what? Then you should quit counting and go into following. So that's the second, the second stage of the game. If we call it a game, the second stage. Counting is the first stage. Not going in, you don't go into the second stage when you haven't successfully completed the first stage of counting. So then you go into following. Following. So how do we cultivate following? How do we realize following? The petitioner relinquishes counting and relies single-mindedly on following the coming in and and going out of the breath, remaining free of any distraction and scatteredness of his focus. What does that mean? Now you don't count anymore because the count is too coarse an activity. What do you do? You follow the breath through. Now the breath comes into my nostrils, or it hits the nostrils, it wriggles my hair, my, the hair in my nostrils, I can feel it, and it gets into, it gets into my throat, now it comes down to my lung. It gets down, all the way down. It, it permeates my body. And it goes to, to my belly button. It permeates everywhere. You follow the breath. You actually, in detail, follow the track of the, ba- the breath. In detail, as much detail as you should. You don't count anymore. You follow your breath because your breath permeates into everybody's cells, permeates in all directions. You follow it until, some people follow it under the throat, under the lung, and then it goes all the way through. You know what? You can even follow the biology of your body. Get into Google and get out the map, the biological function of the body. Where does the breath get in? Do you follow? biologically where the breath goes through until it hits the ocean of breath which is approximately two or three inches underneath the belly button. You know where the belly button is? Underneath the belly button. Because you cannot, because when you follow it, the breath is not so long that you can follow it for, 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 for five minutes. So it has to stop somewhere because it would go out again. When it comes out, you follow it, how it comes out? Because you follow the in and out. Unless your, your, your breath is really deep, your following will not be too long. But you have to follow it, follow your breath, and don't let it leave you. Follow your breath wherever it will go. Follow it closely. No other thoughts, no wandering thoughts, just following. And because of the following of the breath, the practitioner becomes able to what? Develop the 16 superior phenomena. When you are successfully following, at that time, you know that you're on your way. Don't say, where do I go from here? That automatically you know where to go. You don't need anybody to tell you. And then what happened? 16 phenomena will come out then you know that your following is successful. How do you judge that your following is successful? 16 superior phenomena will come out. Uh, I, will, I can't go through every one, but I just show you now so that we can talk about it next time. What are the 16? Awareness that the breath is coming in. Awareness that the breath is going out. Awareness that the breath is long or short. Awareness that the breath permeates the body, relinquishing all physical actions, mental experiences of joy, mental experiences of bliss, experiences of mental actions. I need to explain every one of these in in the next session. And then also, the mental production of joy, the mental development of concentration, 
the mental generation of liberation, the contemplation of impermanence, the contemplation of dispassion, the contemplation of abandonment of desire, the contemplation of cessation, the contemplation of renunciation. Every one of these required explanation, which I will do next time. Let's have a review, because we need a decision tree to you to look at, an, an, an analytical decision tree. You have meditation, and then you have concentration and contemplation. Before you do concentration and contemplation, you need five methods to stabilize the mind. And the first method is counting, which later also coincides with the concentration of counting. So that, and in, in talking about each method, counting on following, we have two aspects to talk about it. How to do it, what comes out of it. How to do it is the cultivation part of it. What, it come, what, what comes out of it is the realization part of it. Now we know the decision tree? All right, so we'll talk about it next time. Now, just a fast three minutes review. Meditation contains concentration and contemplation. And uh, for concentration, we use the object, the breath as the object. Contemplation, we practice by th the four introspections of the mind. Okay, contemplation of body, of feeling, of mind, of mind impressions. Uh, but bef before we go into concentration and contemplation, there are the five methods of stilling the mind which is an expedient or skillful means preparing you for concentration and contemplation. So even before that, before this, we should, we should have a preparation for these. And one of these preparations, the five methods of calming the mind, this is before a preparation for satipatthana, for introspection and for concentration. And we have started talking about contemplating the breath. Now, even contemplating the breath, there are certain things you have to do. Some people may be practicing in here for years, and they haven't really faithfully followed the breath. They just sit there quietly, relaxing. That's not meditation. Because I can't, I can't control your mind how to think. When you, are, when you are practicing in here, some people just sit there or chanting or not doing this. Now, that's the reason why I told you. You have to really faithfully follow it. So, contemplating the breath, and I have explained that itself includes six methods according to the Buddha. The first one is counting. The second one is following. When you, have, when you are successful in your counting, when you're thorough with, with your counting, you already have, so to speak, master your counting techniques, then you go into following. When you have mastered your following technique, you go into stabilization. When you master stabilization, you go into introspection. When you master introspection, you go into returning. When you, go, when you master returning, you go into purification. When you go into purification, you are already all prepared for Satipatthana, for high level of meditation. So, these are the basics that you really have to follow before you get into Satipatthana, the four introspections, according to the, to the Buddha. And, and we started with counting. We said counting the in and out breath, but not both. Count from one to ten and then resume. Breathe spontaneously as you're breathing from time to time. Do not make your breath longer or shorter. Be natural, do not count beyond 10. Your breath is continuous living within with your mind. If the breath is deep, smooth, quiet, subtle, and long, that could indicate that the mind is more stabilizing than living with a mind, a breath that is short, interrupted, noisy, and short. Now that you already, we have already talked about it. So we said, 
when you become successful in your accounting, you could, you could even have a glimpse of the four dhyanas or the four immeasurables or the formless absorptions. So when you really follow your breath and you do it successfully, you, can, you, you master the practice, you know because you are in, they, all, they, they used to say absorption, uh, a jhana, or uh, the most tranquility, equanimity. If you don't have that, that means you haven't mastered it. I we already talked about it last time. Now we talk about how to count and, how, and what the count will, will um, make you realize what. Uh, so we already have covered it. I think you already have copied down some notes on that. And today, I only have 10 minutes left, so I don't know what I should be talking about, but I would be talking about this that I haven't talked about last time. The quality of the breath when you are counting during meditation, you may possess any of the four characteristics. So in other words, you can examine yourself. You can be a teacher of yourself as to how successful you have been in your counting, as to whether you have really uh, master the practice of counting. There are four qualities. Windy breathing. When a meditator senses the presence of a sound as the breath goes in and out of the nose, you actually feel the sound there. The sound. If you feel the sound, there's one quality. You can feel the sound of the breath. That's one characteristic. The second characteristic is uneven breathing. When the meditator breathing, breathing is uneven, not smooth, and obstructed, as if having na nasal congestion when one has a flu. So in other words, your breath is interrupted. Your breath is not smooth. Your breath is not even. That's uneven breathing. That's another characteristic in your breath. The third, ordinary breathing. Even though the meditator's breathing makes no sound, even and unobstructed, it is still not subtle. That's the ordinary breathing that we have. Ordinary people breathe, you don't know that you have a sound. Uh, but you do have a sound because if you, it said if you put two fingers into your eardrums and listen, you may, you may hear the sound of your breath. Or if you really put your attention to it, the sound is there. You may think there is no sound, but actually there is a sound there. That means you may not be ordinarily breathing because you realize the sound. It may be, it may be interrupted. I know, I, I know some people told me that their breath is interrupted. In other words, they, they feel as if they don't have enough breath. When they breathe in, it's interrupted. They have to make it longer, but they can't. The, the breath is not smooth. Subtle breathing, no sound, no obstructions. The exhalation and inhalation are, are of extended duration, such that they are as if still there, and, y and yet not there. You feel that your breath Oh, my breath is there, but it's not there. I can't feel it. It's so subtle, so fine, so long, so deep, that I cannot feel my breath. It, even if I close my eardrums, even if I really feel it, I don't feel my breath. That's good. That is a subtle breathing. That is subtle breathing. Now, if that happens, the mind becomes peaceful, stabilizing, and you're feeling content. You feel that everything is so peaceful, everything is so tranquil. But do you have that feeling when you're doing subtle breathing? When you have subtle breathing, then this technique, which is the number one, there are six more, which follow one after the other. The first one, we say it, okay, you pass. You pass the first one. If you have subtle breathing, you'll pass the first one. If you can't even have subtle breathing, you don't even pass the breathing test. 
how can you have a good meditation? You understand what I mean? So be your own examiner, be your own marker. You can mark your own examination paper. How do you do a pass? How, how do you qualify for a pass? Subtle breathing, no sound, no obstruction, even. You're breathing, but you can't feel it. It's so long, so deep, so un unnoticeable, so subtle, it's not coarse. Then you start to have some peace setting into your mind because your breath, you can focus on it. Now, that goes without saying that you are not scattering. If you are scattering, then you have no peace. If you, are, if you are drowsy, you have no peace. If you are drowsy, what kind of breathing do you have? <laughs> what kind of breathing? That's drowsiness. But if you are scattering, what kind of breathing do you have? If you are scattering, your mind will be so confused. Oh, how come I'm, I'm thinking about yesterday? How come I'm, I'm anxious about tomorrow? tomorrow? How come I worry about where am I going after lunch? How come I worry about all this? Then you don't have subtle breathing because you're not even setting your mind on the breathing. So can you be, can you be your own examiner? Don't say, I need a teacher. Yes, at this point, you don't need a teacher. Who is your teacher at this point? Not me. It's the Buddha. The Buddha wrote, the Buddha put all this down telling us this is how we examine ourselves. Do it step by step. Don't say, oh, I want to attain enlightenment. I want to be awake. I want to have awakening. Oh, I have a, I have a trance. I have, I couldn't see my own body. <laughs> you can't even do your own counting. There's so many meditation techniques out. We are following the Buddha's technique. There's so many techniques out that they, they slightly modify the Buddha's meditation technique and call it their own. There's so many meditation techniques that they modify 30 to 30, 40 percent and call it meditation. You know, but we are following the Buddha's way according to Satipatthana, Anapanasati, Maha Satipatthana Sutra. So this is counting. We have already talked for at least 20 hours on uh, the methods of meditation. And uh, just to do a brief review of what we have been talking about meditation, there are so many methods in meditation. Um, we are using the methods as introduced by the Buddha, Buddha Sukh Sakamuni, uh, in his sutras. Maha Satipatthana and Anapanasati. So we have been using the in and out breath uh, meditation. Um, that's a very safe meditation. Um, meditation could be risky, you know. We'll get into that issue later. Um, people usually look at the bright side of meditation. Uh, there could be a dark side if you don't know how to do it, if you misused it, if you didn't do it right, it could be a dark side. And most uh, information only um, illuminate on, the, on, on the, the beneficial parts of it. But if you don't know how to do it, uh, there could be problems that you should know. Okay, but let's continue with the in and out breath. Now, we say meditation is in two parts, basically. The concentration part, the Sanskrit called samatha, and the contemplation part, the Sanskrit called vipassana. And 
in the concentration part, we have counting, following, and stabilization. So on the contemplation part, we have introspection, returning, and purification. Um, we've been talking on counting on the first one, on the counting, the object of concentration is counting. And let's do a fast review. Counting, we, the way we discussed it, we discussed how to cultivate counting, the counting method, and how to, uh, and uh, we also talk, we'll talk about the realization part of the counting. Uh, in counting, the practitioner regulates and harmonizes the breath so that it is neither too rough nor too subtle, counting unhurriedly and slowly from one to ten, one focus, focuses the mind on the counting and does not allow, allow your, does not allow your mind to wander off, you know, or become scattered. Now, if you do your counting properly, people say, where do I go from here? I'm counting, you know, the counting method, uh, as introduced by the Buddha, so, where do I go after counting? You know where to go. You know your counting is well done when you have the following. We call it subtle breathing. So, in meditation, you really need training. It's not just you come once in a while, you do half an hour one day, and you don't do it, and you, uh, you do another half hour, three days, four days later. That's not meditation. That's you just relaxing. Meditation needs training, training your own mind all the time, faithfully. So you know that your counting is well done when you have subtle breathing. How do you know that you have subtle breathing? Number one, when your breathing makes no sound, when you can't, cannot hear your breathing, usually you can hear your breathing. You can actually hear your breathing internally but when your breathing makes no sound, when the breathing is smooth and your breathing is long and deep with no obstruction, you know that you have subtle breathing. Number two, the exhalation and the inhalation are of, of extended duration such that they are as if still there and yet not there. It's your breath develops from being subtle to fine. It almost like it disappears. You can't feel your breath anymore. Usually everybody feels his own breath. Uh, when your breath is subtle, you cannot feel it. That's the time when you know that you graduate from the school of counting. Let's, let's say there are six schools in, in in and out breath. Counting, following, stabilization, introspection, returning and um, purification. So, every one of these, if, you, if we used the analogy of a school, the school of counting, when would you graduate from the school of, account, of counting? Not accounting, counting, okay? That is when your breath is subtle. When your breathing is subtle, then the mind has less and less scattering thoughts you're feeling content and peaceful. So in other words, when your monkeying mind is not hopping from one branch to another, right now you may not realize it, you may not notice it, our mind is all over the place, every second, like a monkey going in all different directions, even when you're meditating. When you're meditating, when you're sleeping, even in your dream, the monkeying mind is hopping from one branch to another. A branch of greediness, hopping to another branch of jealousy, a branch of hatred, a branch of anxiety, a branch of depression, a branch of fear, a branch of egoistic behavior, a branch of, you name them, arrogance. We're hopping from one branch to another. But now, your breath is so subtle that the mind has less and less wandering and scattering thoughts. 
you're feeling content and peaceful, then you know that you have already graduated from the school of counting. So you don't have to ask your teacher, because your teacher don't know how subtle your breathing is. If you know that your breathing is subtle, that means you graduated. Don't go on to the next school if you haven't graduated from the school of counting. If you haven't graduated from grade one, going to grade two, you're not qualified for grade two yet. After you graduated from the school of, of counting, you go to the school of following. Now, what is this school all about? When counting is well done, the mind is content with peacefulness. The petitioner feels that counting is not fine enough. Counting is too coarse. He does not want to bother counting. As the breath disappears, the breath is disappearing. What are you counting? Counting what? You only count when you have a breath, right? When your breath disappears, what do you count? To him, counting is an attachment. He is now going on to a higher level of in and out breath meditation. He just wants to follow the breath. The breath is so subtle that even counting itself is not fine enough. You want to use the method of following. Now, now let's get into following now, the second level. So don't ask, where am I going from here? Have you finished your counting? Have you faithfully followed counting? Some people are in counting for 50 years because they just desultorily uh, practice meditation, maybe one hour per day, 50 minutes per day, and then they, go, they, they wander off in different directions, they learn different methods, and then they, list, they read some books, see some videos, and then after one or two years go back to, to meditation again, or they don't take it seriously. They're not in that school. You're not a serious student of, of counting. That's why you're getting nowhere. That's why your mind is not peaceful. Your mind is not content. That's why your mind, your mind is always wandering off in all different directions of the temporal world, which concentrates at materialism, fame, reputation, greediness, you know, all kinds of desires because you haven't graduated from the school of counting. Now, we have, assuming we have, we, we go into following now. And how, how do we analyze following? First of all, we look at how do we cultivate, how do we develop following? And then we examine, what do we get from it? People like to say, what do I get from, from following? You know what you got from counting now, have you? What, what do you get from counting? Subtle breathing, peacefulness of mind, content. Your breath disappears, no sound. Long, deep, smooth. Now, let's talk about following. The cultivation of following. The practitioner relinquishes counting because counting is not fine enough for him and relies single-mindedly on following the coming in and going out of the breath, remaining free of any distraction and scattering of his focus. He just follows the breath. Oh, the breath comes in. It goes into my body. It permeates into my organs. It goes into every part of my body. So you just, you follow the track of the breath. You follow it. It's not easy. You follow it, you follow it from one second, the next second you're thinking of, where do I go? Do I go to a white spot for lunch? Or, or McDonald's? Or do I try a, a different burger? You know, you, you think of many, many things. What happened yesterday? What did my wife say? I, my, my wife said something I don't like. Or my boss said something I don't like. Uh, I have a fear about my own job. When I get laid off, if I got laid off, how do I get UI? You know, how do I get this report? How did they report me? Oh, my business is going down the drain. What would I do? Should I get a job? Uh, my marriage is hitting against a rock. It's going to be broken. 
um, all kinds of thinking. Now, okay, you cultivate your follow. How exactly do you follow your breath? Just talking about following isn't enough. How do you follow? Do you know where your breath is? Here, right? What's the easiest object that you can follow? Not anything else externally. What do you follow? You follow a car? You follow a bird? It's so external that it disappears from your sight immediately. What do you follow? The best, the most akin to you is your breath. Don't tell me that you cannot even follow your own breath. What is life? Life is a breath. Some people say life is, it's, it's, uh, is within a few hours, within one hour, within five minutes, within six minutes. But I, the, even the Buddha said, life is in between breath. If you stiff your nose and close it, the last breath is already gone. And if you don't follow it by the next one, you're dead after a while. No oxygen goes into the brain anymore. So life is so short. People say life is short, it's just about 100 years. No, life is not about 100 years. It's about in between one breath. If, if, the, if the previous breath is not followed by the next breath, you're out. So actually life is an illusion. Life is so short that it's an illusion. And when we talk about time dimensions, when the Buddha talked about time dimensions, we have the past, we have the present, we have the future, right? Three di dimensions of time. Our body occupies space. And what is time? What exactly in our body that clearly shows us the passage of time. Your breath, right? One breath after another, the timing is short, the passage of time. When we talk about the past, usually a modern guy would say, yesterday, my past is yesterday, my past is last year, my past is two years ago, three years ago. But the Buddha said, your most recent past is when you were given birth, the most recent. Your remote past is your previous lives, which is immeasurable, so many lives. But your most recent, the, most that, the, the past that you can keep track of, is when you were birth, when you're at birth. When you're born into this world, that's how long ago, at birth. And then, that's your past, but how about the future? What will the future be? What is waiting for you? Your future, that's for sure. Death, <laughs> you know, death. What is waiting for us? Tomorrow? No, death, for sure. If you don't have to die, raise your hands. Anyone who doesn't have to die, raise your hand. So we said our past is at birth, our future is death. What is in between? What is in between? Which, which, which signifies, delineates, and clearly tells us the passage of time. What's in between? You don't even know about it? Oh, I know about it now. Aging. You are aging all the time. There are some meditators there I saw about a few years ago, and suddenly when I saw him or her, him again, it's not the same, exactly the same person. A little bit of wrinkles here and there, including myself. Aging is in between. Is in, in between. But then birth, aging, and death. We know this is the passage of time. During this time, what do we do? 
What do we do during this time that we know we are given birth, we're aging, and we die? What do we do? Every day, what do we do? We're struggling for what? Wealth, reputation, fame, relationships. What do we do? We are doing something that is absolutely not important to our enlightenment, to our spiritual transformation, to saving ourselves. The Buddha said we're not saving ourselves in the, in, the, in the modern world. What we're looking for is just materials, a big house, good car, you know, rich, billionaires. Can money help you to be away from death, to be away from aging, to be away from birth? Do you have a choice when you're being born into this world? Do you have a choice? You don't have. What determines where you go? What you have done? Your karma. You have exactly contributed to what you will be in the future. What you are suffering now is what you have done in the past. Cost and effect. So the Buddha said, this world is a world of suffering because what we're experiencing is actually birth, aging, and death. But then what do we do? We're always building up bad karma. We're building up bad karma to justify the next reincarnation into another body. The Buddha said, don't reincarnate anymore. Don't get into the world of suffering. Elevate yourself from samsara. Transform yourself spiritually, not materially, not physically, not emotionally. But doing, going through that transformation where you can be out from samsara. And the Buddha introduces methods to tell us to get out from samsara. So many methods in, in the Buddhist teaching. But who would care to spend time in studying and training himself to be liberated from samsara? Not many. People are just struggling for fame, reputation, and food, and relationships, yeah, this kind of thing. And then they died again, going to the next round of reincarnation. Cause and effect, causality. So we know that when we, um, when we practice following, the method of following, then we will have realization. But first of all, how do we practice following? Let's get into the 16 superior phenomena. Because of following the breath, the practitioner becomes able to develop 16 superior phenomena during the cultivation. In other words, you will experience this. That's actually what you are developing. What's this? First one, awareness that the breath is coming in. So when you're following the breath, then you say, you say to yourself, now the breath is coming in. You follow it, right? When you're following it, you have to know when it comes in, when it leaves, right? You're following it, right? If you're a detective, you're following a, you know, someone, you, you have to, you can't leave him out of sight. You got to see him, you got to make sure that, okay, he's coming, now I'm sitting in here waiting for him, he's out there, he's coming into a restaurant, I know that he's coming in. Right? So, awareness that the breath is coming in. Awareness that the breath is going out. Can you be aware of that? When you follow something, you follow it in and out. Can you not follow it in and out? Don't tell me that I can't do following. It's your own breath. So, be aware of the breath coming in, when the breath comes in, you know that now the breath is coming in. When the breath goes out, of course, you're going to follow it all the way through. When it goes out, now it's going out, right? Right? And then awareness that the breath is long or short. Sometimes when you're not healthy, when you have a flu, a cold, um, then 
your nose is congested, you have, you, you have nasal congestion, then, then your breath is short, then oh my breath is short. And sometimes my breath is long, very long, my breath is short. You can realize the length of your breath, the duration of your breath, right? You also follow its duration. When you're following a guy, don't let him out of sight. During the process that he's walking, you also follow that guy, right? Fourth, awareness that the breath permeates the body. Oh, it comes in now. And now I realize that it gets into my esophagus. It gets into my lung. My lungs feel cool. And no, 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 my lungs doesn't feel cool because the, the air is not fresh here. It's smoky, so I can feel it permeates my body, but it's, the smokiness is also being felt by me. So you, you are aware that the breath permeates the body. And sometimes you have to visualize it. Because when it gets into your organ, if you're not subtle enough, you don't know where the breath is. But you really have to visualize it. So it's very good that you have, a, you have some knowledge of biology, where your lung is, your intestines, your organs and everything. So that's the reason why monks, uh, when we are practicing impurity contemplation, we put a skeleton by the side. And we always know that it's very, very expensive, the skeleton. It would be inexpensive at a certain time of the year. You know what time of that year? Huh? Halloween. <laughs> you know Halloween? <coughs> Halloween day, you know, you, you, can, you can get that. You know, we usually go out to buy, not clothes, not shoes. People say, what are you going out to buy on Halloween day? Skeleton. Scare them. Skeleton. Because that's how we contemplate. Skeleton. So, awareness the breath permeates the body, relinquishing all physical actions. What does that mean? Calming the breath to release body fabrications. Well, what, what do I mean by that? Sometimes you are meditating and because of chi imbalances, sometimes your hands move. And sometimes you'll be shaking like that. The body fabrications. You are aware of that too, because you're, when you're following the breath, the breath induces the chi imbalances. Sometimes you move. And sometimes the, the chi would move you to a position that is not right. I have seen people like that in here. They're sitting like this. Have you seen people sitting like this? They're not straight, they're always like this. Do you have a question? No? I thought you have a question. Is it involuntary? What? Is it involuntary? The, the is, it, is, oh, it's involuntary, yes. But you have to be what? Aware of it. It's involuntary, but you can stop it, actually, right? Yeah. It, 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 if it is not involuntary, you can't stop it. So you can stop it any time. But it just comes out naturally. But if you are really in tranquility, there shouldn't be any body fabrications. You, you must be aware of the body fabrications. Some people say, okay, I have body fabrications, I move, and I feel good, so I want to move every time. When I move, I want to make sure that it moves. No. So when the physical actions come, you let, it, you let it go, but you allow the momentum to carry on, and then it will go. You won't say, I like the shaking, because it helps me to exercise. Then you're in trouble, because you're attached to it. Okay? And six, the mental experience of joy. I mean, you feel joyful. You, you are aware of the joyfulness. The mental experiences of bliss, which is a higher level of joy. The experiencing of all mental actions, being aware of all mental fabrications. Now, previously you have bodily fabrications. Now you have mental fabrications. What is this mental fabrications? And you're sitting in there and sometimes you feel, I have anger in me. Because my, my abusive childhood brought back memories that I dislike. I hated my alcoholic dad. He beat me up. So you brought back this mental fabrications and you dwell in it, you feel unhappy, you feel angry. Try to let that go. Don't let your past 
anger linger on. Yesterday I was talking to a, a, a fellow and he said he felt oh, every now and then he had a depression. And then we, uh, after we talk about it, and uh, how does it start? Where did, where, where did it come from? Is that I hate my dad. My, my, my dad was a wino, you know, drinking all the time and, and beat me up and I, did, I didn't like my childhood. And I can't forgive him. So I talk and talk to him, I said, forgiveness is, anyone who can, who can forgive is not a coward. Only heroes forgive. Only cowards attach to hatred. Uh, because they are not strong enough to let the hatred go. So the, the, the higher your forgiveness, the more heroic your feeling is. It's always good to forgive than to anchor your hatred in you, which makes you depressed. So always forgive. Forgiveness is, is like when you look at the sky. And if always anchoring your hatred, it's just like you're sitting in a closed room where you're surrounded by nothing but hatred. So always open up your mind. Whatever bygone which induce you hatred uh, because of certain actions that, um, that have been performed on you, forgive that. Because it will not, it, you will not allow it to happen again. And that agony, don't bring that agony onto the present table and thought about it and ponder on it. It's unfair to you. Because whatever past is past, how come you brought bad experiences onto the present table and attached to it? It would be foolish to do that. Because first of all, it won't happen again. Second of all, you don't allow it to happen. So why, why do you let it to haunt you? Get that off. Let us continue with meditation. In meditation, the study and practice of meditation, and the reason why I said the study and practice is not just um, the study of it. We have to practice it. Meditation means knowing it and actually carrying it out. You have to walk the board. You can just talk about it. So I said the study and the practice of meditation can be examined in two parts major parts. Very quickly, let's do a review. It's concentration and contemplation. And contemplation, sometimes we refer to it as introspection. Introspection is a better word than contemplation, as a matter of fact. Um, concentration, we practice Anapanasati, and we already explained what is Anapanasati. Uh, and for contemplation, we practice Satipatthana. And Satipatthana, of course, the major portions of Satipatthana, it's the four introspections of the mind that we already have talked about in detail, and we're not going to do it again. So let's get on to the next one. So we say meditation, in and out breath, and we call it Anapanasati. That's what the Buddha taught us. And of course, nowadays, a lot of people, uh, they, may, they may have studied the Buddhist teaching and then they mixed in their feelings about it, their practice about it, and they may say, this is our practice, my practice meditation. But everything actually flows from what the Buddha was talking about. But some, some people may just modify it and call it, I don't know, so many names, uh, they, how they call it. So we call it in and breath, in and out breath meditation. And which includes, of course, again, concentration and contemplation. And in concentration, because now we emphasize on the in and out breath meditation. So how do we deal with the breath? That we've been talking about concentration, the counting, the following, and the stabilization. We, we talk about counting in detail. How do we count from one to ten and not until we reached the well-done portion, the complete portion, the satisfactory and well-controlled 
target of counting, we won't continue. In other words, you have to be successfully completing the, the course. You have to graduate from counting before you go into following. And we'll already talk about that in detail. Then you have to graduate from the school of following before you get into stabilization. So counting, following, and stabilization is the concentration part, which is the, the summata part. And then the introspection is the contemplation includes the introspection, returning, and purification. So these, if you talk about meditation and you don't know about these, you're not meditating at all. So that's what we've been concentrating in. And we talk about counting, we talk about following, and uh, let's continue. If you have been successful in, in counting, now you get into following. In following, how do you feel? How do you cultivate it? We already talked about how do you feel when you successfully complete your following procedures? You will be aware of the breath is coming in. You'll be aware that the breath is going out. Usually those people who are ruminating in all kinds of concepts and inward appearances and outward appearances, you're not aware of your breath coming in because you have been thinking about many other things that you are not aware of your breath coming in. So you should be aware of, the, of, of your breath coming in. That's the reason why some people say meditation, the purpose of meditation is to create your awareness. People who, did, who committed crime, they're not aware of the consequences. They are not aware of what they're doing. They just work on impulse, work on anger, work on jealousy, hatred, you, you name them. They're not aware that what they're doing bring a lot of dire, uh, uh, you know, uh, fatal consequences. So you, you should be aware. You must be aware of your breath coming in, aware of your breath going out in following. We already said counting. You must be aware the breath is long or short. The breath is coming in is long or, sh or short. Awareness the breath permeates the body. You, you know that your breath now gets into the esop, your, 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 your throat, and then you get into a lung, and from the lung it goes on to every part of the body. You partially visualize the permeation of the breath into different parts of the body. So meditation is interesting. It's demanding, it's effort supplying, it's training. Um, just like when people playing soccer ball, those people who are really expert in it, they are training, they receive training every day. All these famous, you know, professionals, uh, soccer players, they practice, practice every day to be successful in their skill of controlling the ball. So, in meditation, it's the same thing. Meditation is training your mind so that you can, in the following, in that school of following, awareness, the breath permeates the body, relinquishing the all physical actions. Uh, that means calming the breath to release bodily fabrications. What does that mean? When, when you're meditating, you could be moving, you could, you could be feeling itchy, you could be feeling all kinds of bodily feelings. You, you'll be able to be aware of it and you will be able to relinquish it, let it go. And then, six, the mental experience of joy. You feel joyful. When you are doing following well, you actually feel joyful in your meditation. And next, the mental experience of bliss, you actually feel blissful. Joy is a lower level than bliss. Joy is uh, a crude level of happiness. Bliss is a higher level of happiness. There's difference. There's degree of happiness. Next, the experiencing of all mental actions. Now, your number five is bodily fabrications. But other than physical body fabrication, you also have mental fabrications. You experience them and you're being aware of them. For example, you're meditating, you're following it, and then all of a sudden you thought about yesterday, 
your colleagues scolded you. You created these unhappy feelings. And why did they do that to me? Why did they talk to me like that? A lot of why, you know. Um, how come he's like that? Is he belittling me? Is he, he despise me? Or you, you create a lot of mental fabrications. Uh, you let them go. You experience them, you are aware of them, and you let them go. This is very difficult. Somebody wrongly accuse you of something at home or on the job. You hate it. You hate it, and you anchor that in your mind. You probably will anchor that in, in your mind for at least a few days, maybe weeks, maybe months. Some people want a physical revenge. You step on my back, I'm going to step on your back to get even in the future. You know, something like that. You are always anchor this mental fabrication in your mind. You thought that you've been ill-treated. You thought that's been unfair to you. You thought that um, uh, you have all kinds of mental afflictions coming up, uh, coming from recollection, com coming up from, from the past. You bring your past experiences that are terrible, that are abusive, onto the present, and you ruminate on it. You get painful on it. Although those experiences are gone, you still want to bring the experiences back and think about it and hate it. That's what we usually do. So you experience that when you are doing following, you know that you brought back all these mental afflictions of jealousy, hatred, greediness, anger, you name them. You like to brought them back and think about it. Now, when you're doing following, you know, I want to let them go. I want to let them go. No more, no, none of these will affect me anymore. Can you do that? Extremely difficult. Some people would remember Someone treated you unwell for years, for months. The way they talk to you. Or some, some people, so, uh, your friend borrows some money from you, $10,000. He never repay you, and he disappeared. And you hated him because you thought you lost $10,000. You could have used the $10,000 to do a lot of other things. So you, you, somebody owes you something, you can't forget it. Even though the $10,000 is gone, but you still want to ruminate on it, you still want to be painful about it, you suffer from it. That's usually what we usually do. All right, next. The mental production of joy. Joy is coming to you in, 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 your, in, in your meditation, if you do following. The mental development of concentration. You can concentrate very well when you are doing following. So when we experience following, when we are practicing following, then something happened. The development of concentration. And then something happened. The mental generation of liberation. What is liberation? Liberation is something that you anchor in your mind. All of a sudden, you let them go. All those grievances, all those unhappiness, all those that you have thought about that you feel very unhappy about, suddenly, during your meditation, they disappear. And you feel as if all these burdens on your shoulders were being laid down, away from you. Sometimes meditation will bring that effect. You experience liberation in your meditation. Twelve, the contemplation of impermanence. Then at the same time, this is absolutely important, at the same time, you realize nothing is permanent. You know why? Because your breath is impermanent. Every, every action in your body is impermanent. Every breath is changing. There's no breath in you that is not changing. Then you know that the changeability is the accepted fact in life. Everything changes. So you cannot make things unchanged. You can say, yesterday's happiness, I want to lock it in. Every day, every day I will feel happy. I want to lock in my happiness. Can you lock in your happiness? You say, I want to lock in my sadness. Can you lock in your sadness? 
because you know that everything is changing. So if you experience a failure in life, you say, I'm going to commit suicide. No, it's going to change. How do you want to change? So you walk your own life. The destiny is in your own hands. Do you want to change? I don't want to change. If you don't want to change, you're not liberated. Well, I don't allow changes. You have no right. You have no control. You have no power to allow unchangeability because everything is impermanent. Have you thought of one thing that is permanent that will not change? No. So if you fail, if you are unhappy, don't give up because tomorrow is another day. So if you are going stormy weather now, who knows, tomorrow will be sunny. So what exactly benefit us by knowing impermanence? People say, in this life, then I should know impermanent, then I won't feel unhappy. I keep on making my money, getting my reputation, make more money, off your way, make more money. It's changeability anyway. Yes, I make more money. But have you ever considered the impermanence of your own life? The Buddha has. The Buddha said nothing is impermanent. I mean, nothing is permanent. Everything is impermanent. That's why we are rotating in reincarnation our lives. Can we, can we go beyond changeability? Can we go beyond zamzara of rebirth and life and death? Sakyamuni Buddha venture into that spiritual level where you are beyond changeability. Because impermanence always makes you unhappy. Changeability always makes you unhappy. Your marriage has changed. Your divorce. Something happened in the family. Everything changes. Makes you very, very unhappy. Do you want to go through the same rebirth in life and go through the same kind of unhappiness? The Buddha said, there's a way to get out. Deliberate yourself completely from it. Get out from life and death. Get out from samsara. But you've got to practice it to get out, not just talking about it. So knowing impermanence is almost like a first step to get to spirituality, the first step to get to enlightenment. But that first step is the most important step. Lao Ji, one of our philosophers, says, Millions of miles begin with the first step. Let's finish the 16th so I don't have to talk about it next time. All right. The contemplation of this passion, not involved with the passion of greediness, hatred, ignorance. When you, in, in following, when you realize following, you, you know that you don't want to, in, to be involved with greediness, hatred, and ignorance because, they know, because you know that those are not for enlightenment. Those are afflictions that pull you down. So you want to get away from them. You, you want to get rid of them. 14, the contemplation of abandonment of desire. All your desires for sensuous pleasures are gone. Some people say, should Buddhists have desire? There are many kinds of desires. The desires for sensuous pleasures, the desires for purity. Desire is a target, something that you want, an expectation, a target, an objective in life. A Buddhist must have a desire, but not the kind of desire that sensuous people have. Not the desire for wealth, reputation, desire for getting as much as you want at the expense of others. You want a desire to get out from suffering. You desire to get out from samsara. You still have desire, but the desire for purity of life, not the desire to hurt others, the desire to make more money, to make more wealth, to satisfy your sensuous pleasures, not that, that kind of desires will pull you down. Karmic desires will pull you down. But this desire is a spiritual, inconceivable, enlightenment desire. You've got to have desire. The desire to be better. All right? So 15, the contemplation of cessation. 
contemplation of nirvana. You always go to nirvana. You want, you want, to, you want to go beyond samsara. What is nirvana? Near is no, nothing. Vana is moving all the time. Our mind is moving all the time. That got us into trouble. So nirvana is to go to a state where there's inactivity, a state where no more of this desultory thought, no more of this desire for sensuous pleasures, no more of this mental afflictions. So nirvana. 16, the contemplation of renunciation. Renouncing neither perception nor non-perception. That's the highest level of the world. Because we have three worlds. The karmic, karma datu, world of desire, rupa datu, world with form, or rupa datu, world without form and desires. And that's the highest level of the samsaro, samsaric world, world. So that's the highest level. But contemplation of renunciation, at this stage, if you, if you successfully complete this stage, you don't want to get back into the karmic world anymore. You wanted to go, you wanted to follow the enlightenment path all your life. Many people who arrive at this point, they would become a monk or a nun or a hermit or, or um, I don't know, uh, an ascetic but not the ascetic in such a way that only emphasizes the hardship. The ascetic is go away of life that is aiming at purity. So renunciation of worldly pleasures. Um, those are the 16 realizations. So if you graduated from the school of following, you will arrive at the 16. So some people say, where do I get from here? I'm at this meditative level, where do I from here? This is a checklist. Have you got this? If you have got this, you are successfully completing the course of following. Then what do you go? You go to the next step, which is stabilization, which we'll be talking about next time. So meditation is actually in two parts, uh, the concentration and the contemplation. So when we talk about meditation, it's not just sitting there peacefully and relax the body, not just that. Meditation is in two major portions. Um, now, the meditation that we are uh, practicing is in accordance with the Buddhist teaching on Anapanasati, which is the in and out breath meditation. So we have to identify that because there's so many other methods of meditation, some yogic meditation, transcendental meditation, all kinds of meditation. They, they attach terms and names to the meditation. But Anapanasati, in and out breath meditation is what the Buddha 2,600 years ago introduced to us. This is what, where we are concentrating in. If we use the Sanskrit language, the original classical Indian language as spoken by the Buddha, it's samatha and vipassana. Samatha and vipassana. And we use concentration to translate samatha, but um, it, that's not really the right term for it. But you see, it's sometimes it's difficult to find the most appropriate translation for, to represent the meaning of, some, of the Sanskrit language, of some words, so we use concentration. Actually, um, the concentration, samatha is to relax the body and calm down the mind to a level where you attain uh, samadhi. Relax the body, calm the mind to a level that you arrive at samadhi. That's samatha. We just use the word concentration. Uh, 
it's not just to focus, to concentrate, you know, to, to focus at a point. It's not just that, you know. So keep in mind, that's the proper translation. And contemplation, uh, this English word contemplation is the mind thinking about something, pondering about something, or something with ruminating about something. But actually contemplation is, when we use the word, English word contemplation, it seems to be you are watching outside and then you contemplate something outside. But actually, this kind of contemplation, the Sanskrit word vipassana, is introspection. You contemplate the inside of your mind, not to outside, not going outside. But for the sake of understanding, we use contemplation. So that's what we're using. Now, in concentration, as is indicated here, we use three methods to do it counting, following, and stabilization. That's on relaxation and calming. And then, once you achieve these, then you go to, an, to a, a higher level in which you introspect. Then you go to introspection and turning. And we've been talking on counting and following uh, for a number of hours already, uh, following the breath. We already talked about that in detail. I mean, counting the breath. And if, if the counting procedure is well done, you are successful in finishing the counting training is successful, it's well done after a while. How long? It varies from, pe from person to person. It could be one year, could be half a year, could be 10 years, 20 years, could be a lifetime long and you haven't arrived at successfully completing counting. So we can attach a time to it. And then if your counting is successfully, is well done, which we already have talked in detail for two or three hours already, then you go to following. Then you go to following the breath, not just counting, follow the breath. And in following the breath, how do we know that we are successfully finish the training, a self-training of following the breath, there are 16 superior phenomena of practicing following. These are the criteria you use to judge, have I been successful in following the 16 uh, superior phenomena of practicing following? And we already have gone through that for a couple of hours already, so we're not going to go through it again. And then in following, after you cultivate the following, then every one of these items, when we talk about them, every one of these, we use two perspectives to talk about it. One is the cultivation of it, or cultivation of counting. The other one is the realization of counting. Then we talk about the cultivation of following, then the realization of following. The cultivation is the method of doing it. The realization, what's the effect after you have done it? So, um, last time we have uh, arrived, uh, we've finished the cultivation of following. Now let's get to the realization of following. When the practitioner becomes aware of the breath as now long, as now short, as now permeating the body, and now going out, the mind and the breath are in a state of mutual independence. They're related. In normal life, we don't realize our breath. We just take the breath granted. It's a spontaneous action. But then, when you follow it well, the mind actually know, actually know, now the breath comes in, now the breath goes out, now the breath is long, the breath is short. In other words, it becomes mutually independent. The mind and the breath has become fine, subtle, peaceful, and still, equanimity, quiescence. In other words, you follow it so well that the breath and the mind, they are one. They're not different. Now the breath and the mind are, are different. They're not, they're not mutually independent. Only in mutually independent when you say, I'm going to realize my breath now. Yes, my mind is now concentrating on the breath. For that particular moment, 
that you want to concentrate, then you have a mutual independence. Otherwise, you don't have a mutual independence. But now, it's spontaneous, automatic, mutual independence. Next, the petitioner becomes aware that following is a course activity. When you come to a point when the breath in a state of, the mind and the breath in a state of mutual independence, then you come to a peacefulness. That's what we call samadhi. Samadhi. Samadhi has different level. So you, you are at a lower level of samadhi, but there's still a samadhi. There's sometimes we call it an absorption, meditative absorption in the samadhi, in a equanimity. Now, when you become aware of that equanimity, then the practitioner would think in his mind, following is still an attachment. I am attaching to following. I don't want to attach to anything. I'm free. Attachment is a course activity. Why should I attach to following? Then the mind becomes adverse to it and, and work to relinquish it. I don't want any attachment. First of all, I don't want to attach to fame, reputation, greediness, hatred, jealousy. I don't want to attach to this. Not to, and now, I don't even want to attach to following. I'm free, I'm liberated. So following becomes a course activity. You don't want to attach even to that. At this time, he should relinquish following and cultivate stabilization. Then you're going to the next level, which is stabilization, which is the last procedure in, in what? In concentration. Okay, now let's get to the next one. How do we come to stabilization? While counting on following with single-pointedness, the practitioner becomes aware of the body and mind seeming to vanish entirely, entering into meditative absorption. So when you're successfully doing following, successfully completed following and counting, then your mind becomes what? The whole body is relaxed, and your mind becomes very, very calm, relaxed and calm, and then you come to an equanimity, peacefulness, and you don't even feel you exist. The body and mind seem to vanish. I don't have a body, I don't have a mind. You feel that way, entering into meditative absorption. Then you know that you have successfully completed counting and successfully completed following. Now you are going into stabilization. He gains realization of an empty and still absorption through which he becomes aware of the body and mind as quiescent, secure, blissful. Your mind becomes quiescent in complete standstill and peacefulness and quietude, solitude. The solitude is so blissful, so secure that you never tasted it before, like you never have before. We can't even describe it. It's some sort of blissfulness, some sort of security, some sort of quiescence that in your whole life before you haven't felt that way. And you wouldn't give it up for millions of dollars because you can't, you can't buy it for any money. It just come to you in a very relaxed, calming way. I don't know how to describe it. So, Nothing whatsoever is taken as an objective condition or is bore in mind. Nothing is important to you anymore. Not your, not your money, not your relationship, not all those that you're attached to, not your addiction, not your alcoholic attitude, not your temperament. Nothing in your mind, all those vanishes, nothing bother you anymore. Imagine if nothing bother your mind anymore, not a tinkling of mental affliction bother your mind anymore, how do you feel? You haven't felt that before because your mind has always been bothered by something. You may not even notice it. So as it is so controlled that it becomes focused and stillness, bringing all recollection, rumination, and expectation to a halt. Every, everything comes to a, to a standstill. What is recollection? Your past. 
the agonies of the past, the happiness of the past, you don't attach to them anymore. No recollection, rumination of the present. At the present, you are, you, you, you're, you're free of all attachment. Expectation of the future. You don't worry about it. You don't have anxiety for the future anymore. Worry is about the past. Anxiety is about the future. So the past, the present, and the future all comes to a standstill. No time concepts. No space concept. We are confined. An individual is confined by time and space, both physically and mentally. Now all these boundaries, all these perimeters are all gone. Bang! Nothing exists. No more burden. It seems as if you have been burdening your shoulders with billions of pounds of weight. Now all this burden is gone. How do you feel? This is samadhi. This is samadhi, meditative absorption. You can arrive. Everybody can arrive at that point. It's in you. You just don't know how to get it. It's just that all this oil in Alberta, you have to tap into it. You have to drill it. It's got to be there, but you don't know how to do it. You got to all go all over the place to drill it. The fact that you can't find any oil underground does not mean that the oil doesn't exist. It exists there. It belongs to you. You just don't know how to get it. You possess that. You possess that nature. You possess that Buddha nature. You possess that enlightenment. You possess that Anutra Samya Sambuddhi, the Tathagata, the Suchness, the Buddha in you, the Buddhahood in you. You got that in you. It's just been covered up by ignorance, greediness, hatred, and all mental afflictions. And with all these karmic mental afflictions, we have been reincarnating into some zero of life and death for millions of years. Poor, we are poor. We are poor individuals. We are all victims of samsara. The Buddha are weakened already, and he told us, "You can do it too. It's just you don't. You're not guided. You're always in attachment of karmic. You know all kinds of karmic attachments. You know. You know what kind of attachment you have." The karmic energy that you've been building up. So this is samadhi. But he gradually feels that it is devoid of any skillful means related with wisdom. Then, because you have successfully doing, doing, um, following, then you say, following. How is it related to the truth of the universe? How is it related to my existence? How is it related to everybody's existence? How is it related to wisdom? Previously, when we are doing following, counting, following, and and、um, civilizations, is all related to to what concentration. Now you 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 go into a higher level of thinking about wisdom. Then you're going into what contemplation, introspection, because you have successfully going into. You finished the stabilization already. We finish with samadhi. We finish with the concentration. In other words, we successfully have, through meditation, successfully have arrived at a relaxed body, calm, calm mind, equanimity, quiescence, security, blissfulness. We success in doing that. Then we get into a higher level, which is the vipassana, which is getting the truth of the universe. The truth about yourself, the truth about existence, the truth about how come everybody appears that way? What am I? What's my position in the universe? Why can I get out from all these? So so much to venture into. That if you're at that point, you don't want to give up. At that point, you're not interested in fame and reputation anymore. You are not interested in money anymore. You are not、really、interested in relationship anymore. You are only interested in pursue of spiritual wisdom, which would elevate you for elimination, for liberation, 
a free, totally free liberation from samsara. Okay. Now the practitioner's mind is immersed in absorption. This absorption is the same as samadhi. In samadhi, he begins to introspect his fine and subtle in and out breath as a wind in the midst of space. It's still the breath. The, the breath is still there. So as I said, breath is the basic. If you haven't practiced and successfully well done in your breath, you lost the basic. You still feel the breath. But the breath is not more, it's not breath anymore. It seems to be some wind in the universe, in the middle of space. In, in the middle of space, it seems to be just, I have, I have no body. I have just a feeling of a wind in space. I'm not me. He also begins to introspect all the 36 categories of his own body are devoid of substantiality. Even his own consciousness is impermanent. Neither oneself nor anybody exists. So in other words, he could actually see, because it's an internal introspection, he could, he, he could actually see, for some people, all the organs inside his body. He sees his own bone, flesh, skin, heart, kidney. He actually sees them in the body. And you know that these are devoid of substantiality. These are insubstantial. It used to be, this is my body, this is my heart, this is my lung, this is my spleen, this is my bone, this is, this is everything about me. I have an existence. This is me, this is I. This is what I protect. But in that case, it's not substantial anymore. It's what? It's sunyata. It's sunyata and anicca. Sunyata is emptiness. Anicca, impermanent. Even his own consciousness is impermanent. There's no, there's nothing. It's sunyata. You understand what I mean? Of course we don't understand. You know why? Because we haven't arrived at that point. We only understand from what the Buddha told us. This is what the Buddha told us. How could we understand? We're not there yet. If you haven't been to Victoria, it does not matter how I, t I describe Victoria to you. You can only understand in words. In my description, you, don't, you, you haven't really truly understood Victoria unless you step on shore. This is the parliament building, or this is the shoreline, this are the buildings. You actually have arrived there to understand. But it does not mean that you don't need any knowledge about Victoria. We got this knowledge from the Buddhists talking about it, but we haven't been there yet. But the Buddha said, you will be there if you're doing all this. Do you want to be there? Most people say, I don't know. They just keep on going, reincarnation and reincarnation. Life and death, life and death, and life and death. Suffering, sickness, as I said, what is usually a normal person's time dimensions? The past, the present and the future. What is the past? We think of yesterday is the past? One year ago, two years ago, three years ago? The most recent past is at birth. The remote past is many lifetimes ago. Yesterday is not past enough. Ten years ago is not past enough. At birth, when you were, in the, when you were a baby, is that past enough? We consider it as, as, as a recent past. Your past at birth. What is your future? What is your future? Your recent future. You, everybody has that recent future. Death. That's your recent future, right? What is in between? What is in between? You know. What is in between? For sure. Aging. Right? Right? Can you refute that? No, I'm not aging. I'm, I'm, I'm always going to, uh, you know, I don't know how you call it. Um, exercise myself, keeping myself young and... Uh, Facelift, and uh, what else? Cosmetics, 
ointment, perfume, does not matter. You're always aging. We're always aging. So, now you are in, in, in introspection and you think about life, not just concentration anymore. You successfully complete concentration. Now you think about the Buddha realized Anuttva Samya Sambuddhi and he got out, he was liberated from life and death. He's not going into another round of reincarnation. I don't want to go into another round of life and death. I know if I go through another life and death, I'll be suffering as if I'm suffering now. We base our talk on Tian Tai, uh, the six gates to um, Samatha and Vipassana. So let's continue. We've been talking for many, many hours already. So uh, we have to take it up from last time. So meditation, um, in and out breath meditation, is broken down into concentration and contemplation. Samatha in Sanskrit language and Bhubhizana and we've been talking on counting, following and stabilization uh, and then um, we touch a little bit on introspection um, now we haven't of course touched on turning and purification so these are the six gates to Samatha and Vipassana and uh, we've talked maybe for more than 10 hours already so Let's continue with introspection. But before we get into introspection, we need to know a little bit about stabilization that we stopped at last time. So while counting or following with single pointedness, the practitioner becomes aware of the body and the mind seeming to vanish entirely, entering into a meditative absorption. Uh, we talk about that, but just to get a point of Continue, continuity, so we have to get through stabilization. Okay. When so you are I, so good in counting and you are so good in following, that is all, those are all well done with single pointedness, then you slowly, your body and mind seeming to vanish, uh, vanish entirely, then you enter into, into what? Samadhi. You enter into Samadhi. Then he gains realization of an empty and still absorption through which he becomes aware of the body and mind as quiescent, jing jing, secure, on one, and blissful. And that's almost like equivalent to equanimity. This is what you arrive at. And when you are at this stage of stabilization, then you know that that's not enough for you. You have to look for wisdom. You have to look for prajna. So samatha uh, is not enough. Samadhi is not enough. You want to look for prajna. Now the practitioner's mind is immersed in preliminary samadhi. He continues to introspect his fine and subtle in and out breath as a wind in the midst of space. He also begins to introspect that all the 36 categories of his own body are devoid of substantiality. In other words, he introspects the internal organs, the 36 categories of his, of his own body, and he suddenly knows that everything about his body are insubstantial. We attach to body. We're attached to beauty, we're attached to desires, we're, we're attached to sexual desire, pleasure, desires for pleasure. But at this stage, you were so much in introspection that your mind's eyes are open and you suddenly see, as if you, your eyes are X-rated, see the internal organs of your body. You, you can see inside your body the 36 categories of your own body. And one of these six, 36 categories, these 36 categories are 
your hair, your liver, your pus, your body, the hair, bladder, blood, nails, spleen, sweat, teeth, lungs, bladder, skin, small intestine, tears, flesh, large intestine, synovia, veins, stomach, spit, bone structure, feces, mucus, liquid in bone, brain, marrow, kidney, gallbladder, urine, heart, phlegm, pink phlegm and white phlegm and diaphragm. So these are the 36 parts of your body. Uh, all of a sudden, your mind's eyes are open and you know your body is made up of nothing but these organic organisms inside your body. Why are you attached to sexual desires? Why are you attached to your own body and the body of others? All of, all of a sudden, you are actually introspecting using a super smriti, which is contemplation of impurity. Your, our bodies are impure. But people who are attached to, to pleasures, to sensual pleasures, are attached to bodies. Actually, they are attached to a whole bunch of organics, a whole bunch of these organs. But when they're attached to it, they can't let go of it. They always have to attach to these desires. But when you examine this kind of desires, it's nothing but attachment to a whole bunch of hair, body the hair, nails, teeth, lungs, and whatnot. So all of a sudden, your desire, your lust, disappears. That you have carried the lust for many, many lives, through many, many reincarnations. And that's, that's the what? That's one of the main causes for our reincarnation. We're attached to it. We're attached to bodies. We're attached to the impurities of the body. Then you know that these 36 categories are insubstantial. Before, you attach to these insubstantial organs. But now, you don't attach to them anymore. You know that those are impure. And this is, this, this is just a matter of fact, impurity. Imagine, as I said before, as we all know, we're given birth at birth, so our past is birth, and our future we know that is death, birth and death. We're not being pessimistic. Birth and death is a facts, right? So our, our past is at birth, our future is death, and what is in between is aging, but during this time, we're always attached to desires. Now, all of a sudden, that desire vanishes. And you feel so happy in your meditation. You, so, you feel that the burdens on you, the attachment in you, all of a sudden vanishes in the air. No more. You're, not, you're no more attached to relationship. You're no more to attached to relationship between male and female. It's all gone. And they're so insubstantial that you know that is sunyata, empty, hongla. And and anicca. Even uh, our our consciousness is impermanent. Not just the thirty six categories of the, our own body. Neither oneself nor anyone exists. We're all devoid of substantiality that you realize in your meditation. Now when we examine introspection, we're examining it in two parts. The cultivation of it and the realization of it. The cost of it and the effect of it. Cultivation are the causes and realization is the effect. This is the cultivation of it. You still you're still using your in and out breath. You never leave your in and out breath. So the basic in meditation is in and out breath. If you haven't really mastered it to the best you can, you haven't really got it. So that's, that's the basic. It can be very fine, it can be very subtle, it can be very coarse, and it could be wandering that you lose it. So, 
counting, following, and stabilization. They are basics to introspection. And then we continue to cultivate introspection. The body, feelings, mind, and dharmas are all insubstantial, devoid of inherent existence. Thus, a question comes up in the practitioner's mind. Now I am unable to apprehend the existence of any personal dharma. That is to say, if everything has no inherent existence, then what could my meditation absorption depend on or related to? He begins to introspect through vipassana, uh, contemplate wisdom. So he gets into vipassana. So he's thinking, if everything is devoid of existence, uh, devoid of inherent existence, nothing exists, then if there's no existence, how about my meditation? How does my meditation depend on? Where is my meditation? Do I have a meditation? So all of, a, all of a sudden, you question yourself. You question, am I doing the right thing? What is my meditation? Is my meditation devoid of substantiality too? Where does my meditation exist? Does my meditation have a self-nature? If everything is devoid of inherent existence, where am I going? So, this is how you will feel in your cultivation. But you are still cultivating it. You are still using your in and out breath. You still feel that your in and out breath is subtle and fine. Next, the realization of introspection. Now the practitioner becomes more aware of the following. Just to summarize it, the breath entering in exiting from and pervading through all the hair pores of the body. The air gets in and out not just through the nose. It's through every body, body pore, every pore of your, of your fo the follicle, the hair follicle. Oh. So it, 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 it pervades through every pore of the body, not just through the nostrils. At that time, when you have stabilization, when you're getting into introspection, the mind clearly visualizes the 36 categories composing the body and all of the organisms therein. In other words, not only do you see the organs, but also the microorganism inside the organs. You see the bacteria too. Your, your mind's eyes also see the bacteria in the organs. Isn't that inconceivable? When you're at that point, the inward and outward impurities of the body and the changes occurring. You're aware of the inward and outward impurities. The inward impurities being the organs are impure. You think your organs are pure? Your lungs, your stomach, your intestines? If you're a surgeon, you know, when you, when you do your operation, when you're learning it, you know that these, the feces are inside the intestines or the food inside your stomach. The food smells, the food smell excellent, delicious when it's outside. But once it passed through your throat, and if you vomit it out, nobody would eat it anymore. It becomes feces. So it, it, it's, uh, it seems to be so uh, contrasting. Outside, when it's outside, it smells delicious. When it's eating inside, it becomes so dirty that you don't want, you don't want to even smell it. So why are we attached to all this food, all this delicacies? But we are used to attaching to food. And outward impurities, you think the impurity is only inside the organs? If you have an x-ray, you can see all kinds of bacteria surrounding us. I have been told by a doctor, um, I said, the doctor told me that the hospital is an unclean place. You think the hospital is clean? There's bacteria all over the place. You go to a clinic, 
make sure that you wear your, your mask, your, what do you call this, you know, because bacteria are flying around. And uh, you, could, you, you could anytime contract some bacteria if you're not careful. I have a friend who got lung pneumonia because he's contracting Legionera. And that friend is myself. <laughs> yeah. Okay, the mind becomes sometimes saddened and sometimes delighted. You, know, you think that if meditation is all delighted? All happy? All rapture? No. There's a dark side of meditation. You really have to go through a lot in meditation. So in other words, meditation is just like you are this mountain, you get to the very top of the mountain. You have the rapture. But before you go into a higher mountain, what do you do? You can't just fly there. You have to go down to the valley to get up to another higher mountain. So that means meditation, if somebody told you meditation is all happiness, all rapture of joy, he hasn't got there yet. That is meditation sickness that one has to go through. But if you can walk through, if you can walk through all these valleys and get up again, you become a saint. So that means the Buddha has gone through a lot of difficulties, a lot of hardship, a lot of burden in his meditation. All meditators would tell you, especially with this season, experienced meditator would tell you, meditation is not easy. It's not only associated with rapture of joy, it could be associated with physical pain, emotional suffering. You know why? Meditation, if you get into deeper and deeper and deeper, become more experienced in it, it's just like you open up your immeasurable bin of karmic garbage. You're cleaning garbages that have been accumulated from many, many lifetimes ago. Your jealousy, your hatred, your greediness, your ignorance, your violence, emotions and all that, everybody is carrying an immeasurable bin of karmic garbage in us. Everybody has. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. We're carrying that. And meditation, if you get into higher and deeper and deeper, you are opening that door and try to clean it out. When you open that door, it overwhelms you. All of a sudden, your, de your depression getting more serious. But you're, if you're able to overcome it, take it for granted, slowly resolve it, you overcome it. So sometimes I think meditation is testing your limit. Every time, okay, when you're meditating, all this old garbage comes back for you to clean up. You clean it up, your, limitation is, your, your limit is here. The next time it comes up with a higher limit. So you have to overcome all kinds of limits. In other words, you have to go down to the valley to get to another higher mountain. So there's no free lunch in meditation. But we have. <laughs> Enjoy your free lunch. Not yet a time. There's no free lunch in meditation. You have to go through physical, emotional suffering in order to get higher. In life, we are always trying to, to get higher and higher than our limit. You can, get, you can get higher and higher in your limit. Don't limit yourself. Set the limit higher, overcome it, set the limit higher and overcome it. That happens in meditation if you want to go from one level to another higher level. The mind becomes sometimes saddened and sometimes delighted. It doesn't mean that it's always suffering. Remember, the mind basically is in three parts, and some people say two parts. Um, the emotional mind, which is chitta, 
and the rational, more or less rational mind, which is the manos, or the thinking mind. But actually, that is the egoistic mind and also the alaya consciousness mind. So, unfortunately, our chitta is always in control. Our emotional mind seems to be always in control of us. That's the reason why we get angry, we get emotional, we get depression, we get hatred, greediness. But if you go through this spiritual transformation, meditation, you're actually trying to overcome all these. You're trying to put your chitta, you put your emotion. Okay, so then one becomes more subtle in contemplating the body as impure, the feelings as suffering, feelings as suffering, the mind as impermanent, and the dharmas as non-self. These are the four foundations of introspection. So in other words, you're actually going into introspection of the four foundations. Introspection of the body, the feelings, the mind and dharmas. Without you saying, I'm getting to Satipatthana, I'm getting to the four foundations of, of, of mindfulness. You don't have to announce it. When you're doing introspection, you automatically, simultaneously venture into Satipatthana's. And for those who missed out all the other lectures, you can always get to YouTube. You just type in Reverend Guan Chung at BuddhistTemple.ca, or just route, or just no. You just if you get onto YouTube, just type in Reverend Guan Chung, then all these previous lectures will show up: the Four Noble Truth, the Eightfold Path, and many many other lectures, Q and A, and all that. So. So we are very mindful of how we're going to produce all these uh, lectures on YouTube. Meditation, we say in and out breath, Anapanasati, and meditation is in two parts. Concentration or focus, or in the Sanskrit language it's um, samatha, and contemplation. Uh, Contemplation is actually not the best translation for it. It should be introspection. But I'm using contemplation just to, uh, as a common name so that people can understand. Introspection is it's within. So it's, it's a contemplation within. And the Sanskrit is vipassana. In concentration, we talk about counting, we talk about following, and we talk about stabilization. We, we, we use more than 20 hours to talk about concentration. So remember, meditation is in two parts. Relatively easier part is concentration because it's just, because our minds have been like a monkey mind going all over the place, wandering all over direction. Now you want to, to put it, to focus your mind uh, in quietude, to focus your mind so that you can conjure up all this energy so that you can do a better introspection. Because if your mind is not is desultory, if your mind is all over the place involving an unwholesome thinking, what are unwholesome thinking? Anger, hatred, lust, greediness, suspicion, skeptical doubt, which the psychologist said sub-skeptical doubt is cognitive dissonance. We always have cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance is the emotional mind and the rational mind, they're always going against each other. You're emotionally involved with a lot of things and your rational mind is always trying to, trying to, to correct it, but then somehow in many situations, in most situations, your emotional mind seems to be dominating. Emotions of greediness, hatred, jealousy, um, anxiety, worry, depression, um, all these. So the Buddha said, we have to correct all this. We have to radiate wholesome energy. We, we want to correct all our, we want to put our mind in the right path. So 
But putting your mind in the right path, first of all, you can't go in all directions. You have to concentrate. So counting, following, and stabilization. Now we are involved with introspection. In the, in the last session, we also talked something about introspection. Introspection is when your mind is at equanimity, in a in a still in a still still state, in a state of peacefulness, in a state of more or less uh, calm and peaceful uh, tran tranquility of it. Then you start to think. Then you start to. Build up wisdom. You're looking for wisdom now. You're not just looking for up the power to concentrate. You're looking for wisdom, and that is automatic, simultaneously. You're looking for wisdom, and now there's introspection. We need to put more time into it because concentration is easy. Contemplation or introspection is not easy. It's, it, it's a little higher level because you're you're going into the wisdom level, and in order to to understand properly what is introspection, uh, then we have to understand how our mind works. In, in briefly, we have to understand how our mind works. So right now. I want to get back to introspection, but I want to I want to talk about it in more details. I don't want to just rush through introspection and say turning and purification. Um, we better take a slow, careful, and enlightening approach to introspection. So let's take a look at introspection again. How do we cultivate introspection? We did a little bit of cultivation last time, but broad, general concepts. Now we want to go a little deeper concept into the cultivation of introspection. How does our mind work? Our mind always thinks, and as a re and subsequently perform through thoughts, speeches, and actions. Thought, you know, every thought that we have, speech is what we utter from the mouth, and action is how do we behave from the body. So thinking or thought will lead to will lead to what speeches, and will lead to behavior. Speeches and behaviors repeated, repeated, repeated all the time will becomes what becomes your habit. When your habit is repeated, repeated, repeated all the time, becomes what? Your personality. When your personality dominates you, that becomes your destiny. Don't blame your mom and dad. Don't blame the society. Blame your own thought. Blame your own action. Blame your own speeches, because that's nurture you to be what you are today. You're always greedy. You're always of lust. You're always. Want to satisfy sensual pleasures? You're not looking for enlightenment. You're not compassionate. If you're not compassionate, you you are um, you don't have loving kindness. You only care for yourself. You're selfish. You're egoistic. Then that's the kind of personality that you have, and that personality will what will lead you to suffering. Will lead you to karmic energy to to live to samsara. We call it. So the mind thinks. In terms of thoughts, and thoughts would induce you to speak vile, foul languages, cursing, lying, slandering is from the mouth, and thought also induces you, your body to act becomes your behavior. So I put also introspect to introspect on the top. Introspect involves wise thinking. Wise speeches, the right thinking, the right speech, and the right behavior. So, how does the mind think? Very briefly. All dharmas of the past, present, and future. What does dharma means? We want to re uh, retain that Sanskrit word dharma. Dharma includes everything. Whatever you see, whatever you feel, you touch, everything. Physical, non metaphysical, everything we use in the Buddhist uh, terminology. Use the word dharma uh, 
一切法 dharmas, dharmas not only of the present, of the past, of the present and the future. You ruminate on on the present. You worry about your past. Your past, and you have anxiety for the future. That's how we're doing. And usually, when we think, how do we think? Our senses, our eyes, our ears, our nose, our tongue, our body, our manos, are interacting with physical objects. I'm looking at you. You are physical objects. I'm looking at the light. You know, I'm I'm, I'm listening to sound. Matter sound is kind of is like kind of frequency frequency, so the mind look at interact with senses with objects of attention, and then the mind only even if you are not here, see if, if you're not here today, and oh John is not here today, but I'm you're not here, but I'm thinking about John that I saw yesterday. So that that was an impression in my mind, an image in my mind. You think also in terms of impression and images, not just physical objects, because you thought about your mom, your dad, your grandmom, your dad, granddad. You you thought about yesterday, the day before. All these are impressions and images. All these impressions and images are always accumulated in your mind, and all these impressions and images they are involved with what? Most of them involved with what? Emotions, emotions of lust. Anger, hatred, ignorance, skeptical doubt—you name them. Jealousy, depression—all these. We have images and impressions of all these, and also the mind is involved with concepts. When I say concepts, there are always some concepts in our mind: the concept of emptiness. The concepts of impermanence, many many concepts that we have learned, even concepts in mathematics, concepts in psychology, concepts in history, concept many kinds of concepts.、Um, we usually bring egoistic concepts in our rumination, in our thinking. We used to bring concepts of greediness. Concepts of self-protection、uh, into our mind.、Um, we seldom bring concepts of caring for the welfare of others. We're self-centered. We're personalizing everything. Concepts of personalization, self-centeredness approach. So many, many concepts. So we have to be careful with, with what kind of concepts we're always ruminating on, we're always pondering on. We're very careful. And when we are studying Buddhism, we are studying concepts too. When we're studying what the Buddha taught, we're always studying concepts. So introspection is about concepts. It's about past concepts. Introspection sometimes is involved with. Images, impressions too, in 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 what objects too, but usually it's the concepts that in our mind that we have to be very careful about. So what are these concepts? Usually we introspect in the wrong way, as our mind has been influenced by mental afflictions accumulated from our our past life, our past experiences, such as greediness, anger. Arrogance, self-views, suspicions, or skeptical doubt, and so on. Life is full of suffering. Why is life full of suffering? Because we have these mental afflictions that drive us to do speeches and actions that are not beneficial, that are not considering the welfare of others. You always, we're always like self-centered. We're always involved in. For example, in、um, killing, lying, intoxications, sexual misconduct, drinking, etc., etc. So these bring suffering. You think you have done all these bad deeds and nobody know about it? No, causality will find the effects coming out when you have cultivated these causes. 
bad causes, bad effects will come out. Good causes, good effects will come out. So life is full of suffering. What are these sufferings that we've been talking about? Being born is suffering. You have no choice. Do you have a choice? When, you, when you're given birth to you, do you have a choice? If, if you have a choice, you would choose to be born in a very rich family. If you have a choice, you would be like to be born to be a handsome, a beautiful, healthy, right? You don't have a choice. Why don't you have a choice? Because where you're going is dominated by what you have done in your previous life. If you're always killing, then in this life, you have chosen a body that is suffering from bad health. If you are selfish in teaching others, maybe in this body, you're suffering from not intelligent, being not, not intelligent enough. So life is, it's being born is suffering, aging is suffering. I've, I'm gradually feeling, feeling it. I'm aging. Aging is suffering. When you pass 50, there, 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 there's so many sickness, diseases will come up that you don't realize. When you pass 60, more, 70, more, 80, more, 90. And after 90, you don't have to worry about it anymore. <laughs> it's ocean view. You're under the, the, under the ground, eight feet under the ground. You don't have to worry about it. So, being born is suffering, aging is suffering. Young guys, they don't worry about aging. I'm only 20 years old, I'm only 18, 13, 14. Why do I have to worry about aging? I'm not aging, but yeah, you're not aging, but are you worrying about death? So death is suffering too. You think a young guy is not gonna die is for sure guaranteed 100 years old? We have seen a lot of young guys die in accidents, in sicknesses too. So not only old guys die, you know, young guys also die. So death is suffering. And um, sickness is, of, is of, of course suffering. Departure from beloved ones is suffering. Your mom passed away, your dad, your grandmom, your wife, your husband. Departure from beloved ones. You cry, you grieve, you're grief-stricken for a year. You can't get away with the, with, with the memories. And you're not happy. So, departure with beloved ones. Uh, and displeasures in living with hated ones. Have you, have, you, have you had that kind of suffering before? You were in a family that you're not, that all these family members are not friendly to each other. The wife hates the husband, the husband hates the wife. The children are unhappy and they finally get a divorce. And fighting, crying, emotions. So, displeasures, discomfort, unhappiness, living with hated ones or working with hated ones. Have you ever had experiences of working with colleagues that you hate? You don't like the politics. You hate everybody. Everybody hates you. Do you have that experience too? There's an agony working in an organization that you don't like the politics. So that's suffering too. And suffering from your misunderstanding of the five scantures, misunderstanding of the world, misunderstanding of your relationship with the world, misunderstanding of how, when, why, you live this life and, and your misunderstanding in personalization of everything, selfishness, egoistic behavior. All these are suffering. Who gave you this suffering? God gave you this suffering? No. You. You give rise to this suffering yourself. What are these? Suffering arises because of our craving. You greet it, you crave, you attach. And it is craving which leads to renewed existence, reincarnation. Your craving, that's why you go through this samsara of birth and rebirth and birth and rebirth, because when you crave, when you 
then when you speak, when you think, when you act, all induces karmic energy, and this karmic energy would carry you going into life and death all the time, life and death all the time. So one of this craving, craving what? One of this craving, craving for, craving for sensual pleasures, we always crave for sensual pleasures. I want my eyes to, to like things. That's why I'm, I get into YouTube and I like to see things that, that stimulate my, pleasure, my, my, my senses. You know what? What is, on, what, what is on the mass media that stimulate your senses? One of those, I should say, I, I should, maybe I, should, I can say, maybe I should say, one of those harmful stimulus, stimuli that would stimulate our senses. Sex and violence wrongly drive you to induce your sensual pleasures, lust and greed. These are mental impur impurities. But you're always looking for these impurities. Maybe hidden under your mind, you know these are impure, but you can't help it. You always want to click on because you attach to it, you cling to it. You can help yourself. Lust and greed have been so dominating since life after life that you have to click on for the continuation of satisfaction of the lust and greed. And you know what happened when you continue with the lust and greed? You cultivate seeds in your alive consciousness, just like you key in your keyboard. In your memory, everything you see, it's not just you seeing it, it registers in your brain, in the memory. If there's so much killing that you see and register in your memory, you know what will come up? Your behavior will, be in, will, be, will, will have a tendency of killing, of, of hurting, of being harmful. There was something happened in the country that a guy who was always, who always wanted to see violence in the mass media, he went crazy. He killed six or seven, you know, uh, passengers in the subway and had about 12 or 13 because he was so involved with violence that he wanted to kill. He wanted to hurt. In other words, craving for sensual pleasures Lust and greed, and these are mental impurities, but we always look for them. We're attached to them. Craving for non-existent displeasures. You always have aversions to things you don't like. You hate people. You hate things you don't like. And that is, you're seeking for the non-existence of displeasure. This is displeasure. I, I don't want it to exist. I hate it. I'm aversive to it. So it's craving for non-existence of displeasures. You are craving for existence of pleasures. You are craving for non-existence of displeasures, which is just the opposite. Craving for continued existence. You don't think that everything is changing and impermanent. You always want to hang on things. This is mine. I want to hang on to it. The concept of, of impermanence is not in your mind. You always want to possess. I want to possess this. You take it away, I'm going to fight to retain it. Craving for possessions, you always personalize things. Personalization of subjective experiences. This is mine. A self-centered approach to everything. Self, ego. And these, all these are craving. I'm giving you just a summary of it. So what are we doing in here? We're talking about introspection. We're talking about thinking. What do we always do? We always think in the wrong way. We always perform in the wrong way. We always act in the wrong way. We always talk in the wrong way. We slander, we lie, foul languages. We're in with killing, fishing, Hunting, every day, everybody is, is eating meat, 
you are interacting, supporting human beings to, to kill uh, other beings for food. Is it right to, to take away the life of other beings just to satisfy your, your, your taste? You kill a cow for, for the steak, for the beef, and then you cook with it and you put seasoning onto it and you eat it. You taste the flesh and blood of an animal. But you know that that animal being slaughtered is really suffering from, from cruelty and suffering from, um, from pain too. Try to be a vegetarian. Don't involve in any killing. And you know how to kill the zeal for the fur? Very cruel. Some of these animals were being skinned li alive in order to supply you with, with the outfit that you are wearing in your parties, fur coat and all that. And some, one more. So we need to have the right introspection leading to nirvana. And uh, I have a lot more to say in about introspection. But I don't want to rush through it, but the last, we know that we are thinking in the wrong way in most cases. And the Buddha wanted us, implored us, wanted us to think in the right way. So the Buddha in his teaching brought forward a lot of concepts for us to think about, for us to ponder, for us to get wisdom from. So in introspection, you must know a few important concepts so that you know how to introspect. So you must know what is impermanence. You must know what is loving kindness. You must know what is karma. You must know what are the four foundations of introspection. You must know what the four seals of the Dharma. So there are so many concepts as expounded by the Buddha that we need to know in order to introspect. Because we always bring egoistic concepts in our introspection, which is not right. So in this session, in this particular topic of introspection, we can't just skip through it. We have to give you some very basic, important concepts so that you know that whenever you are thinking, all these concepts provide you a parameters, parameters for your thinking. If you don't have any parameters, any standard in your thinking, your thinking will go astray. Your thinking will be just lust, greediness, skeptical doubt, cognitive dissonance, emotions, self-centered, personal, personalization. So, in the next two or three sessions, we're going to explore some very important concepts, universal concepts, so that whenever we think, we know what is right and what is wrong. The Noble Eightfold Path, super, super normal Noble Eightfold Path, or the Righteous Path. So we need to know these concepts in order to in order to introspect within the parameters of these concepts, within the, the, um, the compass of it. When you, when you steer a boat, you need a compass to know which direction you go to. If you don't even know the direction, how do you introspect? If you don't even know the direction at night, for example, at night, then you're going to run into, into many obstructions. All right, so... Today, I just talk about wrong thinking. I haven't talked about the right introspection yet, but we need to know we have lust, we have craving, we have greediness that led us to suffering, and we want to, wait to get away from all these, to have the right introspection, the cultivation of introspection. And now we have learned the concentration part. I don't know if you have, but I spent 20 hours on, 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 on concentration. Always go back to your notes.
go back to. You have to reveal what, what should you do in concentration. I've gone through details in concentration. Now we slowly would get into introspection so that you know what is wrong and what is right. Not just concentration. Concentration is not involved with wisdom. It's just involved with, with your, your focus. But now you want, to, you want to elevate your concentration to a higher level, to that of prajna, wisdom, bodhi, anutra samya sambuddhi. You're going further and further and further, upper and upper. Meditation is, a, is, about, is a long way, but your, your, your path must be right. Your foot must be straight on the right path, not on the wrong path. So today, we continue with how to meditate and meditation in an out breath. So as you understand, in an out breath is the very basic foundation to it. We're still talking on in and out breath. So if you've been meditating for quite a while in here, and if you still ask, how do I meditate? I don't, where's, what's my focus? <laughs> then you're not at it. You're, you're object of, if you can want to, want to say focus or concentration, is the in and out breath. Why do we use the in and out breath? All these we are already have explained in detail. So we don't want to go back again. And then we say that meditation is basically in two parts, uh, zamata and vipassana. Uh, these are the Sanskrit words. And previously, I translated, or many people translated, samatha as concentration. But actually, concentration is not a good word for the translation of samatha. Um, it should be, because samatha is calming, relaxing, steadying, and focusing the mind, not just concentration. Because in concentration, if you do a, a hypnotic uh, you know, concentration or uh, that kind of concentration. You still can concentrate, but you could be under stress because you, you, you are instructed by the, uh, the hypnosis to concentrate. So concentration may not be completely steadying and calming. So it actually should be the mental pacification. So we use pacification for it. And uh, another section of it is vipassana. Vipassana is a Sanskrit word. Usually it is translated as contemplation, but then contemplation is not a, an extremely good word for, for the meaning of it. We use introspection. So introspection, introspect is to ruminate inside of you. Uh, not exposing your senses to the outside. You are you're actually introspecting inside, contemplating inside. So we've been talking on counting. As far as the pacification is concerned, pacification is concerned, is related to calming, relaxing, steadying, or stabilizing the mind. It is not yet with the intuitive, insightful uh, introspection yet. So in other words, the wisdom part of the meditation is in four, five, and six. And the relaxed, calming, and steadying is in one, two, and three. So we already have talked about one, two, and three in detail, very much detail. We spent about 20 hours on counting, following, and stabilization um, in detail. So if you've been meditating for quite a while, you already have the direction. You already have all the directions in your nooks, in your mind, actually. Don't look for any more. We usually, habitually, we're always looking for something. Imagine you have a lot of books, videos on your shelves already at home, but you're still looking. You always think that there's always some more that you haven't found, but you already have it. But 
you already have the treasures in you, and you, you're looking treasures apart, apart from you. The roses in the other gardens are always better than yours. People like always feel that way. The other wife is, is more considerate. The other wife is more, is better. <laughs> Some husbands think that way. So, don't look anymore. Specialize in what you know. Counting, following, and stabilization. If you haven't finished counting, don't go to following. If you haven't gone, gone, if you're not successful and well done in counting, you haven't done it yet. You haven't finished your, prime, your kindergarten. How can you go to pri primary, primary one? If you haven't gone through primary school, how can you go to secondary school? So make sure that you are well done in counting, well done in following, well done in stabilization. Then you go into intros introspection. And I already have touched, I already have spent about two hours on introspection. But introspection is something very important. I would like to deal with it again and again and again, maybe for quite a while until we all got bored by it. You shouldn't be. And then we go on to turning. All right? And these are the six gates to Samatha and Vipassana. In order to evaluate, to understand introspection, now concerning with the wisdom level now, we already have done with the Samatha. Now we are talking about the Vipassana, which is the introspection. Then we go back to how does the mind think? The mind thinks and then all these thoughts are being carried into action speeches. That's how the mind think. And, and the mind think about all dharmas. Here dharma does not mean just mean that the, the Buddhist teaching. Dharmas means all the thoughts in your mind, all the speech and all the actions. You always ruminate, you always think about actions, speeches, scenarios, history of the past, and about something about the future and something about the present. And all these, you have objects of your thinking. And these objects sometimes are physical objects or impressions and images in your mind, and, and sometimes con concepts, right concepts, wrong concepts. This is how our mind is doing. Do you realize this is how our mind is doing? But most often we think in the wrong way. As our mind has been influenced by mental afflictions accumulated from our past experiences, our present life, our, our, our past, many, many past lives, reincarnations, all these mental afflictions are greediness, anger, arrogance, skeptical doubts, self views, perverted views, anxiety, worry, fear, hatred, jealousy, and so on. And the Buddha told us, life is full of suffering. You can take a very optimistic approach to suffering. Don't say that, oh, how come you're always negative? Life is suffering. Life is suffering as a fact. But we can take an optimistic, positive approach to it. That is your approach, but that's not a factual understanding. And why is life for suffering? Suffering arises because of our craving. Suffering, dukkha, craving, tangha. So suffering arises because of our craving. We always crave for more. We crave for fame. We crave for reputation, money, luxuries, praise. You don't like Brain, you like praise. You don't like impermanence. You like permanence. Um, you don't like displeasures. You like pleasures. All that. Okay, all this craving, it is craving which leads to our renewed existence. We crave. Because of our craving, a thought of craving in our mind, habitually we carry that thought into action or speeches, and action and speeches and thoughts all created karmic energy. This karmic energy is, is responsible for our reincarnation, not God, not deities. You yourself de determined where you go. You're the master of your own destiny. But 
you have been thinking and acting desultorily, um, involving a lot of karma, involving a lot of bad karma, good karma, neutral karma, and with that karma, you roll into another existence. It's because of craving. But who can control craving? The Buddha said, the one who can control craving, stop craving, is walking towards nirvana, enlightenment, liberation. Craving, well, what kind of craving we have? Craving for sensual pleasures, lust and greed. All these are actually mental impurities. Craving for non-existence of these pleasures. You hate these pleasures. You like pleasures. You have aversion and hatred towards something you dislike. You're craving for non-existence of these pleasures. You don't want these pleasures to show up. Who wants these pleasures to show up? Nobody wants to. Who wants suffering? Who wants pain? Nobody wants pain, right? Craving for continued existence. We have delusions about permanence and impermanence. We always think that we'll live tomorrow and the day after, and the day after, and the day after, until suddenly we die. Then we realize that we die, we're dying. We always crave for continued existence. People say, is there anything wrong in, cra in, 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 in maintaining continued existence? Nothing wrong with it. But if you, if you con continue your existence hurting others, inducing more car karmic craving, you are actually creating more bad karma. There's also craving for possessions. We tend to personalize everything according to your self-interest. We personalize all actions, all thoughts, all things, we personalize them. When our mind thinks, we are dominated by these. Without you noticing it, we don't even know it. We are habitually doing that. So we are habitually creating karma. We don't, we don't even know what is wrong, what is right. So then the question comes up to, okay, we come to introspection. What happens if we introspect the wrong concepts? What happens if we, we, we contemplate things that we shouldn't be contemplating? That's exactly what we're doing. What have we been contemplating all the time? What have you been interacting all the time? For example, in the mass media. Sex and violence. All this sex and violence mass media would infringe on your mind. They give you an indelible mark on your consciousness and you've been influenced by them and you think that way too. So it is very dangerous to expose yourself to interaction of sex and violence in the mass media. But who can turn away from that? Very few people. When you get addicted to that, what you want to see, you will keep on and on and on. It's just like Tom is always addicted to games and he can play until 3 o'clock in the morning, 4 o'clock in the morning, he forgot about schooling because he's addicted to it. Addiction is a terrible uh, intoxication. Next. All right, continue with introspection, as we said. So what is the right introspection now? Okay, the Buddha said we should do samatha and vipassana, but we must know what is right and what is wrong before we can think about it, right? If we have the wrong introspection, we say stop. If we have the wrong rumination of the mind, we say stop. If we're ruminating on sex and violence and, and selfishness and skeptical doubt and jealousy and hatred, greediness, pain, you name them, we say stop. We must know that those are not the right introspection. So it is very important that we know what is wrong and what is right. Many people cannot draw that line on what is wrong and what is right. I'm the most important. This is mine. That is yours. But we always personalize in a self-centered parameters without you noticing what you're doing. So the right introspection leads to nirvana, leads to enlightenment, leads to liberation, 
liberation of all your suffering. Why are we suffer? Why do we suffer? Not because God giving us the suffering, not because of demon giving you the suffering. You created your own suffering because you have craving. We all have craving. We have to work towards what purifying all this craving, letting go of this craving, clearing up all this garbage. We all have all this mental garbage in our consciousness that we keep on accumulating. Now the Buddha said, "Clean it up." When you are told to clean up your garbage, it's extremely difficult because we have been habitually accumulating garbage. Now you are told to clean it up. It takes a toll on your thinking. Why do I have to stop my sensual pleasures? Why do I have to stop attaching to beautiful things? Why do I have to stop attaching to? I don't know. What is introspection? Introspection in the Sanskrit language is zam prajnaya. Zam prajnaya means clear and right understanding. To understand it with clarity and righteousness, clear and right knowing with full awareness and introspection. But that's not enough. I have clear awareness. I have clear understanding. But what am I understanding about? What am I trying to understand? The next one is concepts of the introspection, because you ruminate. You are the subject. You're thinking about it. You're introspecting about it. You're contemplating about it. That's the subject. That's you. But you got to have the objects of your introspection. Your object your introspection is prajna. It is a state of pure consciousness that transcends. Worldly concepts or belief systems. What are worldly concepts and belief systems? Worldly concepts and belief systems are all personalization and aggrandizement of the self, of the self-centered, of the self-centered ego. That's usually your worldly concepts. Belief systems always believe in self-pursuits of happiness. Without or ignoring, or sometimes neglecting the welfare of others, people like to eat. That's why they kill animals for food. Do they care about the the well-being of animals being slaughtered? All the cows, the buffaloes, the pigs, chickens, ducks. You know, when they, they, when they're being slaughtered, they suffer. They, they intensely suffer from pain. But because you like it, you support it. You keep on eating it. That's your belief systems. You believe chicken should be eaten, fish should be eating, deer should be shot in in hunting. You believe those. That's your belief systems. Now these worldly concepts of belief systems that might impede perfect wisdom and trans. You, we, this belief system usually impedes wisdom. Now we want to transform the tainted consciousness into ultimate understanding of the true nature of existence and reality. We have to understand the true, the truth of this reality, the truth of this existence. Why do I exist? Where would I go? Why do I come to this world? Why are everybody not equal in thinking, in their in their plight, in their lives? Why are everybody diff- different? So you have to to cultivate into the wisdom of true reality, the 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 truth in existence. Not cultivating how to make a lot of money, how to be how to be praised. How to get the best out of everything? That's the karmic side of it. Now you want to go beyond the karmic side of it, and prajna is required. This kind of wisdom, we call it prajna, is required for you to turn from confusion, the shawl of confusion, 
and mental afflictions to that shore of enlightenment, to that shore of purity, to that shore of equanimity. So, you need, other than the desire to introspect, you also need the right concepts of introspection. So what does that tell us? That tell us, what are these concepts? I need some concepts to guide me. I need some parameters to guide me into the right introspection, right? What is wrong, what is right? I always think that as long as I better myself, why do I care? I always think that way. But now, the Buddha said otherwise. So what exactly the Buddha said? There's a lot more to venture into it. There's a lot more to know. It's not just Buddhism 100. It's Buddhism 100, 200, 300, 400. You must have the tendency and the interest to know, to, to delve into the understanding of existence and reality. Not just in pursuit of sensual pleasure, sensual pleasures and, and self-interest. After all, what have you been pursuing in your whole life? Satisfaction of sensual pleasures? Fame, reputation, good job, good money, good house, good car. All this is materialistic. That wouldn't guide you anywhere. That could guide you into serious karmic energy that is responsible for what you are suffering now, for what we are suffering now. We should all turn back, doing something different. If you are living up to 40 years old, are you going to continue what you have been pursuing on? Getting to work, eating your breakfast, getting your lunch and your dinner, getting a date, getting a family and raising kids, and then after 90 years, nursing homes. And after another 10 years, ocean view. That seems to be, that seems to be the path that everybody is following. Are you just satisfied with just following that? The wise would say, no, stop. I want to know something more about, about life, about true existence. It's right here. This is what the Buddha told us. What are these concepts? Some basic concepts require in the right introspection. At least we should know so some basic concepts. One of these concepts, I have gathered quite a few of these concepts, and I would like to go through these concepts in the introspection with you for a little while so that you know when you are actually introspecting what parameters we should be using. We say the four seals of the Dharma, the four foundations of introspection, introspection of the body, introspection of feelings, introspection of consciousness, and introspection of dharmas. And then we also do, we also analyze introspection of the five aggregates, introspection of dependent origination, which we call Patichusamapatta, introspection on Yogacara and which Dana Matrata, and the 37 factors of enlightenment. All right. So you have to know all these. Okay, now let's deal with the first one. If we can finish the first one today, it would be good. So, some basic prajna. So in other words, if you have been successful in calming, relaxing your mind, and steadying your mind, and stabilizing your mind, now we do a little bit more. On what? Introspecting the mind. Thinking about the mind. You know the mind is very powerful, you know. I would like to throw some more points into it. Some people would, would think that, well, coming to a, a course of meditation, learning about Buddhism, it seems to be going contradictory to getting profit, getting more money, getting more material. It seems to be, if I go into that course, I will forget thing, everything about pursuing for my self-interest, and that's dangerous for me. I like to pursue my own self-interest. But let me tell you, if you're pursuing this course of Buddhism, it would at the same time, simultaneously, 
help you to be successful in what you're doing, because you have a better mind, you have a more focused mind, and you know what is wrong and what is right. Why, why do we get into trouble? We don't even know what is wrong and what is right. Why do we get into trouble? We don't have one pointedness of mind. Why do we get into trouble? Because we only care for for our own self-interest. The Buddha said, "Care for others." What does this care for others means? Care for others, in another word, is public relations. Do you care for public relations? If you're not care for public relations, how can you keep up, build up relationship with your clients, with your friends? If you don't have good relationship with your friends, with your clients, how can you build up good business and good job? All this intertwined. All this is like. Everything is related, but this is related in the right way, and what you've been addicted to is related in the wrong way. So are we? So we get into the details of all this. Let's get into the four seals of the Dharma. The parameters, the four seals of the Dharma, is, is setting broad guidelines as to how we should think. Very broad, generalized guidelines of how to think in our daily lives, in our meditation, in our interaction with society. Let's get into the four seals of the Dharma. What is seal? Seal that means a chop, saying Home Depot. This is from Home Depot. Chop. This is from Whole Food. This. Because it sells anything that is away from this seal is not Buddhism. If you buy something from a Joe Blow, you're not guaranteed that you have a warranty. You're not guaranteed that equipment will work. If you buy something from a company that has a seal onto it, you can exchange for it if it doesn't work. You're guaranteed the quality of it, right? The seal is the most important. What are the seals of the Buddha or Buddhism? The four characteristics of all conditioned samsara. Samsara means life and death, life and rebirth. Everything is dominated by these four universal truths. We must know that this universal truth exists. First one is impermanence. All phenomena are impermanent. You name one thing that is, that is that is permanent to me. Is there anything that is permanent? Nothing is permanent. If you're listening to a dharma that says, "If you do this, you'll be permanently living," that's not what the Buddha said. That's not what the seal says. Impermanence. So everything is within the universal truthful existence of impermanence. Because of impermanence, we cannot attach permanent to impermanence. So, in other words, why do we have? Why do we always maintain a self-egoistic interest? Because we think that the maintenance of this ego is permanent. I want to protect it permanently, but nothing is permanent. You want to have pleasures permanently, but it doesn't exist. You want your your husband to be permanently by your side, your wife to be permanently by your side. It doesn't exist. What does it benefit you when you know that? See, when your husband passes away, you wouldn't be as grief stricken. You know that that's a, a universal phenomenon. You wouldn't be grief stricken or all years round. You will continue living. You will be more positive knowing this. So impermanence. The next next one is non-self. Now impermanence in the Sanskrit language is anitya, non-self, anatman. All existence is devoid of inherent existence or inherent nature. You think you have a self. 
You think this body is yourself? This body is not yourself. This body is only a lease that the body that, that you have, we have, is only a lease apartment. Not exceeding 100 years usually. When the lease expires, you've got to go. But people tend to, self with self-interest, love their own body. They love their own body and that they're attached to permanence. They love their own body, that's why they become egoistic. They love other bodies that induces what? Sensuous interaction, which leads to karma. So it's the loving of bodies. You have a self. You think that you have a self. Everything that we do is just an activity that is changing all the time. It's not an entity. Everything is just an activity. It's not an entity. What is the difference between activity and an entity? Entity is permanently staying. Entity is self-satisfying. Entity does not require any conditions for it to be fulfilled. Entity exists as it is. But there's no such thing. Everything we do is an activity that is changing, that is flowing. Our body is not an entity that is called self. Our body is the activity within a hundred years. And it changes all the time. When you get sick, it changes on you. When it dies, it betrays you if you want to stay attached to it. So it's an activity and not an entity. But when we mistakenly recognize that as an entity, and we, an entity is permanent, but there's no permanence. So sometimes you say, I suffer from this. I got fired. I have no job. But being get fired is just an activity that happens now. Don't be grief stricken by it. Don't give up. Keep on trying because you get another job. So why do you have to commit suicide because you lost a good $1 million job and you want to commit suicide? That job is just an activity at that time and it changes. The fact that you get fired is just a change that comes through to you. So how does it matter? What you should do is I learned from why I get fired. I must have done something wrong. I want to improve on it. I want to learn from experience, but not agonize on experience. There's a difference between learning from experience and agonizing from experience. So there's non-self. I can't even finish this. Maybe I, I just, next time, uh, I already have touched on impermanence and non-self. Maybe next time I should talk about suffering and nirvana. So remember, this is I shouldn't say the trademark, the enlightenment mark of the Buddhist teaching. If there's anything that is walking adversely against these, it's not Buddhism. So, okay, so next time, I'm going to repeat it again so that I won't repeat it. I, I won't have this in my mind. I have to repeat permanence. I, I finished impermanence concept and the non-self concept. Next time, I'll be talking about suffering and nirvana. And there's a lot more to talk about because when you introspect, you need the right introspection. It's just that you need the right teacher. If you follow the wrong teacher leading you hell, there's a problem. So we say meditation just briefly for five minutes, uh, in and out breath, a meditation. We break it down into two parts, pacification and introspection. Pacification is the samatha part, introspection is for pasana part. And pacification is dealing with calming, relaxing, steadying and stabilizing the mind, which we already have talked about uh, in detail 
the counting of it, the following, the stabilization. And we have now come to introspection. We spent many, many hours on one, two, and three. And now we have more or less, we say, elevate ourselves from just the techniques of stabilizations to a higher level of exploring the wisdom, um, the vipassana part of it. And without the vipassana part of it, we cannot get enlightenment. The pacification part of it is just to calm us down because our mind is not calm. Our mind has been too uh, desultory, too wandering. Um, it's uh, attaching to uh, many, many externalities. Now we have to introspect, contemplating within us. So we've been dealing with introspection for quite a while, and introspection involves a lot of, a lot of talking, a lot of understanding in it. And now we're dealing with introspection. And in introspection, we say, how do we introspect? First of all, we have to have the right introspection. Who is introspecting? the subject, what is being introspected, the object. So in other words, we've got to have some concept in our mind which form the foundation, the parameters of our introspection. What, what kind of standard? What is right and what is wrong? Um, uh, what is regarded as wholesome? What is regarded as unwholesome? You have to have some parameters you have to have to some measuring yardsticks to introspect. Because I could have introspected the wrong th morality, the wrong thing, right? So the right introspection required two parts to it, and this is really important to understand it. The samprajana part means you have to have a clear and right understanding. You must clearly and rightfully understand it with full awareness in the introspection. You cannot be dreaming, you cannot be having a, a dexotry mind or a wandering mind or a, a sluggish mind. You have to have a clear understanding on the subject part of it. On you, yourself, you must be willing to, to introspect. You're not, if you're not willing to even introspect, you just sit there doing nothing and just, and just relaxing and just, I don't know what you're doing. I mean, you just sit there and trying to stabilize your mind, and if you're not doing an introspection, though, though you're not doing it right. So you, the subject must be willing to, must have full awareness, must be clear, must concentrate, must focus, must have a stabilizing mind, must be calm in order to introspect. That's the, the first requirement. And then there's a second issue to it. What's being introspected? What are the concepts involved in introspection? The concept of introspection, prajna, is a state of pure consciousness. We use the Sanskrit word prajna, uh, which is wisdom. We need the wisdom to introspect. And this prajna transcends worldly concepts or belief system that might impede perfect wisdom. So in other words, the kind of wisdom that we use must transcend worldly wisdom, some worldly wisdom or intelligence, many, many of the, much of the intelligence, of the worldly intelligence, could impede, stop perfect wisdom. Um, one of these concepts and belief that impede wisdom, lack of morality, sluggishness, not being kind, not compassionate, selfishness, egoistic, you name them. All these impede wisdom. You don't want to get that into your introspection, right? So you need something that transcends all these mental afflictions, transcends ignorance, that transcends hatred, transcends jealousy, okay? You need that. And you need wisdom that transforms temporal consciousness into the ultimate understanding of the true nature of existence and reality. You're looking for exist understanding of true existence. 
Talking about existence, this, is, this word is very important. What is existence? Out of all the animals, out of all the animals, only human beings try to understand existence. A dog will not try to understand, why do I exist? What's my, what, what, uh, what, what, what wisdom I should have? And because the animals only react to externalities. When they are hungry, they try to eat. When they are hungry and they have nothing to eat, they will hunt. Uh, you know, when they are angry, they roar. So out of all um, beings, only the human beings question, try to introspect, look for, explore wisdom. Uh, I mean, wisdom, the wisdom of it. Because they know that I have an existence. Why do I have an existence? Where do I come from? The question, the human beings have the ability, have the wisdom to question it, whereas the animals, they don't have the ability, they don't have that kind of wisdom to explore it. So are you, are we not going to value, appreciate that kind of ability and explore into existence? And such understanding is prajna, which leads to an enlightenment. Put it simple, we need the right introspection, the right subject and the right object. The subject is one, you, right? You, me, we, we introspect. But the objects are so multifaceted, so various. Because the Buddha talk about prajna, the Buddha talk about prajna in varieties of ways. Because the Buddha talk in accordance with the wisdom level of the audience. It always change because it, 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 it tailored to who needs what. So there are so many prajna issues, prajna concepts, and, but there are some basic ones that we need to have in order to introspect. So in other words, the Buddha has been talking about prajna in a variety of ways that even if we exhaust our ability and our lifetime, we may not be able to explore all of it. But we need some very basic, basic ones that would allow us to get into understanding, true understanding. So we need some basic concepts. Plus, if you are flooded with all kinds of prajna concepts, you don't know, you may not you know, in, in studying Buddhism, we try to understand one part, one concept, and then go into the next. If you're all confused with different concepts that you don't understand, you cannot introspect properly. So it is very important that we have some basic concepts to serve as a measuring yardsticks to explore into wisdom. It, it, it's just like in the society. If we don't have any measuring yardsticks of morality, you'll be in trouble. We'll be all be in trouble. You can kill, you can steal, you can have sexual misconduct, you can do all kinds of things. But you, the society need a, needs a norm to work with, needs some parameters to, to work with. What are these? Some basic concepts require in the right con, con, uh, introspection, we say the four seals of the Dharma, the four foundations of introspection. We call it Satipatthana. We, we have introspection of the body, introspection of feelings, of consciousness, of all Dharmas. And then we also have introspection of the five aggregates, introspection of dependent origination, Paticca Samapatta. Paticca Samapata explore into reasons, the whys, the hows of existence. Because as I said, out of all the animals, only human beings have that ability, have that capacity, have that willingness to explore into existence. Only the, the wiser, the more intelligent species of existence explore into existence, not just take existence for granted. And then we also have introspection on Yogacara, which is Napti Matratata. And then number six, the 37 factors of enlightenment. If we understand these concepts more or less with thorough understanding of it, and then we, we, we interact with 
externalities, we already have all the security guards inside of us. We already have well equipped with all the knowledge in us to, to confront uh, a cruel reality, a hard reality, or to, to jump over hurdles of life. You know, we have to have enough of these concepts uh, spoken by the Buddha. In this session, why don't we just deal with the first one, the simple one, the four seals of the Dharma, the trademark of Dharma. So if anybody talk about any Dharma, not within this seal, that's not what the Buddha talk about. So we, we must not attach to those because they could be about struggling for fame, for reputation, for reputation, for wealth, for personal pursuits, and not within the parameters of what the Buddha taught. All right, so let's get to the four seals, the trademark, the stamp. Say, this is what we should understand, the four standards. So we say the four seals of the Dharma, kastu Lusana the four characteristics of all conditions samsara. First one, impermanence. All phenomena are impermanent. So we, if someone said to you that, I believe in permanence, there is a, a creator who permanently exists and who would permanently look after you, they know, oh, this is not what the Buddha is talking about. Or oh, there is a God that is permanent. Oh, that's not what the Buddha is talking about. And you need to understand permanence. What is permanence? What is impermanence? Nothing is permanent. So even the creator is not permanent. How can there be a creator? Nothing is impermanent. We'll say even God is not permanent. Last session we have a God discussions about what and where and how. God exists, and we already talked about it in detail. So impermanence, nothing is permanent. You name me a thing that is permanent. You name me anything that would stay all the time. Even if I die, it will still stay all the time. You think the world is permanent? The world that I'm living in is permanent? You think this building is permanent? Before the First World War and the Second World War, everybody believed that all structures are permanent. And then boom, and then nothing is permanent. There's no physical permanence. There is no metaphysical permanence. Even what you think about a thought is not physical, but that is not permanent. Even a philosophy is not permanent. Even a scientific theory is not permanent. Who discovered gravity? Who talk about, who initiated gravity? Huh? Newton, right? Newton said gravity. When we throw an apple in the air, it drops down. It won't fly up to the air. It would always drop down because of the theory of gravity. It always dropped, right? And then Einstein said, no. Einstein expounded the theory of relativity, not gravity. So gravity is more or less um, we wouldn't say uh, opposed by, but more or less argued by, uh, not totally accepted by, uh, an exposition of relativity. So even scientific theory, philosophy, nothing is permanent. So impermanence, we understand it, right? There's no question about impermanence. But a question may come up because when, when people go to lectures, they always say, hey, what you're talking about is theoretical. How does it benefit me by no impermanence? I know. I know everything is impermanent. So how does it benefit me to get what I want in, in society? You think about how the theory, or not the theory, the philosophy of impermanence, what does impermanence mean? Impermanence means changeability. Everything changes. Nothing is not changing. The good can change to be bad, and the bad can change to, to good. 
The good can be better and the better best. The better could be worse. You know, everything is changing. So, when everything is changing, there's hope. You don't always bury yourself in depression. I, I'm always depressed. There is a time when you wake up. There's a time when you're not depressed anymore. There's a time when you're away from the depression. There's always hope. Impermanence gives us hope. If everything is permanent, there's no hope. If good is always good and bad is always bad, so if I'm bad, I will always be bad. So there's no hope. So impermanence gives us hope because it changes. But the most important thing is how do you change it? How to change it? To what position are you going to change it? So if you're in a very bad situation, I'm going to build up conditions for a good change. I know what is good and what is bad. I want to point to us changing to the good side, changing to the wholesome side. That's the reason why we have all these concepts. So impermanence, I'm not going to deal with it in detail anymore because I talked about it last time too. Second, non-self. And somebody asked a question, what is non-self? Anatma. And in the, in, in the Pali languages, anatta, anatta. All existence is devoid of inter, inherent nature. Inherent nature or inher, inherent existence. Existence. That's a very important word. Because we all think that we exist. There were some philosophers back in the 19, at the beginning of the 19th century, uh, that, and they are called existentialists. Because they believe that we all exist. Uh, the fact is we all exist. We all exist, we go through hardship, we, we have happiness sometimes, we have sadness sometimes, and all this, you know, democracy or dictatorship, all these things, we're confronted with all that, we just live, we just, we are existing. And existence sometimes is suffering and sometimes it's happiness. Don't explain anything else, just the existing. We are existing. And you think existence is a fact. And then the Buddha said, no. The existentialist point out there's existence. The mistake is in existence. We wrongly believe in existence. There is no existence. Why do we say there's no existence? Because all existence is devoid of inherent reality. That's difficult to understand. What does that mean? All existence is devoid of inherent reality, inherent essence. How do we understand it? How do we approach to understand it? It's difficult to understand what is non-self. And let's get a little bit more detail into it. What is non-self? There's non-self of individual and there's non-self of all dharmas. Because other than me as an individual, everything is non-self. I am non-self, I don't have a permanent existence, I have, I'm non-self, and everything is non-self. Now let's talk about the individual first. Anatman, that's individual first. Ren wu wo, fa wu wo. First of all, the individual is composed of the five scanters, the five aggregates. An individual is nothing but a combination of the body and mind. You, me, we're a combination of the body and mind. We are composed of the five aggregates, the five scanters. What are these five scanters? Let's get a little bit more de detail into the five scanters. The five scanters, rupa, that's the first scanter. The body or the form, molecules, the atoms, anything that is solidity, that is anything that has the seven elements form, solidity of it. Everything is solid, right? You can see through, it, 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 it takes up space. Form takes up space, rupa. Fluid, fluidity, the water, heat, the temperature, moving, the oscillation, the movement. Space, right? Element of space, if there's no space, how can, we, how can there be water in the space, temperature, form in the space? And there's 
Other than that, we also have perception, perceiving form, fluid, heat, moving, space. And there, of course, there's consciousness. These are the seven elements of rupa. But rupa, basically, it's the form, the aggregates. And of course, there is someone that is an individual who understands this form. So basically, it's matter, fluid, heat, and, and what? Air. Air. Air, right? What is air? Say, take, an ex take the body as an example. What is air? What is moving? What is moved, the oxidation of it? The breath, right? The oxygen. All the air, all the, you know, the nitrogen, whatever you name it, all the movement inside the body. The air facilitates movement. If a body does not contain air, there's no movement. If there's no movement, we're dead through this air. Heat? If there's no temperature, if there's no temperature, there is no, no, no birth, and not, no existence and no non-existence. So there must be temperature that keeps it going. And how about fluid? Imagine if the body has no water into it. Is it a body anymore? How about solidity? If the body has no nails, the, the hardness of it, the nails, the teeth, the hair, the no bones. So the body is the f combination of all these elements of this solidity, fluidity, temperature, and oxidation on the movement. And there are space in between these two. And there's also a perception and a consciousness in the, in the brain, in the brain part of it, the mentality part of it. But basically, that's rupa. The five aggregates, first of all, rupa, our body. Considering the individual, the body. Considering the outside of the individual, everything we see. Everything we see, we sense, we perceive, is nothing but the five elements. Matter, water, heat, air, space, perception, and consciousness. That almost includes everything. That's the first aggregate. Second aggregate, Vedanta, perception. The individual perceive with the, with the six organs, the eyes, the ear, the nose, the tongue, the body, the mind, in, t in contact with the six sense objects, the form, the sound, the smell, the taste, the body impressions, and the mental objects. So in other words, the six sense organs interact with the externalities of, of the five externalities at the six externalities, the form. This is the form. The eyes interact with it. The sound, the ears interact with it. The smell, smell, nose interact with it. The taste, the tongue interact with it. The body impressions, the touch interact with it. Mental objects, the brain interact with it. So when you interact, when you perceive, that is sensation. That is perception. There's perception in it. That, be that belongs to the mentality part. Sanjna, the conceptual part. The mental functions of shaping it, coloring it, conceptualizing it, the length, the pain, the pleasures and everything, the sensation of it, the conceptions gave, give rise to sensations, and then also the samskara, all of it. And then carry into action. When you feel unhappy, you may cry, you carry into action. When you feel happy, you may smile, you may laugh. When you feel depressed, then you're emotional, so that's volitional actions expressed out. And then there's also the storage part of it, the consciousness, the perceptive part, the cognitive part, and the egoistic part. So we have the seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, bodily sensations, and mental consciousnesses. And then we also have the manas, uh, which is the seven consciousness, the ego consciousness, you always attach your self to it. This is mine. That's yours. This is my interest. I, we, you, he, she. And then there's also the ally consciousness, which is a banking consciousness for, for whatever coming energy produced and stored into it. And that's responsible for reincarnation, rebirth, coming energy, all that is stored in a bank. That is the memory chips of the computer of your computer. 
So these are the five scantures. So when we say non-self, which one is you? Is the body you, yourself? Is the body you as a self? If it is a self, which means that it is an entity, it always exists. It exists permanently. It exists by its becoming. It exists without conditions. But can you exist without conditions? If you have a self, that self, the definition of a self is that's an entity by itself. But we only exist in the form of activities, not in the form of entity. Activities always changes. One action leads to another. We, 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 we live with activities, but we don't live with an entity. An entity is permanent. An entity is unconditioned. And, and an entity is always created by its own becoming. But there's no such thing. This body exists on conditions. It has no inherent permanent reality because this body is going to die. It's like we'll have a string. One end is being born. The other end is death. Birth and death. Birth and death is the same string. It's not a different string. It's the same string. When you're born, you're bound to die. You're bound to die. So that's the same this is a string. But we always recognize being born and we always lament on dying. When a baby is born, okay, okay, happy birthday, we got a baby. But the baby is destined to die. It does not have a permanent existence. It does, it's devoid of inherent existence. It's devoid of inherent self-nature. It does not have a self. By definition of a self, a self is permanent. A self is non-changing. A self exists all by itself. But no, we exist on conditions. If your mom and dad didn't come together in, in a certain circumstances and give rise to you, uh, w w w when the... Uh, uh, biologically speaking, when the, when the spermatozoa is not fusing with the ovum, you're not going to be here. It's because your mom and dad comes together, the conditions fulfill for these young couples come together, and that specific, specific conditions, some conditions will never be right for giving birth to a baby. You know, then many, many conditions fulfill that you become a self but you don't have a permanent existence. Some people get scared on this. If I don't have an existence, who am I? I don't have an existence. Where am I? We don't have an existence, but we have a liar consciousness. We have a tainted consciousness, a tainted conglomeration of karmic energy that brought us, that bring us life after life. And the Buddha said, transform that alaya consciousness into buddhi, into, uh, if we can use that word, eternity. If we can use that word into ultimate bliss, into transcendence from, from life and death. We transcend life and death. The perception, is the perception you? Is that feeling of Pleasure, you? Is that feeling of displeasure, you? No. This is just a feeling. How, how, how can you identify you, yourself, as that feeling? The reason why we have depression is, I am depressed. But if you say, this depression is a feeling, I'm going through it, I'm watching it, I'm living with it, it's just a feeling. It's not my real self. But the one who's depressed always identify himself with, I am depressed. It's just your mentality is depressed. You just watch, you just live with the depression. When a person is depressed, he's in the depression. 
It's not out away from it. It's very difficult to walk out of depression, but you have to know that, okay, this is now a period of depression, but that depression is not me. This is just a feeling of depression. But the depression comes, let it come, and let it go. Because it's not you. It's not you. Sams samskara, it's the conceptualization you, it's just a conceptualization. Even prajna is not you. We receive the conceptualization to think, but it's not you. Sometimes you have the right conceptualization, sometimes you have the wrong conceptualization. And how about the vichnana? All this consciousness, that consciousness is only a temporary you. And when you're enlightened, that light consciousness is transformed into prajna, which is leading to enlightenment. So none of the five scanters, the five, none, each, none of each five is you. The combination of not you is not you. If they are combined together, they're not, still not you. Well, it takes, you have to think about it before you know it. Um, for non-self, okay? So there's no self. What we call self is actually lack of inher inherent existence, reality, impermanence, interdependent on individuals and things. It is on causality. We exist on causality. We don't have a true existence. And how about all things? All things, anything that is swabhava is by definition unconditioned. What does that mean? Swabhava means that particular thing does not re rely, depend on causes to come into being. That particular thing is permanent. And that particular thing comes into existence all by its own ability, all by its own becoming. It does not need any conditions. It just, boom, exists. Is there any such thing in the world that exists? Swabhava? Everything is causality. Everything depends on causes and they are independent in, on each other to exist. So, we know that anything that exists must be conditioned depending on causes. Thus, the existence of, of Svabhava is impossible. Okay? So, that's non-self. And, and then we say, why do we always think that we have a self? That's a delusion. A person's sense of having a distinct self comes from the five scanters, body, sensation, perception, volition, and consciousness. We experience the world through the five scanters, and as a result, attach to, cling to things, and experience suffering. Because we attach, because we think we have an existence, we attach to what we want, what we desire, we're attached to possession, we're attached to occupation, we're attached to hatred, greediness, we're attached to relationship, male and female relationships, we're attached to these things and think that we require them, we, and think, we think that these are what we want, cravings, that lead us to experience suffering. The Buddha said if you walk away from those, you are slowly walk away from suffering. But who can? We know about it, but we can never walk away from it so far. You think the, the alcoholic standing at the front of, a, of, of, of the liquor store does not know that liquor is not good for them? They probably know. You don't have to give them theories. You don't have to say, oh, get onto the internet. This is the disadvantages of drinking alcohol. They all know that. But they're so obsessed with it that they can't change. How do people obsess to the mass media? How do people obsess to certain tendencies? They can't get away from it. They have to train themselves because they experience these things through ages. They're so Everything that they've experienced is so indelible in their heart, so infringed in their heart, so, so, so deep 
that they can't get rid of it. It takes training. The Buddha said, the early, earlier the training, the easier for you. And some people never go through that training, even at death. They still bring the karma to the next life. The Buddha said, train yourself to let go of these. You need the training, not just talking about it. What is this training? Samatha and Vipassana. This other training. Right now we go through training. But coming here for two hours per Saturday is certainly a tip of the iceberg. You need the 24 hours training to get enlightenment. And uh, all right, and we, this is self. So we have explained non-self. And next time, I still have to go through the four seeds of the Dharma, suffering and nirvana. Now, now that we know the parameters of our introspection, the concepts, we know that nothing is permanent, nothing is self. Don't say, this is me. How come I, you say to me like that? How come you're hurting me? I heard something that you said I don't like. You are infringing on me. I mean, there's always me, you, he, she. And we, we can never get away from this cocoon of egoism. You may not notice it. Every word you utter, every thought comes up in you is me, is I. I always consider myself first. Would you consider other people first? No. I want this. I don't want this. Get away. You don't hurt me. Everything is me. I. And can we get rid of this self? The Buddha said, let go of the ego. Let go of the self. We can't even stabilize our mind. Learn to stabilize your mind first, and then you slowly introspect into the parameters of impermanence, into the parameters of non-self. You always have to contemplate impermanence, always have to contemplate no self. Not just within this one hour, when you look at the PowerPoint, oh yeah, impermanence, oh yeah, non-self. When you walk out, it's not anymore. Meditation, the in and out breath meditation. And we say meditation is in basically in two parts. Meditation, in and out breath, concentration or focus, and then contemplation or introspection. Introspection is a better translation than contemplation, so it's introspection. Now, in concentration, we have three folds. Uh, in concentration, the counting, the following, and the stabilization. And last time we have stopped at stabilization and we just have begun on introspection. Um, now, let us explore more into introspection because introspection is extremely important. It always has been introspection that most people don't understand because counting, following, and stabilization Counting and following are easier to understand, although to some people they are difficult enough. But then stabilization is even more subtle. So it's not easy to understand too. You have to practice it to understand. Now we get into introspection, which is even more difficult because introspection concerns wisdom. I remember on the Chinese New Year Eve, I gave a lecture, I gave a speech um, before the countdown on, uh, on um, the values of life. I said, the values of life is to be good, to be happy, and to be wise. To be good, to be happy, and to be wise. That's, those are the human values that we should have. And almost there's no denying about it. Everybody wants to be good. There's no one who wants to be a bad. But what is goodness? What is the standard of goodness? I quoted 
we have to at least to have the five precepts. Abstain from killing, abstain from um, stealing, abstain from sexual misconduct, and abstain from lying, abstain from intoxicants. So those are the to be good and then to be happy. Now, to be happy is counting, following, and stabilization. To be good is following the precepts, raise the morality standard. But to be happy, you really need to have stillness of mind to be happy. If your mind is not calm, if your mind is always in turmoil, if your, your, if your mind is always disturbed, then you're not happy. The, the happiest moment is when your mind is peaceful, so we said, stabilization. So counting, following, stabilization is geared towards learning to be happy. The value of to be happy is not just talking about it. You will have to practice it. You have to cultivate happiness. Happiness is not waiting for you to take. Happiness is waiting for you to be cultivated, to practice. And now we go into introspection. Introspection concerns what? Introspection, turning, and purification concerns what? To be wise. Wisdom. In order to have wisdom, you really have to go inside. Wisdom is not looking from outside. Wisdom is certainly not concerned with having a lot of money, having social status. You know, not concerned with that. Wisdom is concerned with what is inside of you. The wisdom is inside. So let's continue to talk about introspection. What is introspection? The cultivation of introspection or contemplation or to, to be wise, to get wisdom. How do we get wisdom? The major theme of the Buddhist teaching is learn to be wise. We call it prajna in Sanskrit. And in Pali, we call it banya in Pali. So, let's get to some basic first before, before we get into how to get wisdom. The mind, the mind what? The mind introspects all the time. The mind introspects, in other words, the mind thinks, right? The mind is in two parts. We have the thinking mind and the emotional mind. The thinking mind is what we always call the rational mind. And the other mind is the emotional mind. Most often, our emotional mind and our thinking mind is at a tug of war. They're pulling in different directions. I want to be rational, and yet I want to be, my emotions come up. You know, your rational mind and your emotional mind always like to be at a tug of war, pulling against each other. In other words, you're going one way, you want to be, you want to stay calm, but your emotional mind wants to be disturbed. You don't want it to be depressed, but your emotional mind gears you to depression. So they're always at a tug of war. Oh, everybody is like that. And what's the reason? Because most often our emotional mind, our mind has been influenced by mental afflictions accumulated from our past experiences. Pres in the present life, past experiences, and previous life, past experiences, such as greediness, hatred, arrogance, self-view, suspicion, anxiety, worry, fear, jealousy, and so on. But not just unwholesome, sometimes you have wholesome too. Sometimes, sometimes what? Pleasure, happiness, gladness. We're not always unhappy all the time. Sometimes we are excited with joy, rapture of joy, pleasures from sensuous, from sensuous excitement. So, but we have to train our thinking mind by introspecting concepts of enlightenment. So usually our mind introspect Thinking mind and emotional mind work simultaneously, like a tug of war pulling against each other. But our emotional mind seems to be always in control. It's always the emotional mind that is stronger than the thinking mind. In other words, we are more 
emotional than rational. <laughs> you may not realize it. That's why we yell. That's why we shout. That's why we fight. That's why we get jealous. That's why we get greedy. That's why we have sensuous feeling. Our emotional mind is always in control. Our rational mind is always controlled by our emotional mind, almost like no exception. That's why sometimes we are out of control. So, our mind introspects, and our emotional mind seems to be always in control. And the mind is introspecting what? The mind is introspecting, is thinking about, can't, can't think about what? All actions, all speeches, all thoughts of the past, present, and future. All the past, present, future happenings, all the past, present, future talking, everything. The mind is always thinking about it, ruminating on it, pondering on it, bringing the past back to the present, worry about the future and bring it on the present to ponder on it. And all these are physical objects, impressions, images, right or wrong concepts. Our mind is like this. This is, this is a, a very simple beginning course in psychology. In psychology, we always study this. Our mind, in neuroscience, how, how does our mind think? So the, uh, Buddhism gets into neuroscience and psychology 2,600 years ago. The Buddha already talked about a lot about psychology, a lot about neuroscience. But we just don't know about it. We think that believing in Buddhism is to get, just to get blessings from Buddha. That is more or less superstitious. Believing in the Buddhist teaching is not to get blessings, to get merits all the time, no. It's not that. That's just... That's just for people who are not even beginners, who are just pondering and walking at the store steps before entering the door of the Dharma. All right, so, so what do we do? We have to train our thinking mind by introspecting concepts of prajna, concepts of enlightenment, so that our thinking mind can gain the control we want our rational mind to be in control, not the emotional mind. And these concepts, as expounded by the Buddha, are numerous to learn, multifaceted, too much, immeasurable. There's so many. That's the reason why sometimes in Sutra said, every concept is Buddhism. Every action, every speech, every thought, wholesome and unwholesome, relates to Buddhism. So much in it. So let's talk about how to train our rational mind to get better control of our emotional mind. Don't, are you not interested in this? Or are you, are you just interested in looking for money, looking for status, fame, reputation, going to party, you know, enjoying yourself with sensual pleasures? You are not. This group of people, they are looking for wisdom, right? You guys are looking for wisdom. We say, General concepts of enlightenment to cultivate our introspection and specific concepts of enlightenment to cultivate our introspection. The general concept, prashna concepts explaining the characteristics related to the true nature of existence and reality, which is, direct, which is a direct insight into the truth discovered by the Buddha in his attainment of enlightenment, such as the threefold nature of existence, paticca samapatta, antecedental concurrence. Uh, some of the general concepts, the threefold nature of existence and Paticca Samapatta. Just to give, give a few examples, there are a lot of general concepts of, of prajna and there are a lot, much more specific concepts of prajna. But let's explore a few. This is unlimited source, unlimited amount of teachings as expounded by the Buddha. Well, we got to pick, and sometimes we have to pick and choose too. Um, because, when, because when the Buddha gave lectures, he gave lectures in according to the intelligence and the level of, of his audience. That's the reason why we have so many sutras 
to explain in different ways, some very subtle way and some very simple way. So we have the general concepts and the specific concepts. All right, specific concepts, specific prasana concepts directed to the removal of specific hindrances of the mind. For example, the five hindrances. These are the removal of specific hindrances and also concerns with the enhancement, adding to the wisdom in the understanding of the Buddhist teaching. For example, the four Brahma Viharas uh, or the four immeasurable hearts, the measurable hearts the full foundation of introspection. We have about another five minutes. And let's get, let's get to some general concepts first. General concepts are very important. Let's get to a very specific general concept, uh, the threefold existence. Let's get into the threefold nature of existence. The first one is impermanence. Sanskrit, aniya, pali, anicca. All phenomena arise dependent on conditions. Dependent on conditions, whatever dependent on conditions is, is unstable and is always changing. Everything is therefore impermanent. Changeability is a constant characteristic of existence. Impermanence. In other words, everything in this world is impermanent. Nothing is permanent. Suffering. What is impermanent is insecure. Phenomena that are against my desire, this, this insecure phenomena are always against our desires and will. Impermanence brings suffering such as aging, sickness and death to the body and decay to whatever, whatever you encounter in this world. Everything is subject to changeability. Nothing, nothing remains all the time. That makes us unhappy. Because of impermanence, because of this suffering as a result of impermanence, we are unhappy. So that's the reason why happiness is a human value that we are striving for. We want to be happy. We want to be happy, but it seems that the whole world is working against what we want. Because the whole world is impermanent, the whole world is full of sufferings, right? The Buddha said, we have to learn how to transcend impermanence and suffering. Next, non-self, anatman. Impermanence and suffering are not, under, are not under our control. And whatever is not under our control does not, does not belong to me and, or mine, and, and, and is not mine, therefore. This body that I call I or myself is only an, an elusive existence. And that's very difficult to understand. This body that I call I is a delusion. It's very difficult to understand. Maybe let me just explain it in a little bit of detail. And I hope that you listen carefully because I'm not going to repeat it again. What is the meaning of no self? We say no self, Anatman. Whenever your senses cognize externalities, what is the meaning of cognize? Cognition. Cognize is seeing, listening, hearing, tasting. Whatever your senses cognize externalities. I see you, I cognize you as an external. I hear you, I cognize your sound, right? Cognition is a psychological term. Cognition, okay? Whenever your senses cognize externalities, these externalities are outside, right? They're not inside. I see you, you're outside, you're not inside of me. I hear sound when you're speaking, you're out, your sound is outside, not inside. So whatever you cognize, all these externalities are outside. But when you cognize something, it's not just cognition. You react to them, right? You won't be insensitive to them. You react to whatever you cognize externally. And in the process of reaction, interaction, these externalities let you react would arouse reactions in your mind. And these reactions are inside, right? These reactions are not with you. If I see you, I hate you, this reaction is inside of me, this reaction is not you. This, 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 this is not you, right? So that means, actually, 
when you are cognizing, when you are seeing, listening, hearing, you are experiencing what? You have two kinds of experiences, right? Cognizing the objects are objective experience. Objective experience. Because you're the objects. And cognizing the reactions inside of me are subjective experience, right? You understand so far? You understand the difference between objective and, ex and, and subjective, right? Subjective experience and objective experience. So, you create subjective experience when you see something. You create subjective experience. What you see is objective, but what you react is subjective. So you, cr you create a subjective experiences by reacting to what you cognize. That means you personalize the subjective experiences. You personalize it, right? When you say, I personalize this subjective experience, what does that mean? That means the moment you personalize this subjective experiences, what have you done? I have hatred. I hate you. I'm jealous of you. I have fears. I have anxiety. I have guilt. I have worry. When you personalize subjective experiences, reactions happen inside of me. And when you personalize, the moment when you personalize, then you have what? You have created the I, I, I hate you, I love you, I, whatever, you know, you created this I, right? What is it that you call I? What is this I? I'm getting into very intensive psychology and philosophy. Do you understand me so far? You understand me so far, right? So I have created this I. Because what, the moment I personalize my subjective experiences, I say, I hate you. I love you. I'm greedy for this. I want to have this. This is mine. I am mine. This is mine. You personalize it. Whatever you call, whatever you personalize, you identify it. You must be something, you call it something, you must be able to identify it, right? I call this a mouse, I must be able to identify this mouse, right? And what is this mouse? How do I identify this mouse? What makes this mouse has some identity that I can identify? It, it occupies what? space and time, right? Does this mouse occupy space and time? Right? What is this space? Space is what? The length, the breadth, the height, and the weight. This is space. If it doesn't have any length, height, space, weight, how can I see it, right? It occupies space. It also, it also occupies what? Time. It began in the factory. It could end up in the garbage later. It has its time dimensions, right? So if I say something called I, this I must have space and time too. Otherwise, how can I identify the I, right? This I must have space and time. What is the space of I? We you know, but what is the time? the time dimension of the I. This time dimension of the I, I call I, I personalize as I, must have what? Must have a past and a future and a present, right? The past of the I is what? The past of this I begins with what? Begins with birth, right? You were born, right? You will begin with birth many, many years ago, you were 30 years, ago, 30 years old, and you're 30 years ago, you were born. So, so the time of this I that I identify, that I, I personalize, began with birth, 
And the future of this I, what? Ends in what? Death. <laughs> right? It ends in death, right? And in between is what? Aging. Right? Aging. Any argument? No, right? So this time, or this I began with birth and ends in death, and in between is aging. Then I said to myself, aging, birth, and death is suffering. I have created a suffering. I have created an I that goes with this suffering. Am I stupid? How come I create an I that goes through birth, aging, and suffering? Am I, am I stupid? Yes, we are all stupid. Because we created something that I call I, and this I is nothing but aging, sickness, and death. And I attach to this concept of I. And I struggle to existence because of I. I lie because of I. I kill because of I. I make sexual misconduct because of I. And this I, where is this I? I created this in my reaction, in my personalization. There's no such thing as I. There's no self. I call this I my self. But I created it. The moment you personalize subjective experiences, you have done something very dangerous, very risky. You have, you have created suffering. So we are stupid. We are stupid. Right? And right now, instead of calling ourselves stupid, we better be wise in going for lunch. <laughs> and because we want to satisfy this I, that is the body, with food. Otherwise, we'll go hungry. Okay, so next time we'll talk, we'll talk more about the I. In meditation, we have just to recap, we have concentration and contemplation. Uh, and we already have finished counting, following, stabilization, and now we are at introspection. And introspection, as, I, as we said before, uh, is to internalize your thinking. Uh, you introspect within, inside, inside of us. The normal introspection contains the thinking part and the emotional part. Uh, unless you want to go supernormal, which is to get rid of the emotional part, uh, supplement your, your emotional part into just the thinking part. Um, every day we are actually contemplating. Every, every day we are thinking. Um, our mind is working non-stop and when our mind is working you may not notice it it is working like that it contains a thinking part and the emotional part and the emotional part is always in control of the thinking part and so in order to introspect we have to know what is wrong and what is right. If your thinking part is involved with irrational thinking, it becomes emotional. So we have to know in introspection, first of all, you have to, we have to analyze our, our mind to say, what are we thinking of? What are we introspecting? You must have some basis of introspection. So we have to have some general concepts and specific concepts of prajna, of introspection. That's the reason why we have to study the Buddhist teaching. We must know some of the general concepts of enlightenment, some specific concepts of enlightenment. Uh, otherwise, your introspection has no basis to rely on. Um, the Buddhist teaching contains numerous concepts about the universe, about existence, but there are some important ones we would like to bring them out for discussion so that we know when we are introspecting what should we be thinking about. And last time we already have explained um, the threefold nature of existence. Of course, we have to continue with the general concepts, uh, Paticca Samapata, 
Uh, this, and, uh, uh, some people translated it uh, ante antecedental concurrence or antecedental dependent concurrence. And antecedental means one happened after another. Logically, one circumstance happened happen before another circumstance. And that's antecedental. Dependent means uh, the fact that it happens depend on many, many conditions, depend on conditions that are necessary for, for it to happen. Concurrence is simultaneously is doing that, naturally is doing that without you noticing it. So these will have to explain. And we already have explained. These are the general concepts that we have to, we have to contemplate all the time so that um, your introspection is on the right basis. Last time we explained the threefold nature of existence, impermanence, suffering, and non-self. And I think we explained, it, explained that in detail. We call it the threefold nature of existence. But then some people may think impermanence, suffering, and non-self. Isn't that, isn't that sad? Isn't that uh, pessimistic? That's the facts of life. Uh, impermanence, suffering. Impermanence brings with its concomitants sufferings. A lot, of, a lot of things related to impermanence give rise to suffering. We call, it, we call those concomitants with, with, with impermanence. Like for example, impermanent. Our life is impermanent. Um, um, a relationship is impermanent. A marriage is impermanent. Um, sometimes a business is impermanent. Um, prosperity is impermanent. Everything is impermanent. So that's the reason why we say impermanence brings with this concomitants, whatever related to it, sufferings. So that's what we have, suffering, dukkha. And because of impermanence, because of suffering, that brings us Unhappiness. We're not happy. We're not happy because of impermanence and suffering. It's just like what we happen now. There was, there was one of us in here meditating this morning, and all of a sudden it's impermanent. Um, all of a sudden you should just collapse, a seizure, whatever you call it, and then everything changed. And then she has to go to the hospital. And that happened to. Uh, that happened to everybody. Is it possible that everybody lower the, your legs on the floor so that we lower your legs on the floor is easy to that, you know, doing that way, yeah. Um, so we explain what is non-self. We ex explain non-self is very difficult to understand, but I explain it in terms of subjective and objective experiences, in terms of personalization or, or uh, People not just personalize, we uh, uh, egotize, we egotize. But then, the Buddhist teaching, when we say explain the world, is not just pessimistic. Um, if everything is pessimistic, that means there's no changes, which is just contrary to, in, to the concept of impermanence. If everything is impermanent, everything is suffering, everything is no self, then, then um, there's no chance, no hope. Everything is going, going in, 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 in an adverse condition. But it is not like that. It is because of impermanence, because of suffering, because of non-self, we have a chance. And we call it the fourfold nature of existence. Yes, we have impermanence. Yes, we have no self. Yes, we have suffering. But the Buddha pointed out to us that we can arrive at a transcendent state in which there is neither suffering, desire, neither no desire, no suffering, no delusion of self. The subject is liberated from the effects of karma and the cycle of death, of, of, of death and rebirth. Um, at that time, there's no emotions. 
only a peaceful, blissful mind. We are at the stage of equanimity. We are at the stage of, if you want to call it eternity, eternal bliss, eternal happiness, where there's no more bondage of life and death, no more reincarnation. So there's always hope. If hope has no change, that means there's, there's always no hope. But hope, hopelessness can be turned into hopefulness. So the Buddha said, yes, but that is nirvana, parinirvana. There's hope in everything. There's, you think it's pessimistic? It's very optimistic. It's because of impermanence, impermanence because of non-self, because of suffering, that we want to get out from there. We want to get out from these three bad characteristics or miserable characteristics of samsara. So the fourfold nature of existence. Now then, we, now then these are the concepts that should always be in our mind when we are introspecting. We know that everything is impermanent, suffering, dukkha, and then we're working towards nirvana. We're working towards pari nirvana. So these are the general concepts that you always have to cultivate, you always have to internalize it, you always have to think about it. This is what the Buddha said, train your mind to conceptualize these factual characteristics of the nature of existence. Don't forget about these. And then there's another very important general concept Paticca Samuppatta. Paticca Samuppatta is one of the most important concepts in the Buddhist teaching. Uh, if you don't understand this concept, you don't understand life. Remember, Paticca Samuppatta is a concept of um, the Theravada school. They strongly emphasize on understanding it if you don't understand Paticca Samuppatta, then you don't know life. When you don't know life, how can you internalize it? How can you introspect? So you have to understand what life is all about. So this is called Paticca Samuppatta. Try to remember, <laughs> remember the, the Paticca Samuppatta is a Pali word. Uh, Pali and Sanskrit are more or less quite similar, but tr try to remember Paticca Samuppada. They have songs sung about it. Now, if we translate it into, many translators translated Paticca Samuppada into dependent origination of life. But many modern translators uh, and many enlightened monks they said that the translation may not be accurate. And for example, um, uh, uh, Bartain, uh, uh, um, Punachi, uh, they translated as antecedental concurrence. Um, and I personally put in dependent because all this dependent on the necessary conditions. Things happen only with the fulfillment of the, all the necessary conditions. So let's start with this Paticca Samapatta. And maybe we can sing about it later. We have a song, a very beautiful song sung. The translation, what does antecedental mean? That means one circumstance happened before another circumstance logically. One happened after another. Dependent, dependent on, the, on the necessary conditions. If there's no con necessary conditions, it won't come out, it won't happen. Concurrence, concurrent that means somehow it happens simultaneously. It occurs simultaneously. Now let's start with this 12. Some people call it the 12 chains of dependent origination of, of, of our life. What is avidya? Let's start with avidya. I got it in red. Let's do it very slowly so that you understand exactly what it means. Avidya. Avidya is a Pali word and most people translate it as ignorant. But ignorant is not a good translation. It's actually, as 
Bhattain Panachi pointed out, uh, it's, um, it's unconscious, mental unconsciousness. You're not conscious. No, let us do it by example. A baby is conceived in the mother's womb, right? Let's start with a baby. We started from being a baby, right? A baby is conceived in the, the mother's womb. And then when the baby is inside the mother, the baby is dependent on the mother, right? Dependent on many, many necessary conditions. The mother must be healthy. The mother must be alive. The mother must be eating. And all the food will also go to the baby. The breathing of the mother becomes the breathing of the baby. We started with that, no exception. Everybody started with being a baby inside. And we connected to a tube, and then we have all the nutritions, uh, the baby have all the nutritions. And even emotionally, the baby is, 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 is it's related, dependent on the mother's emotions. That's the reason why we always, we always advise the conceived mother to be happy, to be kind, to be compassionate, to be helpful, so that the baby started to learn right at the embryo, not outside. Learning inside is very important. The 10 months of learning is inside. Avidya. What is avidya? We can call it, translate it as mental unconsciousness. The baby cannot think. So, okay, let's take another step. The second step is, all right, the baby makes sure. The baby comes out. The baby comes out now. When the baby comes out, the baby does not know what's going on. The baby is unconscious. It, doesn't, it just happened to the baby. Do you know what is going on when you're being born? You don't know what's going on. It just happened to you. It just happened to you. That is occurrence, concurrence. That means happening to you without your control. Can the baby say, I don't want to be born? Can the baby say that? Can the baby say, okay, I don't want to be in this hospital? Can you are mentally, you don't have any thinking at all. You don't even have learning. You don't know what's surrounding you. You don't know, what's, you don't know any names. You don't know even the mother's name. You don't know, you don't know what's a mother, what is a father. You know nothing. And some people translate as ignorance because you know nothing and people translate as ignorance, which is, which is not bad. I mean, still, we're ignorant, right? You think the baby is not ignorant? You mean the baby, when the baby is born, the baby is talented? He can sing a song, by the way? He becomes weird. If, if the baby come out and sing a song, it becomes weird. So the baby is mentally unconscious. The baby is ignorant. And avidya, what is avidya, the Pali word, avidya means mentally unconscious. No thinking, nothing. It's nothing. And when a baby is at that stage being born, um, he comes out, he was so comfortable in the mother's body. When he comes out, air conditioning, he feels chilly, he feels cold. He doesn't feel comfortable. The baby does not feel comfortable. And then also, the baby has no breathing, and, and the, the, the baby does not know how to breathe. If you don't know how to breathe, can you call yourself clever? You're ignorant, right? You don't know how to breathe. So the, the first thing the baby has to do is to learn how to breathe. If the baby does not breathe, the doctor we try to make the baby breathe. You know what the doctor would do? Spang the baby, making sure the baby cried, the first cry, the lung inflated. All of a sudden the baby breathe and cry, right? So when the baby comes out, he did three things. He did three things. The bodily action, the mouth speech, and the first mental thinking. What is the body, what is, what is the, what's the first physical bodily action, bodily action the baby did? The body. He's struggling. 
He's trying to breathe, right? Ah, he's trying to breathe. The first breath of the baby is what we call zankara. He has to he has to breathe. He has to struggle to exist. But sankara is in three parts, though. The bodily part, which is the physical part, the breathing part, and then what? The verbal part. Rah, she's crying. The baby is crying. The first, your first mental expression is your crying, your sound that comes out. Bodily breathing, verbal mouth, crying. What is the mentality? I don't like this cold. I don't like it. I don't like this cold. I come out, how come these people touch me? I feel, I feel the touch not soft because when I'm in my mom's womb, I'm so comfortable, I'm so warm, I'm, everything is so soft. Now you guys, your hands are so rough uh, uh, and the doctor has gloves even and you touch my body, I don't like it. I don't like it. So that's what? That's emotional, that's the mental. So the mental, the mental part the physical part and the verbal part, all of a sudden starts to start to work, start to happen. The baby doesn't do it. You think the baby deliberately do the crying, deliberately do the breathing, deliberately do the mental thinking? No, it just happened without control. Everything happened to you without you controlling it. You're not controlling yourself. You're not under your own, you're not the master of yourself. From, from, the, from hospital to grave, you're not the master of yourself. You don't have any existence. You only struggle to exist. You think you have an existence? No. We only struggle to exist. You may not know about it, but after you have thoroughly understand Patricia Samapata, you know you don't exist. Avicca would lead to Sankara. Sankara is breathing, crying, emotional, disliking. There's Sankara. And then, the, the baby started to have what? Started to have a little bit of sensation and feeling. The baby is alive, right? And what is, what is the next one? Vinana. Vinana. Vinana is perception. It's perception. What is perception? The baby have eyes. The baby have ears. The baby have nose. The baby have touch, have the whole body. The baby have the organs inside working, interacting with each other. And the baby have the mind, have the brain to think about something. So the baby have senses, right? When the baby have senses, the baby started to use the senses. The baby would hear, would see, would taste, would touch, would all do, do all these things. That is manana, perception. The day baby would then what? The baby would be lying in, the, in, in the, what do you call that, a crepe? What, what do you call that? A cradle, right? A crepe, right? Lying in there, waiting for the mom. The, but the mom would show the face. And when the, when the baby see the mom, the first, the first sight of the mom, he does not know this woman. Does he know this woman? He does not know this woman. Mom, I don't know mom. I mean, what is this? And then a mom would say, hey, giggling. You know, you know, would giggle and say, would be say would make the mom would be singing a lullaby. Would be touching softly, kissing the child, showing the compassion to the child. So the child start to, to know that I see my mom's face and everything. Every time when I see, I don't know what's that word, mom, I see this face. When I see this face, I feel somebody giggling me. I feel that he's very gentle, very, very um, soft-spoken. And the baby said, I like it. 
I like it. So every time when he sees mom's face, he build he build up some liking for it. He's, he build up some craving for it. Internally, I'm craving to see my mom's face, and also everything. Every time when I see my mom's face, what is the subsequent action that will follow? I get milk. I get food. So every time when I see this face, I have food coming. I have someone singing to me. Uh, something is soft. Something is so tender, loving. Something I don't know what this woman is though. And then the mom would say, "I'm mom. Call me mom. Hi, Jeanette. Hi, Mary." And then mom, mom, mom. So the mom, the word mom comes. Up. Wait till mom finish this. I will come back to you. I will give you milk. Mom, mom, mom. There always the sounds all the all the time. So the baby starts to have feelings about it, from ignorance to sankara, which is building building up some actions and activities, and then go on with the perception. Unfortunately, time is up. I can I can go on. But let me remind you: you have to understand, patichya samabhaya pata. To know the Buddha's teaching, the Buddha gave us all the details about how a baby was born, and uh, until the baby dies, and we have to follow it step by step, so that we can analyze life, so that we can analyze the delusive nature of existence. Meditation is in two parts. We know already, one is pacification or st stabilization, and the other is mental stabilization and mental introspection. Stabilization is samatha, and introspection is vipassana. Uh, in uh, that's in the Sanskrit language. In the Chinese language, is zhi guan. And we have been spending a number of, quite a number of hours on counting under stabilization, counting, following, and stabilization. And we are now actually on introspection. And introspection is very important. Introspection is dealing with wisdom. And um, counting, following, and stabilization is dealing with how to focus. How to pacify the mind? How to calm down the mind? In meditation, we must first learn how to calm down the mind. That's that's almost the first procedure. If you can't even calm down, how can you introspect internally with wisdom? So you must know how to calm down. That's the reason why, in usual, in 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 every day, um, you know, in our life, we say. Don't get agitated. Calm down. So calm down is really ex absolutely important. And we have been talking about introspection. Uh, when we talk about introspection, we have to spend quite some time into it. How do we introspect? Introspect is to think about it internally. Introspection is not to to be attracted to externalities. Introspection is to Introspect within, to think about it, to ponder about it with wisdom. So, it is very important that we have the right introspection. We could have the wrong introspection. If you introspect, think about something selfishly, egoistically, or you introspect with hatred, with greediness, with jealousy, then you're not introspecting right. You are using You are using the wrong introspection to think. So, in order to introspect, you must have the right introspection. And this right introspection is leading to nirvana. So, you need the right introspection, not a wrongful, selfish, egoistic introspection. 
and in the Sanskrit language, it, this right introspection is samprajnaya. So the right introspection means you have a clear and right understanding with full awareness of the mind. And then the second question is, yeah, I need to have the right understanding. But what is the right understanding? I need to know what is the right understanding. How do you introspect in, in, in your everyday introspection? Let's get into some psychology. You, we must know some, some, some psychology in order to, to carry on with Buddhism, some basic psychology. What are you using to think? What are you thinking? When you're thinking, you must have concepts in your mind, right? If you don't have concepts, even a selfish concept is a concept. I want to protect myself, I want to gain, I want all the material, I want fame, I want money, I want reputation. That is your wrongful conception, but it's still a concept. You need concepts to think. And how do you, where do you get the concepts? Your, your concepts, you acquire those concepts since birth. It based on your family background, based on how you grow up. And also some of these concepts were inherently passed from previous life to this life. And we call it karmic concepts, your karma. So you were born with concepts in your mind. Uh, some were concepts accumulated in this life, some were in previous life. So. The, Buddhist, the Buddha pointed out a lot of right concepts for us to introspect. If we have the wrong concepts, we say, don't use the wrong concept to introspect. Use the right concept to introspect. So what are, what are these right concepts? These right concepts are all contained in the Buddhist teaching. The Buddha brought out a lot of concepts and if we can categorize them, some are general concepts and some are specific concepts. General concepts, the Buddha called this concept prajna, prajna concepts. And what is prajna? Concepts of introspection, the Buddha said, use prajna. Prajna is what? Prajna is a state of pure consciousness that transcends worldly concepts or belief systems that might impede perfect wisdom. So if, if there are concepts that impede your perfect, that stop your perfect wisdom, that's not the right concept. If you have concepts of selfishness, egoist, egoist, is egoistic belief, that's not the right concepts. Or concepts of killing, lying, you know, you name them, a lot of wrong concepts. So this Prajna concept transcends the ordinary selfish concepts and it also transforms the tainted consciousness into ultimate understanding of the true nature of existence and reality. So prajna is required to attain enlightenment. So that's the reason why the right concept we call it sam prajnaya, You need the right concepts and specific concepts. And last time, we introduced some general concepts. So many concepts, the very general ones that you require, you need to know the threefold of existence, the fourfold of existence. And last time, we stopped, it, stopped at a very important general concept. We call it Paticca Samuppatta. Very important concept. Interdependent occurrence. Some people, some um, very knowledgeable monks uh, translate it in different ways. Some call it dependent origination, and some call it antecedental concurrence. Uh, but it's easier to, what is antecedental? It means one happened after another. One happened after another. Uh, all this change of, of arising is one happened after another, and uh, Zamapata means simultaneously. 
although one after another, some happen simultaneously. They're all interdependent. So one depends on the other. So maybe we can call it in simple English, interdependent occurrence. I almost want to use the word just dependent occurrence, but de dependence, dependence triggers something like control, like one depend on the other. So without me, you have to depend on me. There's a control into it. And the dependent is, is a mutual, mutuality, not one controlling the other. There's no control. It just happened, happened naturally. Everything depends on everything. And in, in the Sanskrit language is hate to pachaya. Hate to, if we can just translate it, some people don't like to kind of translate it that way, cost. Pachaya, necessary conditions. Hate to, in the Chinese language, yan. Pachaya, yun. Yan tong yun is very important. So, Paticca Samapata, interdependent occurrence, explain the cycle of our existence. How do we come to exist? How do we become what we are today? Where did we come from? How come we got born? So this is a very important general concept. So that's the reason why we have to study the Buddhist teaching, because we need good prajna to introspect. We already have studied how to focus how to pacify the mind, calm down the mind. But that's not, that's not the only thing. That's just the preliminary procedure. In other words, you need to stay put, calm down. The next is how to introspect. If you're successful in your final introspection, your complete understanding of the true nature of existence, you're on your way to wisdom. You're on your way to transcend samsara, so, without wisdom, you cannot get out of reincarnation. You cannot get out of life and death. So you need wisdom. So this is what we are studying. We want to, we want to spend some time in introspection because that's the most important. If you just come down, just coming down. You're not arriving at enlightenment. You're not going towards enlightenment. Now, we said, Paticca Samapata. This is a concept that you must be a hundred percent sure, a hundred percent thoroughly understanding it before you can introspect. Because you can apply this introspection to almost everything that you see, you feel, you touch, you hear, everything you can think of, you can apply this Paticca Samapata to it. So let's explore into it in detail. Looks very complicated, isn't it? It looks very complicated. Paticca Samapatta, interdependent occurrence. Where do we start? We've got to start at some point. It's like a loop. It's never ending loop. Like a windmill. Like a windmill. Where does it start? Where does it stop? Let's take a point and talk about it. The beginning is the end, the end is the beginning. In a windmill, what is the beginning? What's the point of beginning? The point of beginning is when it ends. There's no beginning, there's no end. A windmill. Do you remember that song, The Windmill of Your Mind? Windmill is, you can't find a point of beginning. You can't find a point of ending. But let's start with some point for the sake of talking about, about it. Let's start with this. Let's, let's start with here. A vidya in in Pali language is avidya, same in Sanskrit. Remember, Pali and Sanskrit, they're quite close, they're quite similar. What is avidya? Say ignorance. Ignorance, right? What is ignorance? Some very logical monks, like uh, Bantain Punachi, for example, I really respect that monk because he's very good at Pali. He, 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 won't, he did not translate it into ignorance. He translated it into insentience or mental unconsciousness. Because when you have avidya, ignorance, 
your state of mind, you're not in a rational thinking activity. You don't have any thinking activity in your state of mind. But you still have the emotional reaction in you that you're brought forward from previous life. You may have a little bit of thinking mind that you're brought forward from previous life. So we have to take an example to explain this. I started last time as when you were born as a baby. You were a baby. So you have to think in terms of an example in order to understand it. And that example, you really have to go back and think about it. This is a life cycle of, an, of, of a human. This is also the life cycle of a thought. Not just of a life cycle of a human, it is just a life cycle of the arising and the diminishing of a thought. So we use an example of, of you, of me, of a baby, right? You were in, we were inside the mother's embryo. Let's, let's visualize it again. You were so comfortable in your mother's embryo. You were so warm. You have food from your mom in a tube, you know, connected. You don't even have to breathe. Your mom breathed it for you when you are a little baby, when you are a little embryonic baby inside your mother's womb. Then you were not born yet. You were not born yet. And you were in, inside for 10 months, for example, in 10 months in, the, in your mother's womb. And, and then you come out. The mother went to the hospital, the doctor, and then you're coming out. When you come out, you don't know what's going on. You just come out. And that you don't know what's going on is that is what? Ignorance. That is mental unconsciousness. You, you just know that you are being pushed. Remember, you are being pushed to come out. You're not willing to come out. You don't have control. Can you control? Say, I don't want to come out. I'm comfortable in my mother's womb. You are being pushed to come out. And if your mother cannot push you out, the doctor is going to pull you out, or the doctor is going to dissect, is going to do an operation in your mother's belly, and then take you out. You may not want to come out. Actually, you don't want to come out. So when you come out, you don't know what you're doing. All of a sudden, you feel that there's air conditioning, you feel a little cold, because you were so warm in your mother's body, you feel cold, and then you're being touched by the doctor. You're being touched because your skin is so tender, your, 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 the atmosphere in your mother's womb is so warm. Now it is cold, you're being touched, you're being pushed. You don't like it. You don't like it. You dislike it. And then some baby automatically, when you dislike it, they, struck. they struggle and they cry. They don't know why they cry. They just don't feel comfortable. And then some baby don't even know how to cry. Some babies, they cannot. If, if the baby don't cry, if the baby don't do any breathing, the, day, the baby will be dead. The baby does not know how to breathe because inside the mom, he does not breathe or he, she does not breathe. So what the, what the doctor will do is turn the baby upside down and spank his button, button or spank her button. And then the baby feels painful. Once you feel painful, you dislike it. When you dislike it, you struggle, and then you cry. So we say, you are ignorant. You don't have any thinking activity at that time. You just come out, you are ignorant, you don't know what's going on. You don't even know you are in a hospital. You don't know, even know why you have to come out. It's just the calming energy brought you out. You know, you, all the necessary conditions exist to make you come out. If the necessary conditions do not exist, you cannot come out. Say, for example, somehow your mom make a mistake and you're already half dead. When you come, you're already dead. When you're being pushed, that just increase your, your, your pain and then you died. You cannot come out. So, you need all the necessary conditions for you to be born, all the necessary conditions. If these necessary conditions don't exist, you cannot come out. So our existence is based on what? All the necessary conditions. That's a very important word. 
necessary conditions. The whole system is based on necessary conditions. Hate to Pachaya, necessary conditions. You know. Then Avidya, you don't know. So you do, you, then I haven't explained it. I haven't, I haven't fully explained it yet. There's other questions that come up. I don't want to go into, I don't want to push myself too far, too, too fast into it. You should have a question. Why am I getting born? Why am I getting into my mom's body in the first place? Why do I have to be? Who is this that gets into my mom's body and become, become a baby? In other words, we've been talking about karma and rebirth. Am I re being born again? Why do I have to come to this world through my mother's womb? Have you ever questioned that? Have you questioned about the existence? Why you exist? How you exist? What are the reasons for you being exist? What's the difference between an animal and a human being? An animal just react. When the animal is hungry, he's looking for food. There's no food, the animal is going to kill each other for food. So the animal, the difference between an animal, the animal just exists, but the humans think about the meaning of existence, the value of existence, the reasons of existence, the how, the why, the when of existence. If you don't even think about that, what's the difference between an animal and a human being? Because a human being wants to know, or is trying to know, why exist. If you don't care about existence, you have, you have lived uh, a life that is ignorant because you don't care about it. Everyone here, you care. That's the reason why you come here, to learn about why we, why we exist. Why do we have avidya? Why do we have ignorance? So in order to know more, a little bit about avidya, we have to know about consciousness. Why are we conscious at all? Our consciousness is broken into, into, eight, into eight parts. Before we even go on, we stop at avidya. So we have, we have the body and the mind. The body is materiality. We call it rupa, the body, rupa. And the body is made up of molecules and cells and all that. And the mind is made up of four parts. Perception, mental construction, sensation, and feelings. All these will go through in Paticca Samapata. But at this point, you have to know, because you want to carry it a little further. Why do we get born? We have the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and we stop at here right now, the mind. Our mind actually is in three parts. The mano, that is the thinking mind. The manas emotional mind. Eight, the storage and the interaction house for all. When a person dies, there's no more vision. There's no more vision consciousness. There's no more auditory consciousness. The ears, when a person dies, you don't hear anything. When a person dies, there's no olfactory consciousness. The smelling. When a person dies, no taste. No tactile, no touch. But then you still have the mind, right? The, the thinking mind is the last to go, almost one of the last to go. But then the thinking mind also contains the emotional mind, which is the ego. So you have the thinking mind, which in the Pali language is the mano. You have the emotional mind, which in the Pali language is chitta. And then you also have the alaya mind, the alaya consciousness. The alaya consciousness, the Theravada school, they never mentioned that. The Theravada school only mentioned up to the six. In other words, eyes, ears, nose, taste, tactile, and mono. A Theravada school, they don't want to deal with such a complication. They, they stop at mono. So they don't explain manas and alaya. 
but the, the Mahayana, Nagarjuna, Masubandhu and Asanga, they go a little forward into, into more detail. And I'd like to introduce to you, not just the Theravada school, but also the Mahayana school, which is in a little bit more detail. The manas is the ego. When you were born as the baby, in, even inside your mother's womb, you already have that ego. You already have that ego in you. So that's the reason why every baby has, has different personalities. Some people are so mild and tender. Some, people are, some babies are so ferocious and so active. Each baby is, a little, is, is different at birth already. A liar consciousness is the storage of all the previous karmic energy into this life. So why would you get born? Because you're a liar, get born into the mother's womb. When a man and a woman, so to speak, comes together for the sperm and, 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 and the ovary to fuse, that, that karmic energy, that a liar flickers into it immediately. Because the liar is looking for related parties to be born. So, at that juncture, when, when it is fused, that a liar, a liar, I don't know how to call it, we call it consciousness, and yet consciousness is not the right word for it. It's just that consciousness, invisible consciousness, get born into the embryo. And why, why, why being the, the daughter and son of this couple? That could be the grandfather of previous lives, that could be many, many lives. That baby born in there must be a reason to be born in there. They all related could be. He's, he's, he's being born in order to repay, for example, the debts. Being born in order to get back what he wants. So every baby is a little different. The karmic energy is there already. So the ally consciousness zoom into the embryo before he was born. But that ally consciousness is what? It's just like a recording, a recording conscious, consciousness, a storage consciousness. If you're an accountant, then I'll give you an example. Because I was an accountant before, it's easy to give an accounting example. The ally consciousness is just like a general ledger. It recorded all the debit and the, and, and the credit. The debit of life, the credit of life. The liability is what you own. The receivable is what other people owe you. So, but the liar, liar consciousness, the general ledger does not matter. You just record into it, I just take the recording. I never judge, uh, how come this 50 cents is there? How come you wrote in the $60? How come you have $100? The accountant cannot question, hey, don't put, $60 in the bank account, the accountant just record. He never questioned each transaction. The transaction you have done, that could be an evil transaction, that could be a meritorious transaction, a beneficial transaction, a greedy transaction, a compassionate transaction. All these transactions recorded in that general ledger. You can't get away with it. Every thought is recorded. You think you can get away, you did something wrong, the police don't get you, you can get away with it? No. You cannot get away, even though, even though you intelligently um, fought the case and the judge say you're not guilty, but actually you were, you think, oh yeah, the judge thought that, the judge, you know, put a judgment that I'm not guilty. I know inside me, I'm guilty, but how come you, you know, okay, I'm just lucky. You can, you can get away with it? No. You can get away now. But it's recorded. You can get away. So be very careful about every thought, every action, every speech. You can get away. You do nothing but good, then good cause will come. You do nothing but bad, bad, bad effect will come. You can get away with it. 
So we have, remember, we have this, because in Avidya that we explain, you would ask, how come I get born into my, babe, in my mother's womb? Because the karmic energy pull you there, not God. Not God, no. Don't try to personify a God. The energy itself pull you to that party. The energy, your energy of richness pull you to a rich family. Your energy of poverty pull you to a poor family. Nobody else is making decision for you. So the Buddha said, be very careful with every thought. If it's being performed, it's too late. If it's spoken, it's too late. Starts from the thought. Purify your thought. That's why we have meditation. It comes from the thought. It's very important that you have to purify your thought. Don't germinate, don't cultivate any bad thought anymore. Every thought is a thought of compassion. Every thought is karutna. Every thought is buddhitta. Every thought is nothing but good. Then goodness will follow you. You don't think it's important? Starts from the thought, not action and speech. So every thought, but first of all, you have to know, oh, I have a thought of bad deeds come up. Then you have to know that that thought comes up, right? That belongs to pacification, stabilization. That belongs to, oh, a thought comes up, bad thought. I stopped it. Some people don't even know to stop it. A thought of gambling comes up. I'm passing a casino, I gotta go in. I know, I go, I know gambling is not right, but I have to go, I, gotta, I go in because I cannot stop myself from going in. A thought of drugs, intoxication, smoking comes up, I cannot stop it. I'm being attracted to it. So you, you have to know how to stop your bad thoughts and how to breathe good thoughts. That's stabilization. That's coming down the mind. So you must know how to stop bad thoughts first. And I'm assuming we all have learned that. We have all learned that, oh, this is a bad thought coming up. I got to stop it. Can you do that? Very difficult. Because you have been selfish since millions of years. Everything you do is for the benefit of, your, of yourself first. You could be compassionate, but there's a, second, there's a second citizen. You treat yourself in a way that enhances yourself. That's what we call a self. That's what we call a self. You have a self. We have an ego. And we brought that self-ego feeling life after life. That's avidya. That's avidya. Even the baby brought, you brought along with that, avidya. So let's get back to the origin of it. So our video, we start with no mental activity. As a baby, we have no control. Our calm energy pull us to this mom's womb and then we come out from the mom's womb and then we're ignorance. We're not in a state of thinking because I'm a, a baby, you know, it, it, a baby still have emotions. So the baby, the first thing that the baby does is what? Breathing, breathing. The baby has to breathe to be alive, right? The baby, in addition to breathing, is struggling and crying, right? And that's what? That's the second one. That's what? That is Zankara, initial mental construction. I don't like this cold around me. I don't like to be touched. I was quite warm before, now it's cold. I had to breathe now. What's going on? I don't know what's going on. So there's a mental construction. You have some mental construction. You also build up what? Build up sensation. Sensation, what is a sensation? A sensation of liking it, disliking it, 
It's pleasant, I like it. It's unpleasant, I don't like it. It could be neutral. So, Zankara, Zankara is a mental construction. You build it up immediately, initial mental, mental construction. And if it is the mental part, we call it Vedana Zana, it's a mental. Mental what? Mental means, is it pleasant? Is it unpleasant? Do I like it? If I don't like it, I cry. If I like it, I don't cry. Verbal? The crying itself is verbal. It's a verbal. And then anapana. Anapana is what? Anapana zati, right? Anapana is what? The breathing. The breathing itself. So that is zankara. And from being a baby, doing that, we we'll continue to develop ourselves. We we'll get in the, the vinana, nama rupa, and all those. We we just explain avijja, and we have begun to explain zankara as a baby. How do we react as a baby? And um, how do we react with with the mentality of it, with the word, verbal part of it, with the physical part of it? And if, 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 we, if we continue to ponder on it, on this cycle, gradually we come to an understanding that existence is a delusion. Our existence is a delusion. But we firmly grasp onto existence with a self, with an ego. And this grasping lead us to the cultivation of karmic energy. This karmic energy could be good, could be bad, but most of it is in the erroneous way. That's the reason why we suffer. Suffering comes. This explains why we have suffering, why we have unhappiness. Although we have temporary happiness, why do we have unhappiness? Why do we have suffering? How to get away from suffering? And getting away of suffering cannot be solved by just having more money. You think by having more money, then you can get away from suffering? When you don't have, they say, yes, I don't have any money now. I need more money. Money I have, I don't have any suffering. But when you have money, you still have, you still suffer. So that's avidya. Get that word in your mind, avidya, ignorance, mental unconsciousness. And you brought forward all your karmic energy. Your alaya consciousness is there. And when you have that body, you already have that mind of, you, of, of ego. You egotize everything, and some of you call it personalize everything. We personalize everything. We attach everything with, with an ego. And we explain all these things later, bit by bit. When you go home, don't, maybe I'll give this, I'll give this slide to you so that you can go home and think about it later. You know, you know, ponder on it and why we're going through life and death. Why we have samsara. Why do we have karmic birth and rebirth? And why do we think in certain way? and how to transcend this. The Buddha has found ways to transcend this. The Buddha, first of all, told us to understand this first, to understand why are we in samsara, and then attempt to transcend samsara. It's very rational. It's not about the religious personification of a god, no. Um, God is just a human concept. We're not denying that concept. We don't think that concept is evil, no. We're just a concept. Because humans are so insecure. Thousands of years ago when they were born, they were still hunting. And they were so insecure that they want, you know, something invisible for protection. That gave them security. 
But as this security, this search for security develop, it develops into religion that is utilized by people who are egoistic too. People who benefit from religion. And they set up a, 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 a taboo for it. It's a religion. They set up a religion concept. That God is in you. Everybody has that God. That God, if you can transcend ignorance, transcend avidya, you're, you're on your way to transcend life and death. That's exactly what the Buddha is talking about. Not many people are interested in this. What they're interested in? Money, fame, reputation, that's all. And then they roll into the next life again. It, 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 it takes wisdom to get into this. And some people live a hundred years, they even, even heard about this. They just die and take another life. Row on into a vidya, row on into this interdependent, interdependent occurrence. They row on this paticca samapata, never ending, like a windmill, never ending. Are you interested in ending all this? The Buddha said, stop this, samsara. Go on. Stop suffering. Not just for yourself. For all your folks. Tell them this is how to transcend suffering. The Buddhisattva said, I get out from this, but oh, I want all my folks to get out from this. I get out from jail. I'm okay. But then, I want everybody to get out from jail. You are free, but your folks are not free. You need them to go free too. This is exactly what the Buddha is doing. So today we continue with how to meditate and a brief review. Meditation, we use in and out breathing and we use the breath as the focus, as the object and reasons we already have explained in detail. And we say meditation is broken into two perspectives, two parts, stabilization, mental stabilization and people call it concentration. But the better word for it is stabilization. Because concentration is you deliberately concentrate on something. That's not what samatha means. Stabilization, and it also in, includes introspection, which is vipassana in the Sanskrit language. Stabilization and introspection. What is introspection? It's contemplating within. So stabilization, we say counting, following, and stabilization. We already have spent 16, 20, 20 hours on that. And we are now talking about introspection. And in introspection, we require a lot of explanation on it. Uh, because counting, following, and stabilization, uh, it seems that stabilization it's just monopolized by the Buddhist teaching. No, other religions are also talking about, are also practicing stabilization. The Christians, Roman Catholic, those hermits up in the mountain, they are doing meditation too. Meditation is not just for the Buddhists. Something is wrong. But it, other religions are also practicing meditation. And some of them have very high level of stabilization. So, um, the Buddhist or the Buddha didn't monopolize the, the idea of meditation, no. They are hermits, uh, they are the people who are living in uh, uh, reclusive areas, in, up in the mountains, they are really practicing well. But they may not be doing the same introspection as what the Buddha taught. Introspection could be different. And introspection is the wisdom area. You need both to attain enlightenment. And now we are in introspection. When we're talking about introspection, it's so 
multifaceted. It, 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 it includes so many subjects um, that, that is contained in the Buddhist Tupitaka, uh, the, and in the Buddhist teaching. Billions and billions of words in the Buddhist, in, in the Buddhist canons, in the Vinaya, in, um, uh, in Samatha, in Vipassana. Billions of words, it, it, especially the, the, the Chinese literature of Buddhism, it contains billions of words that if one wants to study more than a hundred years, you cannot finish studying it. Because for centuries, the, 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 the uh, uh, a Buddhist monks have been traveling to, to India, learn the Buddhist life, uh, the, the, the Buddhist sutras and brought them back. And they, they are the most, it contains the most resourceful, resourceful uh, information. Now getting to introspection, we say, introspection is very important because stabilization is stopping all the wandering thoughts and introspection is after stopping the wandering thoughts, then you have to increase the wisdom level in order to achieve further um, vipassana or furthering your samatha. Um, in some cases, when people are doing stabilization, you have to watch out. There's the dark side of meditation. Some people, if they don't know how to meditate, if they follow teachers that are just teaching from a book, teaching from a piece of paper, you could get, you could get into trouble. You could get into what we call Zen sickness. People usually don't mention that. If you, if you get too deep into it, don't try to be a meditation teacher that easily. You could lead people astray. When people get sick, can you, can you, do you have the experiences of healing them? Or you just teach from a book or teach from a tape? Don't do that. Because when people get into trouble, you must know what's the trouble, what's the Zen sickness. Most people, when you get into Zen sickness, they say, oh, you're not normal. Uh, this is not the place for you. Then you will be miserable. And uh, some people have kundalini awakening and they could get into suffering for 20 years, 25 years, 15 years. And if you don't have the right teacher, you could be in trouble. So always be very careful in doing stabilization and be very careful in introspection. Don't just, you think you can meditate from watching a video? What happened if you run into the problem? What happened if you run into the chi problem? where you have multiple headaches, depressions, anxiety, fear that nobody can talk to you about. You'll be suffering. So watch out. I'm telling you, watch out. All right? <laughs> it's, it's not that simple. All right, introspection. So we've been talking about introspection. And introspection, that means you always have to, th to think about certain concepts. What concepts do you apply to daily life. We call it the prajna, prajna wisdom, the concepts. And we've been talking on concepts, it's multivarious, it's various. So many of these uh, concepts that the Buddha introduced to us, you can get that from those concepts you can get nowadays because of the mass communications and mass media and internet, you can always get concepts. And sometimes they are right concepts, true concepts harmonious concepts. You can get them from internet, but make sure you choose the right one. And, and also, in the old days, only the teacher uh, taught you all these concepts by reading. But in these days, you don't really have to attend lectures and you may sometimes get the right concept from the internet. Just watch out. Uh, you have to thoroughly understand it. And we'll introduce a few general concepts and we haven't introduced the specific concepts. We, some general concepts you need to know in order to introspect, in order to, to, um, to elevate your wisdom level up to a level that you can attain enlightenment, up to a level that you can actually see through things, see, see things in reality. 
Don't get into delusive thinking. Don't be cheated by delus de delusive objects. That will, will when, in the process of studying, then you know what is right and what is wrong. Before you can concept conceptualize, before you introspect, you must know what is right and what is wrong. If you don't even know what right and wrong, then you could introspect the wrong, the wrong thing and you think this is right. For example, you think, okay, eating meat is right. We've been doing that all the time. Killing animals for food is right. We've been doing it all the time. So we're killing cows, we're killing pigs, we're killing chicken, we're killing ducks. But the Buddha said, no. Habitually, you have been do thinking in the wrong way. You should not inflict pain and suffering on animals just because you want a taste of flesh and blood. Don't kill animals for food. But people have been thinking in that way. That's just one example. So you have to know what is right and what is wrong. So we have been talking about the, the, the threefold uh, nature of the universe. What are this threefold nature of the universe, of, of the world? You have to remember uh, these concepts. And these are, these are the general concepts that you must remember. Last time, we have come to introduce uh, Paticca Samupatta. Uh, inter, uh, we call it interdependent occurrence. Some people call it dependent origination, the 12 links of dependent originations. And some, some monks translated it as antecedental concurrence. <laughs> it's very complicated. Uh, actually, um, it does not matter the, uh, the, uh, the word translation, get into the meaning of it. So last time, we stopped at a level where we say we'll explain ignorance, avidya, start from this. It's a chain, it's a chain of life and death. Start from avidya, which is ignorance or mental unconsciousness or no thinking. When a child is born, we explained it in details already, avidya, its mind is in the mind of no rational thinking activity, but there's still emotional reaction. The child still have emotional reaction when the child is born. We already have explained that. And then the, se the second antecedental uh, occurrence, pre the uh, avidya is antecedental occurrence. Then it fo then sankara follows. Sankara is it's uh, the mental construction in child, in, inside the baby's mind. The baby has mental constructions. Uh, we, we, the baby has Vedana san, Sana, uh, the, the, the mental part of the Sankara, and the uh, Vitaka Vichara, which is the verbal part, uh, the, uh, and, and also the uh, Anapana, which is the physical part. The breathing, the first Sankara, of a baby coming out from the mother's womb is breathing. That's the first thing you do, breathing. The child does not, the, the baby does not breathe in, inside the mother's womb. When it comes out, it starts to breathe. That's the first physical action. And then the child struggling and crying will be the verbal part. Mental, the baby, what, what is going on? The baby does not know what's going on. That's the zankara. The initial mental constructions inside the baby's mind. We use the baby as an example to explain this. How the baby was born, after his, uh, the baby was born, how, how did the baby react to externalities. And then the third is Vinayana. Vinayana is continual awareness of the baby, of the environments. The baby's eyes would see matters, the baby's ears would listen to sound, the baby's, um, uh, uh, the baby's nose would smell the milk or smell the environments, and the baby's tongue would taste the, the milk taste, and then body is to touch, and the baby have the brain to think about various things, initial mental constructions. So that's vinyana the vinana of the baby, or we call it the perception of the, the baby perceived too. Innocently, naively, the baby perceived. Uh, and then, at the same time, there's the fourth incident or occurrence is nama rupa. What is, what is rupa? 
Rupa is the mental images in your mind, Rupa. Nama is what? Names. The baby start to begin to identify names through interaction with mother or father or brother and sisters. The mother, when the mother give the baby milk, say this is milk for the baby. The baby, milk, milk, then the baby know what milk is. So there's Nama as the name. The baby begin, begin to identify certain things with names. This is milk, this is mom, this is dad, you know, this is brother, you know, this is um, a blanket, or this is a soft sucker, you know. So the baby start, as the baby is growing, start to identify everything with a name. And start to identify not just with the name, with the mental images in their mind, that experience. So that is Nama Rupa. So everybody knows things by names. So you think in terms of names. Name is a concept. You know all these names, otherwise you can't think about it. Thinking starts with name and, 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 and mental images. So that's just Nama Rupa, identification of names. And then next would be Sanyatana. Continue, the baby will continue, eyes interact with matters, would give visual consciousness, no, uh, ears listen to sound, would give auditory consciousness, nose, interact with smell would give olfactory consciousness, tongue would taste gustatory consciousness, body touch tactile consciousness, thought with cognition. Salyatana is the baby begin to cognize. To cognize is to, the, the, the perception is being further and deeper and deeper into, percep into the perception. We call it cognition. Cognition, to cognize something. To cognize something is to see, to hear, to listen, to taste, and to touch. And other than cognize, there's also a recognize. We call it a recognition or a recognition. We call it a re. What is a re? When a baby, when the baby sees the milk, then the milk tastes good. The, the, the milk is, is white. The milk is soft in a bottle, so he recognized the, 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 the milk, the bottle of milk as something soft, something tasty, something that he likes, so he recognized it. The first is a cognition, and then there's a recognition, recognize. You know what recognize is? He recognizes it by remembering it, put it in his memory chip. The baby's mind has memory. Put everything in the memory. Recognition. So the mom say, this is milk, this is a sucker. This is mom. And the baby remembers. When the baby sees the mother's face, the, the, the mother's smiling, and the baby starts to, to, to love the smile, to love the tender, uh, soft voice of the mom. So whenever the mom approaches, the baby feels happy because there's milk in place. That's the, that's the, the, the mother, mother's tender loving language, soft spoken language. So he recognized the mom as tender, as giving milk, you know, that pleasurable, something pleasurable. And maybe when the brother comes along, or when the cat and dog come along, the, the, the brother is not is slapping the baby's face, and, 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 and then the baby know when, when, when this brother comes, he's not giving, he's not giving me tend to loving care, and he starts to repulse the brother. So that is liking and disliking. That is attraction and repulsiveness. Attractiveness and repulsiveness. It's already been set up in the baby's mind. The baby loves and hates. <laughs> you already have that. Salyatana, what is perceived through the six. Zal means the six senses, the six sensory organs that is here, uh, Salyatana. So Avidya, we will start from here. Avidya give rise to Sankara. Avidya, Sankara, Sankara give rise to Vinana. Vinana give rise to Namarupa. Namarupa give rise to Salyatana. So there's a song that sings it out. 
avidya sankara sankara vinana they sing it out they actually they sing out it's a song singing out paticca samapatta it's life avidya sankara avidya sankara sankara vinana vinana nama rupa nama rupa sanyatana they, they, they compose a very lovely song to it and you get it from, from Google a lovely song of Paticca Samabhata. All right. So Sanayatanayatana. And then the next is Pasa. Pasa. Pasa is cognition when the six senses are experiencing environments to create mental images. Like I, what I said, the baby loves the mom's face, dislike the brother's face. When the baby, when the baby is hungry, the baby is ex ex expressing displeasure by crying. When the baby meets the mom's tender loving language or face, the baby smile. So there's a recognition. There's attractions to the baby. There's also repulsion to the baby. So attractiveness and repulsiveness already been set up in the baby's mind. And then, as the baby grows, there's more and more recognition. And this recognition also means that, for example, when you cognize something and you recognize something, next time when you come across it, you don't even have to think. You know how to react to it. For example, if I, if I, if I see a cup, my mom told me when I was a baby, this is a cup, a cup. So a cup contains water. And when I, the next time I see a cup of water, I already know this, water, this cup of water is for me to drink. So I've been told that this is a chair. And I, I, was sitting, I was sitting on it. The next time when I see a chair, I don't have to say, what is this chair for? I know this chair is for sitting. So that's a recognition. So you know what? You know the importance of education? Initial education is to educate. If the, the child received the right education, the child would be a good, responsible child. If the child is being ignored in the child's education, the child may not be a good citizen in the future. So it's education. Education from, from, the, from the cradle. As a matter of fact, not just from the cradle, from the mother's womb, there's already education. All right, so fast, pasta. Pasta will give rise to Vedana. Vedana means the baby have emotional feelings now. The baby, if it's something pleasant, the baby finds it pleasurable. If something unpleasant, the baby finds it unpleasurable. And there could be something neutral. So there's attraction, repulsion, repulsiveness, attractiveness. Okay, and as the baby grows, into a toddler, into you know, in, in uh, six, seven years old, it, the baby starts to have Vedanta and starts to build up Tangha. What is Tangha? Emotional reaction to feeling. The baby hates certain things, loves certain things. It builds up Tangha. Hate, love, tall, small, fat, thin, discrimination, stigmatization, labeling. Some babies are more compassionate than the others because it depends on how the parents teach the baby, teach, teach, teach the child. Some, some child are tender loving to everybody. Some child put up a defensive mechanism within them because they have been, maybe they have been attacked too much by externalities. So you have tang tangha, you have emotional reaction to feelings hate, dislike, all that. And then there's Upadanta. Upadanta is, needs a little bit of explanation. Personalization of subjective experiences. When, when we use our senses to interact with externalities, I see, ears listen, 
no smell, tongue taste, body touch, mind interact with all things that we are, we're thinking about. When we are doing that, just take an example. When we see something, there must be an object. And that object that you see, that your senses interact with, give you objective experience. And then you start to like or dislike because of this emotional feeling, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, you start to build up what? Subjective experiences. You try to alienate objective experiences and you try to personalize your subjective experiences, which is wrong, of course. How do you, how do you alienate objective experiences? The teenagers say, I hate this guy. I alienate this guy. I have racial discrimination. My mom said I shouldn't hate, I shouldn't love this kind of people. So I hate this kind of people. So he alienates, set up objective experience, he alienates this object. I like this, I don't like this. This is bad, this is good. And he starts to personalize things he likes. When you start to personalize, what do you do? You set up an ego. I love this, I hate this. We set up an ego. When you start to personalize, the moment you start to personalize, what do you do? When you start to personalize, all of a sudden, you have an I. This is mine. I like this. This is mine. You don't take it away. This is mine possession. You don't take it away. This is I. I want to be number one. I don't want you to be number one. I take this first. You step back. I, always I. The moment you, sp you personalize, you equalize, you say I. And when you say I, 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 mine, 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 then you start to think about when there's an I, when there's a mine, there must be an I and a, and, a, and a mind that you point to, that you identify, right? What is this I that you identify? What is this mind that you identify? There must be something, some object, then you identify find as I or mine. What is this object? That you, the moment you, you, you personalize it, you identify this object as I. What is this? If there's no object, how, how, what is your I, right? I, there's no object, then what is your I? You tell me. You identify this I as your body, as your self. A self, this is my self. A self, you have a self thinking. You have an ego thinking, you have a self thinking. This is a self. And what is your self make up of? The body and the mind. The body you're given by the, your mom, the mind is what you develop. Your mind is personalized, your body is objectively living in the changing situations. So what is your I? What is your mind? But you're still attached to this body as I. And when we, when we talk about a body, well, let's explore more about this body. What is this body? What is this body? This body, if there's any object in the world, if we identify an object as an object, in reality, we must say this object occupies space and time, right? Otherwise, what is an object? Is there any object that, that does not occupy space and time? You tell me. This occupies space and time. There's nothing, there's no object that does not occupy space and time. So you say this body occupies space and time, right? But then, let's analyze this body as an object that occupies time. Okay, then we, we analyze how it occupies space. What is the body occupies time? So what is time? What is time? 
Time is three-dimensional. The past, the future, and the present, right? Time is the past, the future, and the present. And then we say, what is the past? The past is already gone. You can't get yesterday back, can you? You can't even get last minute back. So time, the time of the past, you can't get it back. The time of the past only existed in the past. It does not exist now. Past does not exist. Past has no existence, but some people attach to past. That's why they agonize on something. That's why they get jealous on the past. That's why they get, they become happy when they think of the past, good times, and they become agonizing when they think of the past, bad times. But you're fooling yourself. The past is gone. The past does not exist. The past does not exist. Everybody knows. Then what's the future? The future hasn't come yet. You're worrying about your future. Tomorrow hasn't come. You think, you think tomorrow exists now? We must be a fool to think that tomorrow exists now. Now could be leading tomorrow, but tomorrow does not exist. So past is not existing. Future is not existing. Just in the most present. There's a present, right? Is there a present? The present of every minute becomes the past. One minute ago, when I uttered a sentence, it's already become a past. There's no present. Because the present is always ticking. Ticking to the past. So how can you say the present exists? So the past does not exist. The future does not exist. The present does not exist. Then what is time? Then your body does not exist. It's just a delusive existence. We are living in a dream of existence. But we attach to the body. We attach to the self. We struggle for it. We fight for it. We even die for it. And just to say a few more before we go for, lunch, before we go for lunch, what is in reality, in theory, we talk about it. Your past is when you were a baby. Your past when you were in the mother's womb and then when you got born, okay, you recognize that as your first dropping into this world. Your past is when you get born as a baby. There's birth. What is your future? What is your future? Your future is when you are living in the future is when you are lying down in ocean view, eight feet under the ground. That is called death. That's your future. That's our future. Your future is death. So your past is birth, your future is death. And what is the present? For sure, you know what the present is. Your present is aging every day. Is anybody in here who is not aging? Are you getting younger and younger every day? Your present is a aging. So what's the meaning of this self that you personalize? Yes, past is birth, future is death, present is aging. And you, think, you still hang on to this, what you call happiness? You still hang on to, to, to this looking for fame and reputation and money and, 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 and sacrificing other people's interests at other people's expense to better yourself, selfishly doing things that you are bettering yourself and think you, you grow from it, you get happy from it. That's time. But how about space? What does the body occupy space, right? What is, what is space? Space is the length, the breadth, the height, and the weight, right? What is your height? All right, you're six feet, for example. What is your breadth? When you're not obese, you're just about two feet, right? <laughs> your, your, your breath 
And what is your weight? You know what your weight is. But your breath, your width, your weight is changing every second. It does not stay. Every seven days, you have more or less a major change in your body cells. Every second inside your body is changing with movement, with breath, with blood. You don't have a real self because anything that is real and permanently exists will never die out. But your existence is just in a process of change. You never exist as an eternity. You only exist as a master of body, bodily organs. You don't have a, a, an eternity. You don't have a permanent object that you call a self. You only delus delusively identify your body as a self. Because we identify our body as a self, we got into trouble. Because we identify our body as a self, then we have aging and birth and suffering. It's only when we get rid of self, no self, that you are free from suffering. That is exactly what the Buddha was talking about. When you have Ubadana, you have personalization, and then mental creation of a delusive self, Bhava, and then you have birth, you have death, Jara, Marana, and that's your cycle. When you die, what happened? You carry your karma to roll into the next round of incarnation again. This lifetime you are, you are John, in your next lifetime, you could be Jeanette. You could be, I don't know, William, Bill, <laughs> you know, every, every process. You are going through this process for billions of reincarnations. You haven't gone out from life and death. The Buddha said, you can get out from it. You created your own suffering. When you know that you're living in a delusive dream of existence, you begin to get enlightenment. A majority of the people, they're always in a self, selfish, egoistic perspective that bound them with sufferings. It's easy to talk about it, but it's very difficult really to get enlightened from this concept. It's just that when we, when we meditate, we say, used to be many, many years ago, I said, everybody, when you meditate, I said, everybody, when, before you meditate, close your eyes, and I'm giving you something. Hold out your hands, so everybody hold out his hands. I'll give you a bag, a garbage bag. Close your eyes, I give you a garbage bag. In this hall, I say, close your eyes, I give you a garbage bag. And what you do is, before you meditate, before you meditate, dump all your mental garbage into that bag. You visualize that you're dumping, dumping your, your, your depression, your hatred, your love, your greediness, your selfishness. Dump all these things into that bag, seal it up and throw it out that door, those doors. That's the reason why I have so many doors for you. You see, one, two, three, four, five, six doors. You know why? We deliberately build six doors so that you can throw out all this garbage out of that door, of all of those six doors. You don't need this selfish garbage in your mind that brings us all the suffering. And then usually some people will ask later, so what do we do with this garbage back later? We're, in, we're living in a friendly environmentally friendly environment. You are polluting this outside the door. And I said, you don't worry about it because you will automatically pick it up when you leave. You'll pick up your depression again. you pick up your anxiety again. you pick up your worry again. you pick up your jealousy again. It's easy to talk about it, but difficult to achieve and practice. So I never worry about those garbage jamming my doors. You will for sure. Pick up your jealousy, your hatred, your, 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 yourself, automatically. So I finished this. Patisha Samapata. I don't have to. I usually spend days on this. We'll talk about something else. And we'll, right now, we're talking about concepts for introspection. And I'm only bringing out some general concepts. 
And then, of course, there's a specific concept. You need to put all these concepts together when you are doing your introspection, when you're doing your thinking. If you don't have concepts, how can you think? When you're sitting in there, meditation, you don't have a concept? There must become some concept in your mind to think about, to bring forward the prajna, the wisdom. And then you use this wisdom to tackle your problems, to give you the enlightenment, the insight to tackle all these problems and suffering, dissipate these sufferings, all by your mental visualization, by your introspection. That's why we're meditating. Meditating is not just sit there doing nothing. You have to do introspection with all these necessary, wise concepts as spoken and introduced by the Buddha. Today, we continue with um, how to meditate. And we've been talking on how to meditate uh, based on two perspectives. Meditation consists of stabilization and introspection. And um, just about two weeks ago, we have taken a leave of absence for about two, three weeks. And now, probably some people may have forgotten what we've been talking about. We use the breath as the object of the meditation. You have to use something to focus on. Um, we've been using the breath, the in and out breath. What is about the closest to you, the closest action to you, your bodily action is not how you move around. It's the air inside of you. That's the most crucial, the most vital, the, the most akin to you, and the most noticeable to you, or the most unnoticeable to you. But it's always been an activity in the body. And this activity is always continuous. It cannot stop. This is a non-stop activity. You may not realize it. If it stops for five minutes, <laughs> your body won't work out again. So why are we not using others? The Buddha suggested to us that we should use the breath. Um, some people use a candle flame. Some people use a koan. Some people use a sentence. Some people use, I don't know, they use different ways to, to do meditation. But the Buddha suggested to us, use the breath. What is stabilization and what is introspection? So stabilization, some people translate it as concentration. And introspection, some people translate it as what? Some people translate it as contemplation. But contemplation is not as appropriate a translation as introspection because introspection gives you the, the, the meaning that you have to look within. Intro. Intro, you have to look within. You don't look out. As a matter of fact, you don't attach to outside because contemplation could be using the outside externalities to help your contemplation. But in this case, is you let go of all these to so introspect. So Sanskrit is vipassana, vipassana. So in stabilization, we say we use three methods, counting, following, and stabilization. Counting is counting your breath. You're counting your breath from one to 10, one to 10, to focus to concentrate on the counting, then you get rid of all these desultory thoughts, wandering thoughts. And if you are successful in counting, automatically you will feel that counting is a coarse activity. Counting is impeding my peacefulness. I want to relinquish the counting because the counting is not subtle. The counting becomes a hindrance. I want to get rid of counting. 
I want to get rid of this course activity. I want to go into following now. I don't want to count. I just want to follow the breath. So you follow the breath in, you follow the breath out. And in the process of following it, you are fencing off all these wandering thoughts. And you follow and follow until you, your breath is getting subtle, more subtle, more peaceful. And then you come to a stabilization where your mind actually calm down, your body actually relaxes, then you come to a stabilization. And that's the purpose of stabilization. And then after stabilization, calming yourself down, calm down the mind and relax the body is not enough. You automatically will know that it's not enough. I have already calmed down my mind, I already have relaxed my body, but that's not enough. It seems that, where am I going from here? Where am I going? Then, then you start to what? You start to think about, where are you going? And then you start to build up with bazana, introspection. Um, why am I doing this? And what is the, the value of life? Why is the universe like this? Where do I come from? All, this, all these questions, all this investigation and analysis that requires wisdom need introspection to unravel it, to unravel all these mysteries of life. Because just to stabilize yourself is not enough. To get to the threshold of human wisdom, not to say the beyond, the transcendental wisdom, you need to know a lot more about life. An introspection is the point where we stopped last time. An introspection requires a lot of time to explain it. All the canons of Buddhism, the Silla, the um, Samadhi and the Vibhisana, all the canons, all the Tupitaka is talking about introspection. And introspection requires a lot of words, a lot of concepts to help you in the introspection. We all think in terms of concepts, right? If we, have to, if we don't have concept in our mind, we cannot think. Name is a concept. Language is a concept. We, we, we think, we analyze, we investigate with concepts. So we need the right concept to work with. If we use the wrong concept, we're in trouble. The concept of selfishness, the concept of ego, the concept of greediness, the concepts of profiteering, the concepts of gambling, intoxication. We need the right concepts. If you, if you use the wrong concept, you're going in the wrong way. And many people use the wrong concepts. That's why, that's why we're going in the wrong way. So the Buddha said, introspection is, first of all, you need the right concept to work in your introspection. And, the, uh, and in, in the Pali language, it's what? Samaditti. In the Chinese language, is Zheng Ji Jian, Jing Ji Gin. Introspection, you need the right concepts. Well, where are these concepts then? The Buddha brought, introduced these concepts for 49 years according to the history of mankind. For 49 years, the Buddha have been going around the country in India nonstop every day for 49 years just to, to, to bring about all these concepts to mankind, to gear them towards enlightenment, to gear them towards the right view, the right understanding, the right concentration, the right stabilization, the right introspection. Are you listening? Have you been reading about them? Nowadays, it's easy to, to get into some of these right to get into the right concepts. Previously, we can only get them from books. 
So I always said that learning has become an easier process nowadays than in the ancient days. I remember before I, before I learned how to use the website, the internet, for every concept that I'm about to learn, I'm about to, to, uh, to talk about, I have to dig into books. So I lay a very lo a long table, a six feet desk, and then I lay all the books in there, dictionary on one hand, you know, explanation on the other hand, and then I have to, you know, put a book bookmark there and here and there, and then I forgot where the bookmark is. It's just been very, it's been a difficult task. And nowadays, you can just, just access the internet with a lot of right concepts, a lot of wrong concepts too, maybe more wrong concepts than right concepts. So you have to know what are the right concepts, what are the bad, what are the, what are the, what are the wrong concepts. All right, let's get to the next one. I'm, I'm just doing a summary now. I, in order to, to regurgitate on what I was talking about, to repeat on what I'm talking about. So we say we have to cultivate introspection. The right introspection leads to nirvana. And the right introspection, Sanskrit language is samprajnaya. Yeah. Means clear and right understanding, clear and right knowing with full awareness and introspection. And the concept of introspection, if, if it's the right concept, is prajna. It's a state of pure consciousness. Now these understanding, this concept should transcend worldly concepts or belief systems that impede, that might impede perfect wisdom. Worldly concepts impede wisdom. Many, many of the worldly concepts. For example, the concepts of racism, the concepts of profiteering, the concepts of, of the ego. General concepts, specific concepts, many of the world's general and specific concepts are striving towards destruction of mankind. You know about that. That's the reason why we have wars, we have co wars, financial war, physical wars, genocide, all kinds of worldly concepts. And prajna, the Buddha's uh, prajna, the concept is to transcend all these because all these impede wisdom. There's a general, a general a general understanding of this concept. And then maybe let's have a more specific understanding. Transform the three parts of temporal consciousness, the perception part, the thinking part, and the emotional part into ultimate introspection of true nature of existence, into wisdom, let's put it this way. To transform your perception, banana in Pali language, of which nana in, in, in the central language. Uh, the perception transform your thinking, your mano, which nana, and the emotion, the chitta, into what? Into prajna. Transformation of the three parts of, of, of mentality into, into enlightenment, into prajna. Do you know that our mind is in three parts? The perception part the rational thinking part, and the emotional part. The perception part of the mind. Your eyes, your ears, your nose, the tongue, the body, the five senses. Don't you have the five senses? The perception, you perceive the world, externalities, with these five senses. And plus, there's a sixth sense, which is the mano. The mano is sort of a thinking one that more or less rationalize your perceptions, guiding all these all this sensory organs. For example, if your eyes see red, the mind will say, eyes, that's red. If your nose smells something nice, the, 
the, the, the mana was that, oh, yeah, this is a flower. This is, uh, this is something good, a fragrant. Oh, this is, this is um, uh, uh, a terrible smell. But you need the mana to guide it. Oh, this is fire. You don't touch it. You see fire, you don't touch it. So the mano is more, more or less the learning part, the thinking part, or more or less the rational part, guiding your perception to secure your body, your physical body, and your mentality in place, more or less. And then there's also the emotional part, which contains all our emotions, our ego, our greediness, our jealousy, our hatred. Oh, you name them. So basically, the perception and the thinking is on the one hand, on the one part, if I, if I can streamline three into two, one is the, the mono part, which contains the perception, and the other is what? Is the emotional part, which is called a chitta. And these two minds are controlling our mind, our parts are controlling our mind. And they are what? They are going in a different direction. The emotional mind always brings out these emotions in you. Because suffering, make, make a lot of sufferings out. They are like a tug of, they are like at a tug of war, one pulling against each other. And you know which side is always winning? It's the emotional part that's always winning. Your emotional part always dominate your thinking part. That's why you are angry. You're jealous. You get wild. You break down your temper. You have a tantrum. You're greedy. That's why the emotional part is always in control. But it's the thinking part that performs the action. So poor humans we are. We're always going into suffering because our emotional part is always more or less control the thinking part. And why are we doing all this meditation? We're telling the thinking part, say, hey, reinforce yourself. You don't have to listen to the emotional part all the time. Build up your strength. You can overcome that. Why are you always subduing yourself? You are the slave of the emotional master. You can stand up against it. Train your thinking part. Turn your thinking part into wisdom. Turn your thinking part from conceptual misunderstanding into prajna. We call it samaditi, wisdom. That's what we've been thinking. That's what, that's what we've been doing. Why are we coming here on a Saturday morning? Yeah, you could have gone to, you have to go, could have gone to, I don't know where you are, partying, running, jogging, I don't know, drinking. But you're not, you have chosen, your thinking part has chosen to come here to receive training so that you're not slave to your emotional part. We've been slave to our emotional part. If you're not, you won't get angry. If you're not, you won't be jealous. If you're not, you won't, you won't, you won't have hatred. Such introspection is prajna, which needs to attain enlightenment. So we already have explained introspection. You need the right introspection. You need to learn it, in other words. Learn the right inspection. So we need concepts, Buddhist concepts. What are these concepts? They're all in sutras. They're all in epidharma. They're all in what the Buddha have been talking about. They are all in the, the Buddha's teaching. Mm -hmm. And it, it contains so much concepts that, where do we start? We start with general concepts and specific concepts. I've been trying to learn these concepts for 50 years, and I'm still learning it. But in some general, you need some general concepts and some specific concepts, and you need to know which are easier for me? Which are the most appropriate to me? 
um, which I understand better. You don't need to you don't need to learn all the concepts that the Buddha had been talking about. You have to pick and choose the ones that sufficient. Oh, I've learned all this. Learning is a lifetime process. You continue to learn. But you cannot be a professional student all the time. I have seen in universities that there's some guys, some girls, they spend 50 years in university, a BA, and then an MBA, a master, and then a PhD. They want a two gap PhD, and we add those number of years together, it's 25 years. They are professional students for 25 years. They started to be a, a university student at the age of 20, plus another 25 years is 45 years. 45 years, they forgot about, oh, do I need to work? No, my dad supports me. So they are professional students. They're always learning, and they don't apply what they learn to practice. So what you need is, you learn, learn enough concepts, you have enough tools to work, you need to work. It's just like I told one of my, one of my colleagues, I like carpentry. I work with carpenters. And in carpentry, there's so many tools. Do you need all the tools in the world to make carpentry? You need all those basic tools to work with carpentry, and that's enough. Every day they are creating new tools. Every day they're creating new planes. I've heard that Concorde, in a number of years, will, take, will fly you from Hong Kong to, to Vancouver in five hours. Do I have to wait? No, oh, I'm not going to wait. 12 hours, 13 hours is okay for me now. I need to go now. You don't need all the concepts. You don't need to learn all the concepts to introspect. So that's the reason why we need to pick and choose. And uh, let me give you one more example. A guy who has never tasted, um, who had never tried the taste of water, of seawater, ocean water. He never have drunk, he never had zip any ocean water and he asked, what's the, what's the taste of the ocean water? The guy said, ocean water is a huge ocean. Do I need to drink up the whole ocean to know the taste of water? Oh, you are stupid. Just scoop up a cup. Scoop up a cup and taste the water. That's the ocean water. You don't need to drink the whole ocean. Do you need to drink the, to drink the, to the whole ocean to get a taste of the water? You don't need to learn every concept that the Buddha was talking about to know Buddhism. You gotta pick and choose the right ones. I've talked about the four seals of the Buddha, of the Dharma, the four seals of the, of the Dharma. One of the four seals of the Dharma, introspection uh, of dependent origination, Paticca Sambhapata, the no, I haven't talked about the Noble Eightfold Ways. I haven't talked about the Four Foundations of Introspection. I've just talked about the Four Seals of the Dharma. And I have spent a lot of time on Paticca Sambhapata. And I think I, it's important that I spend some time on introspection because I need to bring out some concepts so that you know those concepts. Enough concepts that you can work on. In other words, to, be, to do a good carpentry, you need the tools, but you don't need the whole tools in the world, but you need some basic tools. When you have some basic tools, you know how to do it. Patichu Samapata. I've explained Patichu Samapata. And in the next session, I will be going into Noble Eightfold Path. I learned the Noble Eightfold Path in the first three years uh, of learning Buddhism. And I found that now, I haven't actually learned them. Because most people want to explain the Lobo Eightfold Path, they just bring out the words and hurry with the introduction, with, with, with explanation and that's it. I think every day, I learn something new in the Lobo Eightfold Path. As I age, as I get mature, 
my interpretation of the Noble Eightfold Path now is a lot different from when I first learned the Eightfold Path. Because I'm putting a lot I'm more and more in, in depth into my understanding. Uh, life is delusion of our dream. We're living in a dream of existence. Actually, we are living in a dream of existence. We don't have a self. We call this self as a self, but it's a delusion. But you won't believe it. This is myself. Why is there a delusion? It's very difficult. Because when you really know there's no self, you have to put yourself in the perspective of sunyata to understand it. It's not, it's not just simply to understand the words. You have to get into, what do you call it, the essence of it, to understand it. And more than that, you have to ground it. You have to, you have to make sure that it is intrinsic in your understanding to know. Introspection of dependent origination. What's the main point? The main point in, introspect, in dependent origination of Paticca Samapata is everything happened when all the necessary conditions are there. All things are based on because of all the necessary conditions. Yesterday, not yesterday, two days, a few days ago, there was a question come up that I haven't got time to answer. And the question is, where do we come from? Why do I get born into this world? Where do I come from? And I know that I have to use Patichu Samapato to explain it. But on second thought, I sh because explaining, explaining where do we come from, how do we get burned, what is the first cause, and uh, you know, uh, 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 did I appear in this life or in previous life, etc., etc. If I use Patichu Samapata, it would take me six hours to explain. How can I answer a question in six hours? So it was really bordering my mind at that time. You may not see it when I'm answering it. Actually, my mind is working. Gee, I have so much to say. I don't know where, I don't know where to, I, I don't know where to explain it first. I have so much to say. I don't know how to say it. But then yesterday when I think back, I should have given an answer like this, not using Patish Samapata. You come from where the conditions arise, and you will end where the conditions end. Where all the necessary conditions are there, you were born. When conditions are not there, you're not born. What, what does that mean? Because they always want to find the first cause. What's the first reason? What is the first condition? What is the first cause that brings me to here? There's no, it, it, it's, there's no such thing as the first of the original condition or the cause. You know why? Let me ask you a question. What are the conditions that bring you here? Can you identify a first condition? The fact that you are here today is because of what? Maybe I can name a few conditions. I can, I can, I can name thousands of conditions that you are here today, that thousands of conditions that are necessary to materialize your presence here today, thousands or maybe unlimited. Your car didn't broke down, you woke up in the morning in time, and you like the temple, the temple organized this lecture, the temple organized this meditation, and um, You are healthy. You are in this world. What else? You're living close by. What else? The weather is nice. What else? I can think of unlimited number of reasons why you're here today. If one of these reasons impede you for coming here, you're not coming here. For example, your car broke down. Then your presence here is not materialized. So you're asking me, what's the reason for your presence in here today, how can I tell you? Unlimited number of reasons. 
How can I tell you? Can you identify one reason? No. One condition? No. There are people who came here in the first hour, and they're gone in this, in this particular hour that I'm talking about this. So there, they don't have the necessary conditions that mature, that allow them to stay to listen to this lecture. So how can I tell you the first cause? There isn't the first cause. The first cause is because of the first cause. That's the reason why what is Patichi Samapata? Antecedental interdependent occurrence. One happened another. One, hap one happened after another. Which one is it, it's, it's the first cause? No first cause. Can, can you tell me the first cause? of just your presence in here. Let's narrow down the discussion. Your presence here, there must be some, a lot of reasons, a lot of conditions. What's the original condition? You like this temple? No. You like this temple. If this temple doesn't exist, you don't even create the liking. So, you cannot identify the first cause. But does that mean that you don't, you're not here today? I cannot identify a first cause for my presence to, to, to here today. Therefore, I'm not present. I'm here, but I'm not present. Can you say that? You're delusively present in here. Because we're all in the dream of existence. But, that being said, we still have to talk about conditions, right? We still, conditions can be like, the closest conditions, yes. The remote conditions, yes. Uh, the more akin conditions, yes. So the Buddha still gives some characteristics of conditions. Nagarjuna analyzed conditions. Uh, the, the later philosophers, 500 years later, analyzed these conditions into a few remote, akin, close conditions, main conditions, and less, less, uh, less important conditions. There's a direct condition, direct cause, more direct. As a matter of fact, classifying this direction according to, based on these characteristics, is not the most appropriate, but we, it, for the sake of some people like to classify things. Direct cause. What is the direct? Say, your presence here, what is the direct cause? The, maybe, maybe the direct cause, it's you have the energy of looking for enlightenment. Because that's actually the direct cause. If I'm not, I, if I'm not interested in enlightenment, if, if I'm not interested from getting away from suffering, if I'm not interested in knowing more, in learning more wisdom, then you won't come. In spite of your health, good health, your car, everything, if you don't have that. So you must have a direct cause, more direct than the others. And also, that's the, that's the, the first classification of a cause. The second, cause for uninterrupted succession. That means, that means there must be, it is an antecedental cause. For example, you're driving on the road, coming to the temple. There was a traffic accident in front of you. Your car is being blocked up there for two hours. You can't move. So it does not matter what happened to you, you can't come to the temple. So there is certain antecedental, that happened before, that did not happen before, that led you to what is happening now. So in other words, if, I, if my mind has a thought that is dominating me, and then I have another thought that comes up, that dominating thought must make way for my second thought to come up, right? A thought must go away before my second thought comes up, right? If that thought is occupying my mind, how can a, a second thought come up? The first thought has to make way for the second thought. The second thought has to make way for the, for the third, for the fourth, for the fifth. It, so that's the reason why thoughts are like lightning. 
thought runs speedily. Thoughts travel faster than light. You think light travels fast? Light travels fast. The speed of light. But thought is even faster. You may not realize it. Some thoughts come slowly, but then actually a thought may have 1,000 flickering of thought in there, if we can analyze it. Some psychologists could tell you how thought you off quicker than light, lightning. So, but the first thought must go away before the second thought comes up. That's what we call antecedental. And then the third kind of, 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 of a cause is the object. That applies to the eyes. There must be an object for the eyes. There must be a sound for the ears. There must be a taste for the bud, for the taste buds. The object, there must be the object. And then, other than these three, all the other uh, ancillary conditions, all the other conditions that help you to fulfill, to, to fulfill what you want to fulfill, to come here, are all the other causes. And it says there's no other causes. That, that comprise, that comprises all the causes. The direct cause, antecedental cause, the object, and all others. A very clever interpretation. He does not want to go into detail. He just say, all these others that don't fit into these three will be incendiary causes, incendiary conditions. There's no, there's no fifth. There's no other cause. You need a lot of conditions for certain things to happen. Just for the eyes to see, you need 10 conditions, roughly. How can you not appreciate your eyes? How can you not appreciate your nose? How can you not appreciate your body, appreciate your tongue? Some people say, I want to give up my life. I want to commit suicide. Jeez. We should all appreciate what we've got. Our eyes. We need 10 conditions for the eyes to function. We need nine conditions for the ears to listen. And you are destroying them? Let's bring this to those people who are suffering them from depression and who said, I want to commit suicide. The fact that your body exists depends on a lot of conditions. Why do you want to annihilate, eliminate those conditions that help you to exist? We've been saying that, what is meditation? People like to, to know what is yoga, what is meditation, what is meditation all about? Um, meditation is in two parts. In other words, look at meditation from two perspectives. One is the samatha part. The other is the vipassana part. That's in, that's in, the, in the Sanskrit language or the Pali language. In common English, the sum of the part is calming the mind, calming the mind, or let the mind come to a stabilization, tranquilize the mind. Uh, let the, ma the mind calm down. Our mind has not been calming down. Our mind's always going all over the place, thinking about various things. Our, our thoughts are nonstop. That brings us a lot of suffering. Our thoughts of all, have always been out of control. So the Buddha said, first of all, is to calm down the mind. Calming the mind down is not sufficient to get onto an enlightenment. You also have to carry out vipassana, which is, in the coming English language, is introspection. 
So other than just coming up, coming down the mind, you also need to raise your wisdom. You you, you need to uh, introspectively think about all these various truth or untruth or all these questions in your mind that you haven't resolved or other than coming down, down the mind you have to find out what is this mind that I have uh, in the first place why did my mind always wandering in different directions why are, why are my emotions out of control what is this universe like what is a being what is to have or to be all these various questions unresolved questions in your mind or when you are introspecting you need to to build up some wisdom you need to have the right concepts to conceptualize what you're thinking in other words other than coming down your mind you need some concepts to guide you to enlightenment because everybody's mind is conducted in thinking about concepts we conceptualize everything some people since birth have wrong conceptualization the concepts of being selfish the concept of misunderstanding the concept of greediness the concepts of hatred fear all these concepts have been guiding us in the wrong way the buddha told us introduce us to all the right concepts to use when you are doing insightful meditation other than just calming down your mind you need insights insightful meditation we call it vipassana to guide to conceptualize your thinking nobody can think without concepts right but it's very important that we have the right concepts where do we get the right concepts the Buddha's teaching contain oh, various concepts. It's like an ocean of concepts in, all, in, in the three Tripitaka, the three canons of Buddhism. The Vinaya, the Samadhi, and the Vipassana, the Prajna, or the Panya in, in the Pali language, which we, in common in coming English, is Silla or morality. Um, uh, people like to use concentration. Third, wisdom. You need to write concepts to guide the mind. And we've been talking about these concepts. Without concepts, you cannot think. We, we need these concepts. And these concepts, you have to learn about them. So we have been learning, we have been learning some basic concepts like these. The four, the four seals of the Buddha. The four seals of the Buddha. Paticca Samuppatta. And these are the very important basic concepts that we must have in order to, in order to visualize, in order to conceptualize. For example, the four seals of the Dharma. What are the four seals of the Dharma? We have to know the four seals, impermanence, suffering, and non-self, and nirvana. Those are the four seals. What is impermanence? All phenomena, the Buddha told us, arise dependent on conditions. What is dependent on conditions is unstable, imperfect, is always subject to changes. Everything is therefore impermanent. Constant changeability is a characteristic of existence. Changes all the time. Everything is impermanent. Don't try to hold things as permanent. Subconsciously, we want to hold everything as permanence that brings us suffering. We want to keep, we want to keep a relationship permanent. We want to keep wealth permanent. We want to keep everything permanent. And that brings sufferings. We want to think that life is permanent. Nobody think of dying. Nobody think of dying tomorrow. But who can guarantee that one is not dying tomorrow? We don't know. So impermanence, second is suffering. What is impermanent is insecure. 
Phenomena that are insecure are against our desires and will. Impermanence brings about suffering, such as what is impermanence? Aging, sickness, and death. That makes us unhappy. How can anyone be happy if one is always confronted with impermanence, aging, and sickness? We're not. We're not pessimistic. That's the truth. Who can escape? Who can escape aging? Who can escape death? Nobody can. But in spite of all this, all this suffering, we're still sensually looking for pleasures, and that is not happiness. That is just a temporary, sensual pleasures. All right. The third is non-self. Impermanence and suffering are not under our control. What is not under our control does not belong to us. And it's not mine. The body that I call I or myself is only a delusive existence. We already have spent many hours of explaining why we are only living in the dream of existence. We think we exist as an ego, a self exists, but we don't. We don't exist. So that's the four seals of the Buddha of 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 the Dharma. And then, also, uh, we explain Paticca Samuppatta in detail. Paticca Samuppatta, and Paticca Samuppatta is a concept that explains life and death. And we started with avidya, which is ignorance, because we have ignorance. We, have, we study from a baby of ignorance, state of no rational thinking activities, emotional reaction, and then we have zankara. Sankara, which is uh, initial mental constructions, we have the mental part, the verbal part, and the physical part. Sankara, and then we go on to Vinyana, which is the initial awareness. Uh, we have eyes interact with matters, ears interact with sound, nose with smell, tongue with taste, body with touch, and brain with thoughts, and then. The baby began to learn nama rupa, which means that identification of everything by names, by visualization, by concepts, and then as we grow older, we have salayatana, which is um, all the sensual pleasures, visual consciousness, auditory consciousness, olfactory consciousness, gustatory consciousness, and tactile consciousness. We already have explained all that, and then. We get into into uh, pasa. This is this pasa. We're in the pasa. Pasa is cognition when the six senses are experiencing environments to create mental images. We have what we call cognition, and then recognitions. Some people call recognition recognitions. We cognize something. We recognize and put it in our memory. And from our memory, we have a whole file of memory. And whatever in the future, what, what we're experiencing, we always bring back memories and compare and contrast and label and stereotype. And that's the problem. And when we're labeling, we have Vedanta, which give us feelings of pleasantness, unpleasantness, and neutral. And then we have Tangha. Tangha, Tangha is emotional reaction to feelings, Tangha, and then we have Upadanta, which is personalization of the subjective experiences that we have, and reaction with manas, egoistic our egoistic citta. That is Upadanta. Upadanta, remember, whatever experiences we have is classified into into what objective experience and subjective experiences. Uh, We alienate objective experiences, and we personalize subjective experiences. Everything we personalize, um, and when we personalize, sufferings come. And then we have bhava, bhava, which is mental creation of a of a delusive self. We always think in terms of an ego. We have a self. Who have I? And we've spent hours talking about we don't have an I. The I is what is I? I what is I? I is the body occupying space, 
the mentality occupying the time as past, present, and future. And we have analyzed it in detail that no time exists, no space exists. How, how can the I exist? Okay, and then jati, which is a birth or reincarnation. And then we go back to jara marana, which is death. Birth is past of the body. Birth is the past. The present body is the present, and the future is death, the future of the body. Aging, sickness, struggle of existence, and that the loop, we call it antecedental, interdependent occurrences of life. And that, you really have to think about it. Don't just memorize the words. You have to, you have to meditate on it. If you just read the words, you're just verbally understanding it without an insight into it. You really have to put yourself in the perspective of Paticca Samapatta. Not put the words in your mind. Putting the words in your mind is just the initial part of the thinking. But people conceptualize by words, by examples, by visualization, by images. So we, I want to introduce some, some of the important basic concepts that the Buddha introduced to us. And... Um, so many of these concepts, and these concepts are all related. And some people, some people said, I'm, I, I, I don't know what to do. There's so much to learn in the Buddhist teaching. What should I start? Where should I start? I'm just, I'm like facing an ocean of, of information that I can get. Where do I start? You start from a few basic concepts. In order to know the taste of the ocean, you, need to, you don't need to drink up the whole ocean, don't you? I want to know the taste of the ocean. I want to drink up the whole ocean. You cannot. You just scoop a cup of the ocean water and taste it, and you know what it tastes like, right? So you just scoop up these few concepts, and you know what the Buddha is talking about. And you, with these concepts, the Buddha said, sufficient. These are the concepts that are sufficient for you to start. So we've been talking about the four seeds of the Buddha, Paticca Samabhata, and now we're on the third concept, the Noble Eightfold Path, the, the Noble Eightfold Ways. When we study the Buddhist teaching, because it contains so much information, we, ne we need to put ourselves in the right position. We must know what are we, where are we now? We are learning Vipassana. We are, we are learning the introspection after meditation. We're, we already have finished how to concentrate, how to focus, how to, how to do samatha, to arrive at samadhi, how to calm down the mind. Given that you know how to do it, we already have spent 30, 40 hours on doing that. And now we say calming down the mind is not enough. We are going to, into introspection. And in, in doing introspection, you need these basic concepts to introspect. And that's our position. That's, where our st that's what way we are standing now. And in learning this concept, we already learned the four seals of the Dharma. We already have learned the Paticca Samapatta. Now, why don't we pick up the Noble Eightfold Path? What did, the, what did the Buddha talk about? We say the Noble Eightfold Path contains mm -hmm. these eight ways. These eight, eight ways of understanding of awareness. You need to thoroughly be aware of these eight ways. The first is the right perspective, right orientation, which, which is related to wisdom, the right speech, right action, right lifestyle, related to morality, right effort, right introspection, and right mental equilibrium, which is related to meditation. So you need to have wisdom, morality and meditation in order to arrive at what we call enlightenment. What we call, if we can, if we can say it, actually the nirvana is, is a term that is very profound. If you want to get onto nirvana or, or samya sambuddhi, 
So you need wisdom, morality, and meditation. And why don't we, in the next, I don't know, half an hour or one hour, if we can't finish, we can carry on for the next time. Why don't we spend some time on this, what people uh, understand to be simple, just the superficial meaning is simple, the words are simple, but the, the, the deep thinking of it is not simple. Memorizing the words are not enough. Get to the essence of it. Why don't we just get to the essence of it now? Why don't we examine everyone in detail? Right perspective. Right perspective is to become fully aware of the Four Noble Truth. You have to be aware of the Four Noble Truth. Suffering, causes of suffering, how to liberate from sufferings, and the way to be liberated from sufferings. So in other words, the Buddha told us, the Buddha pointed out that we are living in samsara. We are living in the world of suffering. Does not mean that we are pessimistic. How can we not be in suffering if we always, if we always have to confront to undergo sickness, death, and aging. Are those not suffering? S suffering arising from departure from beloved ones, suffering arising from hatred, from wars, from natural disasters, from failures, from emotional upheavals, from depression, from greediness. All oh, these are sufferings. How can we say life is beautiful? We would like to make life beautiful. We, we, we should have an attitude of trying to be happy in suffering. But suffering itself is a truth. But our way of thinking is, in spite of the fact that we are in suffering, we want to, con to face this suffering with acceptance, with positive attitude. Yes, that's the right attitude. But you cannot, just an attitude, but you cannot say there's no sufferings in life. This is actually sufferings in life. Not just your sufferings. Every sentient being is suffering. You think the dog is happy? Depends on where the dog is. I have seen stray dogs coming to the temple and they're, they're going everywhere. They're looking for food. And there are also dogs in luxury homes. And uh, they suffer less, but they still suffer. So sufferings, why are we in suffering? What is suffering? Suffering is simply insecurity. Started from our, starting from the stage of in, in human life or from our ancestors, they, are inse they were insecure. They were hunting for food. They were afraid of darkness. They're looking for supernatural power to protect them. We're all feeling insecure. Nobody would feel secure. You're trying to feel secure, that's good, because you don't want to, you don't want to be dominated by the emotion, by the fear of insecurity, and that's the, that's the right approach. But that is really insecurity of life. And the Buddha called it dukkha. We have sufferings. But the Buddha said, yes, we have suffering, but we cannot just um, passively waiting for the sufferings to come up. We want to find out why are we suffering? We have to, in order to avoid, overcome, transcend sufferings, we have to find out the causes of this suffering, the causes of this insecurity. In the Sanskrit language is samudaya. We want to find out why we are suffering. And then, we want to know, after knowing the causes of this, 
We want to know how to liberate from sufferings, to go beyond sufferings. And we found a way, then we can transcend suffering and go into a state where there's no suffering. So because we are suffering, we are positively looking for a way to avoid suffering, not just for yourself, for all the folks, all your folks, for all people. The Buddha found a way to transcend suffering and he introduced his ways to us to get away from suffering. In other words, the Buddha has found a map to get away from the forest of suffering. And he didn't go into Nirvana just for himself. He wanted to stay in the forest and show us the map, how to get out. So the whole Buddha's teaching is on the Four Noble Truth, how to get away from life and death, how to get away from suffering. Not just blindly believe in a Buddha, a Buddha, Buddha is the God, no. The Buddha pointed out to us pointed out to us that the God is in you. You can avoid, get out from the suffering. Nobody can. If God can get you out from suffering, he has, or he has already done it. You don't even have to ask. You have to walk out yourself. Here's the map. Are you willing to look at the map? Do you want to look at the map? You have to know where it is. The Buddha cannot, cannot use his power to put you there. There's no such thing as God who has the power to get you out from suffering. So, you have to have the right perspective first in order to know how to get into vipassana. If you don't even know suffering, you think that being rich is getting out of suffering. Being wealthy, have, a, have reputation, nice family, nice homes, nice cars, that would get you out from sufferings. That could get you more into sufferings. Or getting famous. So you have to know that there are sufferings. We have to find out causes of suffering. We want to liberate from sufferings. And once we liberate from suffering, we are in a state of um, a nirvana. So in order to do that, we have to have the right orientation. We need a paradigm shift, so to speak, in common English. What is a paradigm shift? Very important word. What is the meaning of a paradigm shift? A paradigm shift is, I have been habitually used to think in this way. Now, this way is really wrong. I want to shift from this habit into something different. Previously, I think that drinking is right. I want to have fun. I want to have a good time. I'm involved with it. I'm, I'm intoxicated. I build up this habit. And I don't know this is bad habit because I find happiness, quote unquote happiness, in this. So I, I get drunk. Now somebody told you, you got to have a paradigm shift from this bad habit of intoxication into uh, calmness, into the wisdom of staying away from intoxication, into the wisdom of being always sober all the time. So you need a paradigm shift to replace our habitual thinking to a new and noble way oriented towards enlightenment. You must be willing to have this paradigm shift. You must be willing to change. So you must have the right orientation, the right way, the right path. You walk, need to walk in the right path. So you have, need to be aware that happiness comes from serenity of mind, not from experiencing sensual pleasures but from letting go of the notion of self. Meditation is not about getting 
I want to get this. I want to get, I want to get serenity of mind. I want to get natural power. I want to be healthy. I want to be wise. I want, I want, I want. Meditation is not about getting. Meditation is about what? Losing everything. You lose your greediness. Lose your emotion. Lose your hatred. Lose your anxiety. Lose your depression. It's getting rid of. You're not getting something. If you think meditation is to get something, no. Temporal learning is to get something. The right Tao is to lose. That's what Lao Chi said, a very ancient philosopher in China. Lao Chi, I don't know if you've heard about him. Um, I want to translate what he, what he said about this, but I have to say the word in Chinese first. Wai Ho, Ya Zhang, Wai Do, Ya Xun. Temporal learning, you want to learn, is to increase your knowledge. You increase the knowledge. I want to learn how to drive. I want to learn um, computer. Yeah, I want to learn everything. Piano, I want to learn. Learning is to enhance things to learning. But the real Tao is to lose. So meditation is not about getting. It's about giving up. You give up your fame, give up your reputation, give up your ego, give up your emotion, give up your depression, give up your hatred. You give up until you have nothing to give up. And that's nirvana. That's enlightenment. You drop everything. In other words, you drop yourself. The aim is to gain control over emotions through the practice. So the aim, the objective is to gain control over emotions through the practice of sila, zamata, and brajna. Once we have the paradigm shift, we begin to practice the next three steps aiming at achieving sila, that is to say avoiding bad, and bhatta, doing good, related to our speech, action, and lifestyle. So in other words, okay, we know, okay, this is, I know I need the right perspective, I need to understand the world, it's full of suffering, I want to change this, I want to get out from suffering, I want to liberate from sufferings. And just one more, a few more words about right perspective. The Buddha enjoy all the luxuries as a prince in the palace, which all of all people, all of us are always striving for. Fame, reputation, luxuries. The Buddha enjoyed all that when he was a prince, the best. He had four palaces for each season. He had all the concubines, all the ladies and everything, all the luxuries, but he knew these would not give enlightenment. This would only lead to sufferings, indulge attachment. So he wanted to get rid of these and look for ways to transcend sufferings, which is just the opposite of what ordinary people are doing now, what we are doing. We always want money, fame, reputation. I can, I can risk my life in getting that. But the Buddha said, get away from those. Those will not give you happiness. You have to walk away from those. But how many people would walk away from, from money, wealth, from wealth, reputation, pleasures? How many people walk away from those? Maybe one, very few. So after you have the right perspective, you have the right, you should have the right orientation. The right orientation is, you must know that Happiness comes from not, the, not from, the, from these, but from letting go of the self, from the control of emotions through the practice of sila, samatha, and prajna. And once we have this shift, then we begin to practice. This is just an awareness. 
Once we have this awareness, once we know that this is what we're going to do, what we what we have to actually perform, we have to actually carry out what we learn. Right? We already have this concepts, right perspective, right orientation in mind. We need to carry out this, practice this. And where do we start to practice? We start to practice from three sources: our behavior, our actions. We behave every day, right? We walk. We 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 do every all the actions. We have to start from our action, our speech, and our thinking. We start to carry out the right perspective, right orientation, by improving, shifting, changing our behavior or actions, our speech. And our thinking, which leads to right speech, so we need to change, have a paradigm shift of getting to the right speech. This is speech that does not create conflicts such as hatred, enmity, this unity, this harmony among individual groups of people, but instead creates happiness wherever we go, such as. Abstinence from lying, abstinence from abusive or foul language, abstinence from flattery, flattering and flower language, abstinence from slandering, babbling, gossiping. We must learn this first. We must make our speech right. We must obey. We must conform first of all to this morality standard. Before we get onto the right way, the right action. This is our ethical and moral behavior, which is always pleasant to ourselves and to others, such as abstinence from harming or destroying the lives of all sentient beings, abstinence from stealing, abstinence from sexual misconduct, such as illegitimate sexual relationship. We need to carry out this good behavior. If you're not even having the right behavior. How can you get onto the right perspective and the right orientation? Empty talk is useless. You just talk about it, but you never walk it. You never perform it. That's the reason why we need to have vinaya, the right morality. So these right speech, right actions, we need to we need to learn them. And this is related to the vinaya part, the morality part. Be The, the Buddhist teaching is in three broad categories: the wisdom part, morality part, and what, and the concentration part, or the prajna part, or the uh, pana part in the Pali language. The right lifestyle. The right lifestyle involves with a lot of thinking. Would involve speech and action too. It means that one should abstain from making one's living through a profession that brings harm to others, such as slaughtering animals for profit, trading in arms and lethal weapons, intoxicating materials or drinks, cheating, promoting sexual misconduct. One should have a harmonious lifestyle, which is unselfish, honest, compassionate, and tolerant way of living that is helpful. But not harmful to anyone in the world. And practicing sila and bhatta, practicing sila is to stop bad deeds. Bhatta, in addition to stopping what is bad, you also have to actively doing good deeds. So, in other words, not killing animals, for example, is not enough. You have to initiate by saving animals. I don't, I don't, I don't hunt. I don't fish. That's okay. I'm, I'm, a, I'm obeying the the vinayas. Not enough. You don't hunt. You don't fish. But you also have to actively, compassionately, protecting animals, stopping others to kill animals. Try to at least. And almost like impossible in, the, in, in, in this world, atrocities. Because 
We humans are used to killing animals for food. Habitually killing animals for food. If you, if you visit the slaughterhouse, you may not eat meat anymore. You don't have to visit the slaughterhouse. Go on to Google and get into how, how they slaughter chickens, pigs, buffaloes. You know how cruel humans are. They don't think cruelty as something unusual. They do it every day. And their professions, I know of a guy, his profession is, is it's what? Is, they call it chasing chickens. They just use a rod and their profession is just hitting the ch chicken in the head and make them dead so they can be slaughtered in the old way. But nowadays, they don't even do that. They hang onto an assembly line upside down and they slice it all the way through. They don't even use manual labor now. They can kill thousands of chickens per day, per, per, per hour. So, practicing siller and butter is the foundation of being a good person. One has to develop the mental discipline to achieve enlightenment through the next three ways. So, right speech, right action, right lifestyle is only doing good, stopping bad, doing good, but you still need the right mental discipline to achieve this enlightenment. So that's the next three noble ways. What are these three? Right efforts, right introspection, right mental equilibrium. Let's deal with right efforts. This comprises four parts. Prevention, elimination, cultivation, and maintenance. What is prevention? To prevent evil and unwholesome states of mind from arising. This is guarding of the senses. So that if you have bad thoughts coming up, you want to intoxicate yourself. You want to cheat others. You want to go hunting killing the deers for the antlers or whatever, for the meat or whatever. Stop that. You prevent that. To prevent evil and unwholesome thoughts coming up. I have unwholesome thoughts, evil thoughts. I want, I have a, right now, for example, I, I have a thought of uh, sexual misconduct. You have to prevent it from happening. In the prevention stage, that is guarding your senses our senses are going astray. Our senses are looking for pleasures in the wrong way. So you have to prevent that from happening. That is involved in calming down your mind, calming down the desultory thoughts of misconduct, prevention. The second one is elimination. To eliminate such evil and unwholesome states of mind that have already arisen, this is letting go of emotions once we know that our senses are attaching to externalities. So you prevent it from happening, and if it happens in you, you try to eliminate it. If the thought comes up, as I always give an example, if a guy is meditating in here and all of a sudden he, maybe he sees a, a, what he thinks is a beautiful woman and then his thought is being attracted to that externality of what he, ca what he call beauty, then many thoughts will come in his mind. It's not purity anymore. He cannot prevent it from happening because he has been habitually attaching to looking for sensual pleasures. But if you are meditating, if you have control over your mind, if you have this summative part, you say, no, I want to stop this idea. Or if you, I want to have a drink. No, I want to stop this idea. The thought comes up, but you, you want to prevent it, sometimes you cannot. The thought comes up, it perpetu the thought perpetuates, control you, then you go to the liquor store. Then if you don't have any money, you steal, you rob, 
You do by all illegal means to satisfy that pleasure that, that, that's in your mind. If you are in meditation, if you are in control of your thought, you can prevent that from happening. The thought may come up, and then it perpetuates into a second thought, and then you say, stop. I want to stop this thought. You need training to stop it. If you know that you have to stop it, you're already on your way. You're already on your way to enlightenment because you know how to stop. Our problem is we do not know how to stop. One drink after another. We don't know how to stop. And if you can prevent it from happening, then the next step is I want to eliminate that thought from coming up. I want to eliminate it completely. Third, cultivation. Bhavana. Bhavana, to produce, to cause, to arise, wholesome states of mind not yet arising. Now, pre previous prevention and elimination, prevention and elimination, is for evil and unwholesome thoughts coming up. Those are the two ways to deal with them. Prevent them, and when they come up, eliminate them. The cultivation and maintenance is to produce and cause to arise wholesome thoughts. So it is not sufficient just, just not to do bad things. You, you also have to do good deeds. Positively, actively do good deeds. Not just stopping yourself from doing bad deeds. You also have to positively actively doing good deeds. That's why when you see people, oh, we want to protect seals in, in, in the north and we don't want people to kill them, you should support them because they are, they are actually cultivating good, good thoughts, good deeds. We want to promote people and tell them that we should be vegetarian and not killing animals for food. So they are producing good thoughts. They, they cause good thoughts to arise. That's cultivation. Cultivation of good thought. Or we want to go for meditation so that we know how to enlighten ourselves. That's a good thought coming up. Don't stop, don't stop people from thinking about good thoughts. You should encourage, praise good thoughts. Encourage. It's just like when the kids say, I, 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 want to, uh, I want to do something good. I want to be intelligent. You encouraged him to do it. I want to be good at certain sports. Encourage them to do it. Don't discourage them. Cultivate them. Cultivate these good thoughts. Maintenance. Fourth to develop and bring to perfection the wholesome states of mind already present. If you have these good thoughts in you, maintain it, protect it, perfect it. Don't let it drop. That's the right effort. So I only finished six of these Noble Eightfold Ways in a in a brief form, of course, for every one of these items, we can go deeper into it. But these should be the concepts that, have, that we should have in our mind when we are doing vipassana, when, when we are doing introspection. If you don't even have the right concepts, how can you introspect, how can you contemplate? If you are thinking of, I want to, I want to make a lot of money. I want to buy a house in the, next, in the next year. I want to do this. I want to do that. It's good to buy a house, but not at the expense of harming others. You have to do it the right way. Don't get me wrong. It does not mean that you shouldn't buy a, a big mansion. If you can, fine, but you don't have to do it the right way, not harming others, not at the expense of others. Okay, so these are the eight right... Uh, I mentioned only six, the eight noble, eightfold ways. 
uh, we will continue with the remaining. And right now we are in introspection. Remember, we are in pers two perspective. We already have finished the stabilization. We are in introspection. And in introspection, you need to have the right view, the right concepts. And you always have to refresh this concept in your mind. Impermanence, non-self, sufferings that we have to bypass, we have to transcend, and all that concepts that always need to be stationing in our mind. And we use these concepts to analyze, to help us into introspection. We've been talking about introspection. When we say introspection is internal contemplation into the mind, introspection. And meditation is in two parts. The stabilization part and the introspection part. The stabilization part is the samadhi in, in Sanskrit or Pali language. And the introspection part is vipassana. Um, in the stabilization part or pacification part, we have counting, breath, the counting, the following, and the stabilization. We've been talking for a very long time on these three perspectives of mind stabilization or pacification. And we have started on introspection. And introspection is a very profound and subtle subject. And we need a lot of time to talk about it. Because introspection, in introspection, you require a lot of the Buddhist teaching in the form of concepts. It's very important, the Buddha uh, reminded us that it's very important that one has to have the right introspection. That is to say, the right concepts, the right concepts in terms of um, where we get from the Tripitaka, the Buddhist, the Buddhist teaching, and from various sources about right concepts, right perspective to introspect. Because usually we use the wrong concepts to introspect. What are these wrong concepts? Egoistic concepts, selfish concepts, Greedy concepts, jealous concepts, hatred concepts, self-protection concepts, self-centered concepts. These are, these are the erroneous concepts. The Buddha said it's quite important that we use the right perspective, the right concepts to visualize, to introspect. So that's the reason why we have to study the Buddha's teaching. Other than all these other various concepts we got from the saints, from our forefathers, from our teachers, we need also deeper understanding of these concepts that we got from the Tripitaka, the Buddha's, the Buddha's teaching. And nowadays it's been quite not as difficult as before to learn these concepts. Because I remember oh, 20 years ago, when we study these concepts, we have to plow through all these books. If I have to investigate into a concept, I have to put a few books on, the, on my table and put tag, put marks, you know, all that. And then we come up with a summary of those concepts. But nowadays it's different. We got websites. Nowadays we're flooded with information. You can, you can Google the concepts. Learning the Buddhist concept has become easier than before. Voluminous books before, but now just a computer is easier. In spite of the fact that it's easier, if you browse into, this, into these concepts, you may not have the mind to understand them. 
Sometimes you really need a third person, someone who's been through these concepts to tell you the actual meaning so that there wouldn't be any misunderstanding about these concepts. And here we are. We are investigating, we are analyzing, we are probing into these concepts in accordance with what the, the Buddha has been, teach, has been teaching us. And how many of these concepts are there? Billions. How many words are there in the Buddhist teaching? It depends on what canon you're talking about. If you're talking about there's, there's also the Sanskrit canon, the Pali canon, and many, many other languages that have been involved with translation of the Buddhist, of the Buddhist teaching. And one of the most resourceful, of course, is in the Chinese language. How many words in the Chinese Tripitaka, uh, Tripitaka, the Vinaya, um, uh, the Epidama, and the Sutras? How many words are there in the Chinese language? Immeasurable. Billions and billions and billions. How many volumes are there? As far as I can remember, 8,600 volumes. And each volume is billions of words. How come there were so, much, so many? Because throughout all these 2,600 years, a lot of later philosophers and monks and saints, they have been interpreting, uh, giving commentaries on the Buddhist teaching, and they left to us a whole treasury of their commentaries. So we have too many of them, many of them. So when we are confronted with a whole ocean of bibliography, literature, teaching, what are we going to do? Which one should we choose? And should we study them all? When you, when you want to know the taste of the ocean water, do you have to drink up the whole ocean? Do you need to drink up the whole ocean to get a taste of the water? Certainly you cannot. You're not capable of drinking up the whole ocean. You just take a cup, scoop up a cup of ocean water, taste it, taste it carefully, taste it with analysis, taste it with investigation, taste it with wisdom, then you know what the taste of the ocean water is all about. And if you don't if you think there's not enough, scoop another cup and taste it. You don't have to drink up the whole ocean. So don't worry about, oh, <laughs> what should I study? And sometimes if you are scooping up too much water, you get, you get sick too. You really have to scoop it up and taste it very carefully, cautiously, with thinking, with compassion with serenity, with peacefulness. You must know how to taste it. Some people taste a hamburger. I'm, not ta I'm talking about a meat burger, a Beyond Burger, for example. And if you ask, what's the taste of the burger? A hundred people will give you a different taste. Some people don't even know how it tastes. I don't know, I just taste it, it tastes like meat. I don't know, it tastes good, it tastes bad. Everybody's a little different in trying to understand it because everybody's wisdom is not the same. Their samadhi is not the same. Their karma is not the same. Their background is not the same. So let's, with all these various different backgrounds, let's try to understand what the Buddhist teaching is all about. And I remember last time we talked about one of the many concepts. We say the Noble Eightfold Paths, Eightfold Ways, and we have the right perspective, right orientation, right speech, right action, right lifestyle, right efforts, right introspection, and right mental equilibrium. Now these are the guidelines that the Buddha told us, the noble eightfold ways, and some, some philosophers and saints and monks translated them as uh, sometimes the supernormal ways, or because they really transcends temporal, temporal affairs. It, it, it goes into a very high level of wisdom. To so the noble eightfold way, 
right perspective in the, in the party language. Uh, right now, what I'm talking about, sometimes I use the Pali language and the Sanskrit language interchangeably because they are more or less the same. More or less, not the, exactly the same. And uh, I don't want to, to put two in there. Sanskrit and Pali, it occupies a lot of space on the PowerPoint. So in this case, I just use the Pali word. Pali and Sanskrit are quite close. Samaditti, right perspective. And we said the right perspective is the right view. So you have to look at things by the right view. And one of this right view, of course, as I, as I said again, as I say it again, right view contains many of these views that are supposed to be right. And the right orientation, right orientation is your destination, your path, which paths you take. Given that you have the right view, you must know what path, so many paths. I remember there's a poem, Robert Frost, he says, a path, path not taken. There's so many paths open to you that you choose the right path. Now, once you have the right perspective and the right orientation, then you have the right wisdom. Once you have the right wisdom, it's not just talking about it, uh, wisdom in the, sans in the Pali language is panya. In the Sanskrit language is prajna, bora. So right perspective and right orientation, the right view and the right objective, the right way, then that concerns wisdom. You already have the right wisdom to proceed. You need the wisdom to proceed. You can just blindfold yourself and say, oh, this is meditation. You know, nowadays, Many, many teachers, quote unquote, I don't want to quote names, of course. Many, many meditation teachers teach from a book. They hold a book and then they start to teach. How can anyone teach with just holding a book in his hand and refer to the words and teach meditation? Or to teach from a videotape? So you gotta have the wisdom to pick and choose and know which one is right and which one is wrong. Wisdom. Given that you already have the wisdom, the initial wisdom, then you start to what? Instead of just talking about a board, you have to walk on the board. You have to walk on the path. You have to start practicing it, right? Not just empty talk. Just not, not, just, not just talking about it. We see a lot of people just talking, talking, talking. They're not walking it. We have seen a lot of, quite a few people talk about morality and they never observe morality. So other than just wisdom, we need to have the wisdom and we start to what? Act on it. So we have the right speech, right action and right lifestyle. That is actually practicing it. Right speech. For example, abstinence from flattery, abstinence from cursing, abstinence from Abstain yourself from lying, slandering, foul language, cursing, flower language, you know, you name them, inexhaustible. Speech. What can people do from making speech? Many, many fatal consequences start from making a forced speech. A fight could arise from just a few words of cursing. A murder could arise from just a few words of flattery. So speech, right action. What is action? Killing, lying, sexual misconduct, etc., etc. I've gone through them. I'm just giving a brief summary. And then right actions. You need to have the right behavior. Have you got the right behavior? Right lifestyle. What is lifestyle? Your profession, your career. Were you involved in a career of harming others, harming sentient beings? Like for example, you were involved with hunting. You kill other animals for pleasure. Well, there's harming others. That's not a good lifestyle. Are you involved with 
promoting alcoholism, intoxication, drugs? Are you involved in, in uh, the career of promoting gambling? Slaughtering? That's not the right style. Just, just give you a few of my, one of my personal experiences. When I was in Toronto many, many years ago, I was, I was a student at, in Toronto, U of T, University of Toronto, my first year. My first year, I rented with my schoolmate a basement from an, from an Italian family living in the basement. I still remember how much pen we, we pay. I only pay $35 per month. That's how many years ago? More than 38 years ago. 40 years ago? $35 a month. And then my school may pay another 35, so it's, it's, it's $70 a month. And we were living downstairs. It's a cool, a very cool and unfurnished basement. We only have a desk and and beds and we're studying and we go to school, we go to university in the morning and when we come back, we still have a little kitchen that we can cook. And we were never allowed to walk upstairs. That's in the lease. You are in the basement. You're not allowed to walk upstairs. Upstairs as a family. And that family contained a couple uh, about 50, 60 years old, a man and a woman, from, from uh, very, very kind, very amicable, very, very good uh, couple, uh, landlords, very good. And, uh, but we were not allowed to go upstairs because we were, actually we were kids at that time, teenagers, like teenagers, you know. And then one day, um, at Christmas, and then we were allowed just to go up to have a drink. Uh, um, and then I keep the story short. And then I saw there was a, a chum in the, in the ladies, a chain, like a chain. And in that chain, there was a picture in there. The picture of a boy. You know, a chum, you know a chum is a chain, yeah, right, okay. And then, and then I, I, I realized that the lady, I've been there for a year and a half, and I saw that lady always dressed in black. And I started to ask, well, why are you always dressed in, like, in black color? And what is this chump? He said, this is my son. This is my son. He passed away at the age of 15. I love my son. I will forever wear this chump. I, I remember my son. They had a son passed away at age 15. And later I find out that the father, the father liked hunting because I saw a lot of deer heads on the wall. Moose had deer heads, a bear here. And I thought to myself, when I was studying Buddhism at that time, I thought to myself, if the father has always been killing, did they not take away the lives of the beloved ones of some animals? The teddy bear of the big bear? The little deer of, 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 of the male deer, the female deers? The moose? They took away the lives of other sentient beings, beloved ones. And according to causality, if you're so cruel in taking away lives of beloved ones of others, you may suffer from the same sentiment, sentimental sufferings. He didn't realize that. Uh, somehow I I don't want to talk too much because I'm not, I'm, I was not a preacher. Otherwise, I, have to, I would have told the, the, I would have asked and told the man not to, not to do any hunting anymore. Because according to cause and effect, if you're always sowing the seeds of cruelty, you'll get cruelty back. If you're always sowing the seeds of adversities, you'll get adversities back. It bounces back to you. So, talking about right lifestyle, we have to be very careful in what we're doing. You have to be very careful 
not to build conditions for the future that is bleak and bleak and 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 gloomy. All right, and then right efforts, right introspection, and right mental equilibrium. I think I stopped at right efforts. Now, after you have one and two, which is wisdom, then you actually walk, practice. You need mora morality because after you you have your wisdom, you must what? You must do two things in order to not to sow bad karma. First one is sila, not to do bad things, not to do bad deeds. Second is bhatta in the pop in the Pali language, B H A T A. Bhatta is doing good deeds. More than just not doing bad deeds, you have to good, do good deeds. Not doing it is passive. Passively, I don't want to be a bad guy. I don't want to do bad, bad speech, bad behavior. But positively, I want to promote good things too. Actively promoting good things. So not only do we not only do we have to stop doing bad things, we have to promote good things, do good deeds. Just stop yourself from doing bad deeds is not enough. You you really have to promote good deeds actively. So that's morality. So other than that, what's the next? Raising your morality is not enough. In other words, you have to work spiritually and mentally to elevate yourself to a level that you are out from samsara. Now that requires time to explain, and I haven't come to that point yet. But I'm looking at the clock, and I only have 10 minutes left. Maybe let me do a little bit more on the first one, the right perspective on the first one, because the first one is quite important. Your, your right perspective, your right view is absolutely important. What is the first one? The first one is the right perspective. You have to be aware of four things. We call it what? The four noble truth. You have to be really be aware of four very important truths. The first one is what? Suffering, life is suffering. Life is insecure. Life is insecurity. In the Pali language, is dukkha. The second noble truth, the causes of suffering. We have to know why we suffer, why we're insecure. There's a samudaya, in the Pali language, samudaya. So we know there is there are sufferings. We have the final origin. Why are we suffering? That's one of the Buddha said. The Buddha told us that this world is full of suffering, but we don't don't just sit there and 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 go through the suffering. We have to find out why we suffer, the origin of suffering. Why do we have to find out the causes? Why? When we find out the causes, we know how to avoid causes. We know how to go beyond suffering. So, the third is nirodha. If we, if we do not show these causes of suffering, then we don't have suffering, and then we can liberate ourselves from suffering. That is the n e r o d a that we're talking about. But before we can liberate ourselves from suffering, we have to know the way, the method to liberate ourselves from suffering. I'm a management major when I was studying at U of T, and I can tell you. This this is like a Harvard Business Case techniques of studying life. What is what is when you are given a case study? What do you do? You have to read the, all the circumstances in the case. You have to identify the problems. If the company doesn't have any problems, you don't you don't really have to study the problems, right? Life is the problem of insecurity. What there are problems with this company, problems, problems of life. There are problems of this family, problems of this. And some philosophers, philosophers and psychologists say, 
man is in search of the wisdom to what? To solve problems. And of course, the, 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 cru the most crucial problem is what? Is how to avoid death. That's almost the most important. What is the most important problem in life? How to increase another productivity for a million dollars? How to hire more? How to do this more, do that more? That's only a, a very peripheral, very minor problem. The major, the most important problem of life is not that, is we all have to die. Death. How do we transcend death? Death is the, is the problem, not how much money you make. Death. But other than that, I'm, I'm, I'm just talking about this Harvard business case. So we need to understand, the, to analyze the problems of the company. Then we have to know what caused those problems, right? How can you solve problems without knowing the causes of those problems? You have to find out those, the causes of those problems. And then, if you identify the problems, if you find the, if, if you find the, if you know the reasons for these problems, then you design a method to solve this problem. And then the problem is solved, right? Now, there are sufferings in this world. We have to find out the causes of this suffering. And then we find out a method to end suffering. And then the suffering is ended. That is what the Buddha said in a very, in a nutshell, but there's a lot more in there. So what are the, what are the sufferings in life? I still have five minutes when I look at the clock. What are the sufferings in life? In the Lotus Sutra, Sakyamuni Buddha said, the triple world of samsara are full of turmoil, like a burning house, repleted with a multiple of, of sufferings. Suffering of birth, Suffering of aging, suffering of sickness, suffering of death, suffering of being departed from, from beloved ones. When your beloved ones departed from this world, you suffer, you agonize, you're grief-stricken. That is suffering. Or suffering arising from living with unloved ones. It's just the opposite of living, of departure, of suffering, uh, arising from departure of beloved ones, you have to live with someone you hate. We have to work with some colleagues that you don't like. There are some disple displeasures that you don't like, but it always come to you. And suffering of not getting what one wants, suffering from interaction of the five scanters. Now, there are altogether eight kinds of suffering just in a nutshell. Of course, all this can, can uh, we call it, branched down into many subsidiaries of sufferings that we've been talking about. We're not mentioning even earthquake, sickness, epidemic diseases, wars, genocide. Oh, there's so many suffering in this world. So, can we not say, oh, this world is happy, I'm happy. You can have the attitude of being happy you can throw a perspective of happiness in everything you do, but you cannot avoid suffering, can you? You cannot, you cannot say, I'm, I, I, I want to build up this attitude of looking at everything like a rosy garden, but you still can change suffering. Can you change age, aging? Can you change sickness? Can you change death? It's good that you have a happy attitude, but you cannot change suffering, can you? You cannot. So where does suffering come from? Where does suffering come from? We know there's suffering, and Buddha said we know the causes of suffering. We need to know why suffering occurred. Suffering occurred because of what? Because of our craving for sensual pleasures. Lop, lust and greed for pleasures of the senses. In the process of craving for all this, we build up a lot of bad karma. We also crave for non-existence of these pleasures, repulsion and hatred of these pleasurables and unlovables. Uh, dosa. 
Why did it happen to me? Why do I get unemployed? Why do I have all this, this I'm encountering all these things that is not pleasurable? You always hate, repulse things that you, that you don't like. Craving for continued existence, insistence and maintenance of a self. Of a self. I have, I am, I, you always maintain a self-centered attitude on everything. That's why we suffer. It is craving that leads to reincarnations and renewed existence. The, the Buddha said, we have to eliminate this craving. We have to get rid of this craving. But how? We need to know methods. And the Buddha told us many, many methods. Many, many methods to eliminate craving. But how many people are really focusing on these methods and really learn about it? Or they were too busy doing something else? I have a job, I have a family, I need to buy a house, I need to buy a car, I need to upkeep my family. And how much time I will devote to to thinking about non-attachment of craving, <laughs> not very much time. So that's the reason why some people like to be a monk or a nun, because they can get rid of all these family bonds, society bonds, job bonds, studies bonds, and get into pure enlightenment or pursuit, pursuit for enlightenment. Lust and greed for pleasures of the senses. What are our senses? Our eyes like to see beautiful things. Our ears like to listen to beautiful music, attached to beautiful music. Our nose attached to frequency. Our tongue attached to taste. That's why we're killing animals for food. We like to taste the flesh and blood of animals, cook the pork chop, lobsters, kill the fish, because we want to satisfy our taste. Just our, the taste of our tongue. This craving for the satisfaction of our taste and want to satisfy, because we want to satisfy our eyes looking for beauty, then, then that arouse somehow all this sexual misconduct could arise because of our attachment to, to beauty, for example. <laughs> I don't know, so many examples in that. And um, our attachment to fame, well, reputations, and all that, and all that. There's lust and greed. And some people will say, what's the problem in getting a big house? What's the problem in, in being rich? I'm doing it my way. I, 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 this is the riches that I have accumulated. But if you examine very carefully, how did they get the riches? Is it at the expense of Many, many other sentient beings, did they do it the right way? How those riches were obtained and accumulated? Analyze it in detail. And craving for displeasures, why do we hate? We're living in between love and hate, between tears and laughter, between love and hate. We're always living we're living in an emotional world. Our mind is it's in two parts. One is the thinking part, which is the rational part, and the other is the emotional part. The thinking part, we call it the mano in, in the Pali language. The emotional part, we call it the chitta, the chitta, the emotional part. The emo what is, in the, what is in, the, in the thinking part? The thinking part, a burnt, a burnt child threatens the fire. Uh, you learn when you first start. The thinking part, the rational part teaches you how to learn, how to behave, all those accumulation of languages, techniques and all that, that's the thinking part. The rash, more or less the rational part. And, um, or the thinking of how to protect yourself, thinking part, but that's also the emotional part. The emotional part contains what? Depression, fear, anxiety, hatred, love, 
We always think that love is good. But the Buddha said love is not as good as you analyze it to be. Is it a one-sided love? Is it a love that is selfish? Is it a love that is conditional? Unconditional love is not called love. It's called compassion. If you love your family members more you love all others given the same situation, that is just family love. That is not compassion. Compassion is unconditional. If it is not your, your son, your wife, your daughter, your grandchild, would you love them the same way as, would you love the others the same way as you love your own family members? Actually, why do we have family members? Because we have unfinished business in the previous lives. There are four reasons why family members come together. That includes your daughters, your son, your wife, your four reasons why family come together. The first one, repayment of a debt. You owe him a debt. You, owe, you think, don't borrow, and, uh, don't borrow and, and, and abstain from repayment because he, he, he will get you in your next life. So repayment of a debt, say for example, if your son is being born as your son, that could be your debtor before. You owed him maybe $600,000, and at the juncture of death, this guy owed me six hundred thousand dollars. He never repaid me. He cheated me. So he came back as your son, and you have to pay him three hundred thousand dollars. When the three hundred thousand dollars is all paid, then he died. Then he's gone. It's a repayment of a debt. You have to repay. On the other hand, it could be you could be his debtors. He is coming to repay you. So he would be your son, and then he would be a very obedient son, and he's doing, doing good at education. He's, he's a doctor. He makes a lot of money, and he's giving you money to spend. He's repaying you a million dollars that, that he owed you before. It's a repayment. It's a monetary karmic energy. It's a, it's a monetary. It's all money. This is repaying you. He's not coming to get you. He's coming to provide you with all the provisions. He expressed filial piety to you. He loved mom and dad. Mom and dad, every Christmas, is sending you ro send Mother Day roses and Father's Day, giving you a lot of whatever you want. He's repaying you on monetary conditions. There's also repayment on an emotional situation. You owe him the love. Your son passed away. You're grief-stricken. Your, your, your wife divorced you. You're grief-stricken because you divorced her before. He's coming to get even with you. It's all pay and repaid. So, of course, it's just the, it's, it's the, end, the, the, the end of the line, the limit. In between, there's always... You can't you can have a formula on these things. Some, sometimes more debt more emotional debt, the monetary debt. Sometimes it's not that, it's just a friendship come together. It's all, it's all multitude of reasons why family members stay together. So when anything happens, just say it's a repayment. It's a clearing of the general ledger. It's, it's a clearing of debt and, 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 and credit. It's a, it's a clearing of liability. It's a repayment of your assets. Well, of course, with due respect, that comes naturally. No grievances, no hatred, no particular love. You already have done your best. Fulfill your responsibility as a dad, as a mom, as a granddad. The whole thing is karmic energy pulled together. If you shed tears for all those family members that you passed away since many, many lifetimes ago, the Buddha said, if we can quantify the amount of tears and hold the amount of tears, just, just like the ocean. Your tears is like the ocean water because you've been crying all the time when your family member passed away. In every life, your dad passed away, your grandma passed away, 
You've been crying and crying and crying. Only the ocean can hold all the tears that you've been crying since millions of lifetimes ago. Last time we stopped at, um, we are still talking about how to meditate, and we've been talking about how to meditate for many, many weeks already. It's a very long subject, but it is challenging to make a long subject interesting. So we try to we try to um, tie a relationship between meditation and all the realities of life. All the facets of life, and uh, we also quote with reference to very important sutras and abhidhamas about how to meditate. And basically, we based our literature on uh, the six gates to meditation. And let's just have a, a brief review as to what we've been talking about. So we've been talking about meditation, and meditation is not just oh, meditation is to sit and keep quiet and relax. Meditation is in two part. The calming part we call it the stabilization, mental stabilization. How to stabilize your mind, calming. Calming the mind and relax the body. That's the first part. But meditation is not is more than just calming the mind. It's also introspection, um, which is an insightful uh, contemplation. We call it. And I quote a few very important references from the uh, the six subtle gates to meditation. Calming. Is the initial method here? Calming is the initial method through which one is able to suppress mental afflictions. So nowadays, a lot of people have depression, jealousy, anxiety, fear, hatred, arrogance. You know, a lots of these mental afflictions, or uh, uh, how how do we call it? Or Fetters, we call them fetters, F-E-T-T-E-R-S, fetters, mental afflictions, and calming the mind is to suppress these mental <coughs> afflictions. I remember when I was in Hong Kong three weeks, three weeks ago, I almost scared my audience out, because when I first started, I said, uh, "Right now we have 800, more than 800 people in here, and I can predict." Uh, within the next 50 years, half of you guys will be gone, <laughs> and they all get scared. Well, how come half of you guys will be gone? I think who is who is um, who is over 50 years of age? Well, a lot of people raise their hands. Over 50, 50 years of age, in 50 years you will be gone. If you live with 100 years, life is fleeting. Life is impermanent, and um, that's what the Buddha was talking about. And, but every one of us, we don't think that way. We think everything is, there's, us all, there's always a tomorrow, there's always a next year. But when it comes to think of it, life is in between a breath. If you don't continue this current breath, and you, if, if, if this current breath does not continue for five minutes, there's no oxygen in your brain, you're gone. So life is in between the breath. That's the reason why we're using the breath to meditate on. Now you know why we use the breath and not a candle flame. Because that's the vitality of all your thinking, all your bodily movements, every thought is the breath. That's the reason why we're using, using the breath. All right, calming is the initial method through which one is able to suppress mental afflictions. But suppress is not good enough. You just suppressed it. 
It's just that when wild grass is growing up in the middle of all your rhododendrons, you want to get rid of your grass. If you just use a piece of rock to, to suppress it down, the wheat is going to grow it again. You just put your rock and push down the, the weeds. You think the weeds will disappear? The weeds will sprout again. Your jealousy, your hatred, your anxiety, your depression, your fears, your worries, it will sprout again. During the meditation, you learn how to suppress them. You, if you learn it well, then you can suppress them. You, so by suppressing them, you're calming down your mind, but not for long. So we still have to do introspection, which is the next step, which is the primary essential through which one is able to eliminate delusions. That is to completely pull out the weeds, put the plastic in, put the rocks in, and it will never grow again. Make sure that you eliminate all your delusions. So introspection is very important. We have talked about the calming part for a few months already. For those who are just first time coming here, probably you, you, you don't know what we're talking about because we've been talking about calming or stabilization for a few months. And now we're in introspection. Uh, I'm just doing a review in here, uh, introspection. Next thought, calming is the provision with which one nurtures the consciousness. We need to nurture our consciousness. Why do we need to nurture our consciousness? What is our consciousness made up of? What comes out from our consciousness? All your delusions, all the, all the mental afflictions, all the fetters, we call them, comes out from consciousness. We need to purify the consciousness. But before you need to purify your consciousness, you must learn how to clean, clean up the dirt. And calming is an initial step where you perform the cleaning. So it nurtures the consciousness. Nowadays, we don't know how to nurture our consciousness. Introspection is the technique which stimulates the development of spiritual understanding. So after you're nurturing, you have nurtured your consciousness, you need to stimulate your development for spiritual understanding. You need to go forward to have the stimulation and development of spiritual understanding. So one step forward. Next, coming is supreme cause for the dhyana absorption. And introspection is the origin of wisdom. You need wisdom, finally, to arrive at nirvana. So both zamata and vipassana, they are the wings of a bird, the two wings of a bird. A bird cannot fly with just one wing. So you need two wings to fly. You need calming and you need introspection. Or you need stabilization and you need introspection. So we got this clear, right? This is just a review. And next. So we've been talking about stabilization, which is the same as calming. We're talking about counting, following, and stabilization. And now we are at introspection, which is the wisdom part, the vipassana part. And introspection, we need a lot of time to talk about it because that is very important. That's the wisdom. In Buddhism, you have to build up wisdom, not just meditating and calming your mind and that's it. In addition to calming your mind, you have to build up your wisdom for your spiritual understanding, your spiritual development. So that part is in three aspects, the introspection part, the turning part, and the purification part. And we've been on, on the introspection part for two months already. And then I went away for, to Hong Kong for lectures, and then I'm returning. Uh, I'm taking up the introspection part again. Probably that would last for about four or five lectures. I don't want to deal with it for too long because I want to go to turning and purification. But introspection is really so important. So we need to, to probe into it a, into a little bit more detail. All right, so our next, let's take to the next. 
the cultivation of introspection. Now we get back to introspection. So how to cultivate introspection? It is absolutely important to have the right introspection. So what is the wrong introspection? The wrong introspection is using using the wrong idea. For example, um, if you are using egoistic introspection, that's the wrong introspection. I hate this guy, and I I I don't like it, and I like that. Uh, this is this is rich. This is poor. This is ugly. This is beautiful. You're using a lot of your own built-in introspection, the egoistic introspection, the hatred introspection, the ignorant introspection. That's not the right introspection. You have to use the right introspection. It is quite important that you use the right introspection when you are uh, working on the, the introspection side, the insightful meditation side. What is the right introspection? The Sanskrit language is Sam Prasnaya. Right introspection, Sam Prachnaya, means clear and right understanding, clear and right knowing with full awareness, guided by prajna, guided by wisdom. So your understanding has to be guided by the wisdom. So what is prajna, which is wisdom, which is what is, you need prajna to fit in introspection. If you don't have the right prajna, you cannot fit in the introspection. Introspection is the method, is the tool. Prajna is the target, the intermediate target. And having a tool and having an intermediate target would lead you to the final destination. The intermediate target is still not the final destination, but you need that target. So, what is prajna? Prajna could be conceptual prajna. Conceptual prajna. And then, you also need introspective prajna. And then, you also need true prajna. So, when we look at these three kinds of prajna, of wisdom, we know that the very basic, the very initial step we need to do is to have concepts in terms of a language. How do we think? How do we introspect inside? How do we think? We need certain concepts to think, right? And these concepts are written in words or in pictures. We cannot think without concepts. But you need to have the right concepts. If you have a concept of egoism, that's not the right concept. If you have the concept of cruelty, that's not the right concept. If you have the concept of violence and sex, that's not the right concept. You need to have the right conceptual concept, the prajna. But having just the concept is not enough. You need to introspect you need to contemplate on the worded concept. In other words, you have the concept, you have to think it out. You have to think it out in such a way that you can use it as a practice. It's just like in, in, in studying at university, if you're taking economics or psychology, you learn all the words. You, you, you swallow up all these books of psychology, books of economics and finance, but you don't know how to apply them because you never use these concepts. So you need, to have, you need to have introspective, you need to apply these concepts, economics concepts, financial concepts. So this is scientific, you need to apply them. If you learn, you, you have the concept of non-self, you need to use the non-self concept to practice your daily life so that you have altruistic attitude to life. You're not selfish attitude to life. So that's a practice that you need to do, right? So introspective prajna. And then, <clears throat> with introspective prajna, that would lead you to true prajna. 
And true prajna will lead you to nirvana, the right understanding. It's easy to know about conceptual prajna. It's easy to know about introspective prajna. But what is true prajna? What is true prajna? True prajna is a state of pure consciousness that transcends worldly concepts or belief systems that might impede perfect wisdom. Many, many concepts impede our, stop our perfect wisdom. For example, concepts of violence, concepts of, I don't know, so many concepts impede perfect wisdom. Um, concepts of, um, say for example, killing animals for food, concepts of polluting the environment for the purpose of self-interest, concepts of wars, concepts of violence, concepts of crime, that impede perfect wisdom. So that put true prajna transcends all these concepts, worldly concepts and belief systems that might impede perfect wisdom. Number two, pure consciousness that transform the three parts of temporal consciousness. Perception, vinaya, thinking and emotion, chitta, into the ultimate introspection of the true nature of existence and reality. That, that requires some explanations. Our consciousness is in three parts. Our, our mind, we call, so to speak, is in three parts. The perception part, which we call in the Pali language, banana. The thinking part, in the Pali language, we call it mano. And the emotional part, we call it chitta. And the perception part is through all the senses to perceive reality. You pre perceive all externalities. And after this perception, it gets into your thinking, which is in two parts. The rational thinking part, which is the mano, and emotional thinking part, which is your chitta. The mano, the thinking part, or the chitta, the emotional part, they're always at the tug of war, fighting against each other. The emotional part wants us to, be, to have impress, depression, fear, anxiety, selfishness. And then the rational part says, no, 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 you, don't, you, you, you can't have this. So they're always fighting against each other. The rational part always fighting against each other. And unfortunately, which happens to you and me all the time, is always the emotional part that is, uh, is, that is in control. Because we've been habitually emotional. Why do we have depression? Because we have, we're dominated by the emotional mind. We must learn to let go of this emotional mind. We are, we, we are the victim of the chitta, of the emotional mind. Why are we the victim of the, of the emotional mind? Because all this chitta, the emotional mind, is not just of this life is all the accumulation of previous life's emotions, the power, the karmic energy of not only this life, previous life, were brought forward, and this is highly dominating over the thinking or the mono mind. And Buddhism, or true prajna, is to balance it for first, and finally, it has a paradigm shift to take over the emotional mind. Are you willing to get the paradigm shift? To shift it over? From the worldly emotional mind to that prajna, wisdom, in which you have high wisdom, then you're on your way to nirvana. You're free from suffering. You're free from emotions. Don't you want to be free from emotions? Or you always want to be buried in emotions. We don't want to have emotions. We want to get away from emotions. Who wants to be emotional? Who wants to be dominated by the emotional mind? Put up your hands. Who wants to, to have depression all the time? Who wants to have anxiety, fear, worry, hatred, jealousy, arrogance? We know those are wrong. But it seems that 
we habitually think that way, that we can't get rid of them. That's why depression is suicidal, because we can't stand it. Finally, it burns out our ego, suppressed the respect, and carry out the suicidal attempt. We have to change it. We have to have this paradigm shift. And it's right there. It's in the Buddha's teaching. It's not about just buying faith to believe in the Buddha. It's how to practice this conceptual prajna, develop it to introspective prajna, and develop to finally the true prajna all by yourself. Not God. If God can do something about it, he would have done it. You don't have to request. You just blindly believe in it and think that it was an external source that will help you. No, you got to help yourself. You can't just always depend on the doctor's medicine, the doctor's advice. You got to build up this confidence that you can change it. And you can. The Buddha said you can. And such introspection is the prajna that leads to enlightenment. That's true prajna. Still, that is not the true meaning of prajna. Just for the purpose of bringing out some meaning, because true prajna is unspeakable. True prajna is inconceivable. True prajna cannot be conveyed by words and concepts. Because you're beyond words and concepts. But beyond words and concepts, we cannot explain it. So we have to use words and concepts. For the purpose of explaining it, we just put down some words. And now we know that in introspection, we're talking about just about introspection. We finished up with calming. Huh? We finished up with stabilization. Now we're in the introspection part. In the introspection, we know that the tools to carry out this introspection is in three parts. Conceptual prajna, introspective prajna, and true prajna. In order to have true prajna, or to arrive at that state in which we say true prajna, we need to have conceptual prajna. In other words, we need to learn the concepts. If we don't even know the concepts, how can we, how can we introspect? If we don't have concepts, how can we think? You think you can think without concepts? You, you think you can think without words? No. We always use concepts to think. But we don't want to use the wrong concepts. So the Buddha told us that there are an immeasurable amount of conceptual prajna. And all these immeasurable amount of conce concepts, the Buddha had been talking about these for 49 years. Since after his enlightenment, he started to talk about it for 49 years. It's all been written down in the three canons of the, of the Buddha's teaching. The Vinaya, the Sutra, and the Epidharma. All these are there. Do you care to want to know about them? That's prajna that leads you to happiness. That's prajna to get rid of the depression. That's the prajna to get you the wisdom, to guide you to be happier in your life, to help others to resolve problems. But how many people are really interested in doing it? It's very important that we know the right concepts. And I have spent a lot of time on explaining these concepts, and the concepts that, that have been expounded by the Buddha for his 49 years 
of his life, remaining life after nirvana, after, I mean after enlightenment, and it's all in the Buddhist teaching. But the Buddhist teaching contains, especially in the, in, in, in the Chinese literature, because most of the translation have been in Chinese, is in billions of words. And we always say that the Buddhist teaching in the Chinese language, if one lives up to 100 years old, probably you can only glance through those literature once. You don't have enough time to read them all. It's like an ocean of information. And slowly they have been translated into many, many different languages, uh, also in English too, especially with Nakti Matrata, consciousness, the study of consciousness have been translated into English uh, and in other languages. And so the, this concept, conceptual prajna, an accumulation of 49 years of the Buddhist teaching in written words, con concepts, uh, it's like an ocean of information. It's like a whole ocean of information. How do we learn? When we look at an ocean, we say, how do we, how do we, how do we know the taste of the ocean? How do we know? No, knowing the ocean, what I mean by analogy is knowing the taste of the ocean. How do I know the taste of the ocean, looking at the ocean? And many of these later philosophers told us that you don't have to drink up the whole ocean to know the taste of the ocean. You just scoop up a few and you know the taste. You just scoop up a few very important concepts and introspect on it. And that would really give you a lot of help because it's impossible to drink up the whole ocean. So it's impossible just always looking for videos and books. You, you've been reading hundreds of these books. You have been viewing hundreds of these videos. And it should know where because you're not concentrating on it. You're just reading, reading it, see, viewing it casually without, without really bringing it into practice. Why don't we just concentrate in a few very important concepts, really do, going through the introspective prajna part of it and really analyze it, investigate on it, and really review it, review it, review it in your mind all the time as your vigilance guards to telling you what to do. And I've been going through all these concepts. I've gone through the four seals of the Dharma. I used already one hour to explain that. Impermanence, non-self, suffering, and nirvana, the four seals. You really have to understand it. Uh, if, you, if you missed it out, you can always go into Google, the four seals. Go into Google, what are the four seals of the Dharma? Uh, Impermanence, what's the meaning of impermanence? What's the meaning of non-self? Why would we say that we don't have a self? We don't have an ego, we just think that we have a self, we don't have a self. Why do we have to go through all this suffering? Why are there sufferings? Are there sufferings? And what is nirvana? That you have to learn. Next, I already explained it, using a couple of hours, at least two hours to explain, Paticca Samapata. Uh, which, ex which explain the 12 links of originations of life, starting from avijja, uh, zankara, vinana, namarupa, salyatanam, pasa, vedanta, tangha, upadana, bhava, jati, jaramarana, and going to avijja. I don't know if you know what I mean. Probably if you come for the first time, you know what I mean the 12 links of life origination. I, I went through it in detail, probably in two, three hours. And if, you, if you missed it out, you can always get back, get into Google and try to find out Paticca Samapatta, a very important concept in life. And then last time I stopped at the Noble Eightfold Ways. I stopped at Noble Eightfold Ways and I plan to do a few more important concepts and then I will go on to the next one, which is turning. Because I cannot deal with this all the time. I can use one year to explain the, the ocean. I don't even know the ocean myself. I own only a part of the ocean. 
How can I tell the whole ocean? I don't know the ocean. You know, um, so, and also you got to watch out too. Some part of the ocean is polluted. You know why that po- some part of the ocean is polluted? There are people who, who pollute the teaching by introducing the own to a teaching. So we've got to know what's the real taste of the ocean. That's just a sideline uh, that I want to tell you. Okay, the Noble Eightfold Ways. Let's go through the Noble Eightfold Ways. What are the Noble Eightfold Ways? Right perspective, right orientation, right speech, right action, right lifestyle, right effort, right introspection, and right mental equilibrium. These are the very important concepts, the Noble Eightfold Way. Not just knowing the words. You have to know the meaning of it. Buddhism starts from this Noble Eightfold Ways. Don't look for anything else. You have, you, have on the, you have put many, many books on your shelf that you only flip through 10 pages and you put them aside. Now, we want to know every one of these in detail. And we always want to think about it, practice it, apply it to daily life, and really memorize and know and, and see everything from the perspective of the Noble Eightfold Ways. And we want to do it bit by bit and bit by bit. Someone may ask, I'm still very young, I'm a teenager. I want to go to work. Does it help me in my work? Does it help me to make more money? Does it help me to, uh, to be happier? Does it help me to look for a boyfriend or girlfriend? You know, if you know these eight noble eightfold ways, that would greatly help you to be successful in whatever you're doing, not just in enlightenment. The right perspective, right orientation, right speech, right action, right right lifestyle, right effort, right introspection, right mental equilibrium. If you know these, that will make you happier in your life. That will help you to resolve all suffering, all problems. That will help you to identify problems introduce ways to solve these problems in everything you are doing, not just in enlightenment. You can even find a half-foot approach of, of, of finding a solution to a case of problems. I came out from, from a school doing, dealing with management. I, I, I was from U of T, MBA. Nowadays, a lot of MBAs in the streets. In those days, there are not many MBAs. Now everybody, now everybody is an MBA. And uh, in the MBA, we have to h- learn how to solve problems, how to identify problems, how to introduce ways to solve problems, how to make sure that problems are solved. And I find that this all fit in. And I don't want to start right perspective. I want to start right perspective in the next session. The right perspective. How do you see things in the right perspective? Don't try to see things in a twisted, fallacious, vicious perspective. How do we do that? We'll leave that for next session.